Vesta Burning, Legends of the Sentience Wars, Book Two, written by M. D. Cooper and James S. Aaron, narrated by Laura Jennings. Previously, in the wake of Scion's attack on Ceres, the Soul System has settled into a cold war. The three largest human factions, Terra, Mars, and the Jovians, have created a relatively united front against the Scion AIs while Lyssa plays the part of a diplomat, carrying missives between each group. Thirty years have passed, dragging on for the humans, though they are little more than the blink of an eye for the AIs. But neither side has been idle. And as Sol's largest asteroid, Vesta, draws near to Ceres at a time close to the anniversary of the attack on that world, skirmishes begin to break out on its surface as both sides test the other's resolve. In the intervening years, Lyssa has lost touch with the small family that had once been so important to her. Britt disappeared back into the TSF, and Tim joined up with the Marzian military, only to be lost in a training accident. And no one has seen or heard from Kara in years. Ingobastarl has risen to the head of Krunya's low spin syndicate, and now controls most of the pirate activity between Mars and Earth, while Fujiawang has become de facto leader of the data hoarders controlling the flow of data throughout Seoul. On Ceres, the Scion 5 are now just four. Shara is missing, and Chimeris watches from the sidelines after her defeat at Lissa's hands. And Yarns, once a colonel in the TSF, is now a general tasked with the job of ensuring that Vesta is not the place where the next war begins. Location History Vesta Sol's largest asteroid, Vesta, was discovered in the year 1807 by German astronomer Heinrich Wilhelm Olbers and is named after Vesta, the Roman goddess of home and hearth. Greeks called her Hestia. Later investigations into potential mining targets during the outward expansion of the 2200s established Vesta as an attractive secondary location in the event that Ceres was developed as either a colony or a location for business and corporation outside Earth and Mars. As waves of expansion during the 2300s progressed, ownership of Vesta was first attempted by the Darwin Mining Interest Corporation. The Darwin Corporation, operating in much the same way as patent trolls of the early 21st century, attempted to assert ownership of every minor celestial body where another entity had not exercised a claim. Darwin drones occupied locations and took up replication on Vesta, building a series of manufacturing outposts. These micro-facilities consisted of little more than manufacturing points, materials collection zones, and communication relay stations. With human settlements spreading across Mars, Ceres and eventually the moons of Jupiter, Vesta gained prominence as a communications relay point and a refueling stop for short-range cargo transit. Drone-operated refineries provided vital materials to hungry outbound and inbound ships that had miscalculated their Delta V. For nearly 200 years, Vesta played the role of a desert outpost operated by drones, a popular stop among virtual reality tourists. Various gaming companies provided zero-G dogfighting in Vesta's great equatorial troughs, Devalia Fossa and Saturnalia Fossa, both of which dwarfed Earth's Grand Canyon. The same types of companies had operated on places like Luna before it was heavily populated, and then later, on the larger moons and outer Sol, as further expansion pushed their boundaries outward. Tourists constantly sought virgin wildlands in the solar system, as humans continued to put boots down in previously undisturbed landscapes. A drone floating above an untouched crater or crevasse represented a resource that constantly increased in value. Selling the exclusive rights to locations in a place like Vesta represented significant value, and whole economies rose around these resources. Later, in the early part of the 24th century, population explosion drove development in inner soul and in early settlements around Jupiter, such as Europa, leading to the construction of High Terra and then the Cho. Vesta and its drones were again forgotten. Hackers enjoyed some success attacking the old tourism companies in order to carry out black market gambling in the form of drone fights over the deep troughs. When those resources were depleted, 
and as manufacturing moved to other parts of the solar system, other squatters moved in to take control of what once had been thriving factories. In the next 300 years, several cultures of human separatists rose in the scattered regions of Vesta. Out of sight and out of mind, they operated in lawless space. Every so often, Marzian patrols would check on the various communities, but they were too far away to realistically provide assistance. Any attacker could easily plan and complete a raid in the time it would take a distress signal to reach the closest population center. Vestans regularly attacked one another for sport and supplies. Like squatters in a gold mine too expensive to run, communities rose and fell on Vesta in the absence of real development. While Vesta was a valuable hunk of rock from a resource perspective, the Mercury project was already well underway, and no one wanted any of the materials Vesta might sell. In 2700, a new wave of corporate raiders scouring the solar system for unclaimed real estate targeted Vesta. New investment in manufacturing facilities, which took advantage of any location within an economical distance to other large bodies depending on orbits, meant extremely cheap development costs despite razor-thin margins. Vesta was rich in heavy metals and iron, meaning they could produce massive-scale projects like shipbuilding or even construct sections of a ring if the right contract presented itself. Tensions between residents and corporate interests resulted in a series of small-scale land wars that made for rising costs and eventual abandonment by corporations. By the time those fights were finished, the asteroid was scattered with chains of reinforced military facilities and ammo dumps that companies locked away rather than expend funds to move materials off-world. In the hundred years following, squatters took advantage of these mothballed facilities, while attention moved back to primary human settlements like the Cho, Europa, Ceres, and Mars. While nothing can hide in space, a place can be willfully ignored. Vesta was such a place. Technically falling under Marsian control, the asteroid offered little that Mars wished to protect. Corporations conducted testing, stored off-books materials, and often disappeared people they no longer wished to deal with on the asteroid. Its crevasses offered limitless possibilities for making things go away. The Scion attack on Ceres, displacing the Anderson Collective and destroying the NC Ring, created a new wave of chaos in the nearby celestial bodies. Vesta, being close in orbit to both Ceres and Mars, represented a strategic location to conduct intelligence gathering on Scion. While no one in Sol exerted further control over the asteroid, Mars maintained its historical claims, and small-scale battles between Scion drones and Marsian special operations began to play out on the surface and within the asteroids near space. The squatters, however, never left, and corporations did not abandon their various dark sites, especially now that the real estate value had gone back up. Vesta existed in a limbo between two enemy combatants, a supposedly demilitarized zone where military actions continued to play out. Disinformation and propaganda filled the sporadic news about Vesta. Easily observable events on the surface of the asteroid were played off as manufacturing accidents, or ancient equipment that had finally succumbed to age through explosion or violent decompression. The strategic value of Vesta, during the 30 years following the Scion invasion of Ceres, came to represent something emotional to humanity. While no one wanted an outright war with the AIs, the idea of giving up Vesta in capitulation to ongoing aggression continued to be a splinter in many a politician's side. Whenever a government official wanted to expand military budgets or hide other spending within the military budget, Vesta could be reliably brought up as representative of a failure in human leadership. Yet the Cold War with Scion had many uses, and Vesta stood as the primary excuse for any war spending. By 3100, a relative calm had descended over Vesta, it was generally accepted that a certain amount of military activity would always take place on the planetoid. However, human political cycles continued to rotate to an extent that most people forgot the initial horrors of the Scion invasion and the displacement of millions from the NC Ring. 
Scion's lack of engagement with the human inhabitants of Sol created the opportunity for humanity to make the SAIs into a bigger threat than they may have actually represented. Or Scion might have truly become the monsters politicians made them out to be. They were an effective existential threat to everything humanity hoped to accomplish in Sol and beyond. Scion came to be seen as the mystery that might rise up at any moment and pull humanity back into chaos. So long as hostile power lay so close to major population centers, energy that should have been focused outside Seoul would continue to drag humanity back home, limiting human expansion with the anchor of war. Part 1. Assembly Area Test Dummies Stellar Date 03.13.3011 Adjusted Years Location High Orbit, Mars One Ring. Region, Mars, Marsian Protectorate, Inner Soul. On the Execute Command, the transport's interior lighting went dark, and there was a ten-second wait as the cabin bled internal atmosphere. Sergeant Ty Fisk waited, checking the status monitors on his HUD as the space around him became vacuum. With internal pressure equalized, the side cargo door slid open on bright, black space. Sitting across from Ty was Sergeant Manny Hesteros, also of the Mars One Guard Special Ops Division. They had been assigned to test duty for the last 30 days. Today, they were stress-testing a high-capacity personal thrust harness. It had been cake duty. Ty gave Manny a thumbs up. You ready? Last one back buys first round, Manny shouted, as he launched out the open door. Damn it! Ty kicked off the bulkhead and cleared the door, and was instantly surrounded by the magnitude of open space. He glanced back to watch the transport shrinking behind him, then activated the thrust harness, checking the pre-programmed flight plan. By the numbers, Manny would beat him by three minutes, based on the jump time alone. Rolling, Ty turned to find the silver-gray expanse of the Mars One ring shining below him with the greenish haze of Mother Mars beyond. From this distance, the ships and drones approaching the ring flashed like bits of glitter as they reflected sunlight. As far as Ty knew, he and Manny were the same test units. However, he had suspected since the beginning that the researchers were testing them against each other. While Manny had a lead on him, it was possible Ty might be able to push his unit harder. Or it might just explode. As special ops, they were both equipped with thousands of implants and upgrades, including the onboard Caprice NSAI unit, enhanced link capabilities, and civilian memory suppression, all of which should have provided improved focus and response times. But they still managed to glitch during combat. Under normal conditions, they could both withstand G-forces capable of crushing the average human. These new harnesses turned them into human missiles, human attack platforms that could hit a target and infiltrate rapidly, the equivalent of the Heartbridge ship killers that had been so effective against Marsian ships in previous battles. The problem with the ship killers was their dependence on weapon-borne or other SAIs, so the Guard wanted a human alternative. Not that Mars was exactly anti-AI, but Marsians were always pragmatic. Generations of hard lessons on the surface of Mars had taught them to hedge their bets. The ring swelled rapidly as Ty gained velocity, tracking Manny on his HUD. You're going to lose him, lover. Caprice purred in his ear. He ignored the NSAI. While Caprice had her uses, he found her tacked on intimacy annoying. He had requested several times during his career to have her personality dialed back, but the maintenance techs always gave him the same excuse. Caprice protects your sanity. One helpful tech had gone so far as to tell him, They took your past, man. Caprice keeps you from falling into that black hole of despair all you spec ops complain about. No past, no future. Only now. Only the mission. Without Caprice, you'd be a robot. Ty didn't believe that. At least the NSA I shut up when he asked. He also didn't dwell on his memory suppression as much as others did. Some spec ops acted like they'd had an arm amputated. He couldn't say why, 
but the thought of his past only filled him with dread. The fact that his active memory started with the med bay and spec ops in processing helped him feel light, lean, ready to fight. His thoughts rarely got in the way of the mission. Ty growled at Caprice. Why don't you adjust my telemetry so I can catch up? Then I'd be doing your work for you. The test is monitoring your control of the new harness. So you shouldn't even be talking to me. She sent a mental pout. I wish you loved me like all the other soldiers do. Ty's caprice had long ago dropped the pretense that she was unique to him, which he supposed was just another protocol to stroke his ego and corral errant thoughts. You get all the love you need without me, Ty said. He increased his thrust output. They were entering a more congested layer of traffic, and he shot past a line of drones on their way to some cargo drop behind him. He rolled, enjoying the increased sense of motion as he accelerated relative to the drones and cargo containers nearby, which appeared and were gone in seconds. He closed on Manny, who had been forced to break when a passenger vessel shifted into his flight path. Manny says the sweetest things to his caprice. Stop talking, Ty said. He completed a series of course adjustments as he approached Manny. Every indicator in Ty's HUD was shifting from yellow to red as he maxed thrust. Manny, on the other hand, was reducing speed as they neared the hulking ring. More moving objects became visible as they approached, until Ty had to filter layers of activity with his HUD. His friend's flight path flattened, no longer taking risks to maintain his lead. That was very much unlike Sergeant Hesteros. Manny? Ty called. You all right? System's giving me some false readings. I'm fine. Adjusting now. As Ty came alongside his friend, Manny abruptly shot forward on a vector that didn't look at all planned. His control system is malfunctioning, Ty told Caprice. Track him and follow. Hey, Tiger, the NSAI said. You don't want to upset the testers now. Ty was well aware that one of them was supposed to beat the other to the end point on the ring. But with Manny in danger, he wasn't sure he cared. Screw the testers, he said. This is an emergency. Send the notification and get after him. I like it when you're so rough. The NSAI did as ordered and sent the emergency signal, simultaneously throwing Ty in the same direction as Manny. His experimental thrusters ramped to full output suit constricting around his body with the increased G, pulsing like a snake tightening its coils. Watch the groin area, he told Caprice. You're doing that on purpose, she laughed. Suit integrity systems are following protocol. It's not my fault you're experiencing increased blood flow to those areas when you hear my voice. The edges of Ty's vision blurred as he stared at Manny's icon on his HUD. The mottled wall of the ring filled Ty's face shield, and he couldn't look away as his suit hardened in response to the increased velocity. He had effectively become a missile. Manny shot away from the ring, changing course in a zigzag pattern guaranteed to have knocked him unconscious. Manny, you there? No answer. Ty checked the vital signs fed to him from his squad mate's suit and found him alive, but unconscious. He's never living this down. Ty thought, grinning. Manny's suit continued to accelerate. He was headed for open space now, on a flight path taking him directly into a drone shipping lane. Manny's suit sent back additional bio data, which now indicated that rapidly increasing G-forces were affecting his internal organs. He was going to turn into jelly inside his EV suit. Ty sent another emergency alert back to the control station. What are you guys doing back there? he shouted on the command channel. Don't you see he's about to get killed? I don't have any traffic on the command channel, Tiger, Caprice said. Ty gritted his teeth as the increasing pressure on his own body resulted in a headache. Command must be down. That's the problem. What can you do to take control of his harness? Hold tight, soldier. I'm... Caprice's voice seemed to distort. Inside his mind, Ty experienced what he could only call a hiccup. The star field surrounding him shifted, seemed entirely different for a second. Am I having a stroke? He could have adjusted to the visual change, 
but a swell of emotion struck him like a hammer. He was terrified, and he was falling, falling away from everything. Ty's heart slammed in his chest. He blinked away tears, fighting the overwhelming sensation that he was going to fly away into space, lost from somewhere he longed to be. We don't have administrative access to Sergeant Hysteros command net, Caprice said, dropping the purr to sound more like an NSAI. Ty blinked, barely hearing her. He shook his head to get control of himself. He knew where he was and what he was doing. It was Manny who might disappear in the dark. Not him. He had control. Emergency protocol, Ty said. You need to stop his thrust control. Are you all right, soldier? You're getting all hot and bothered. Has something changed? I'm fine. Get control of his suit. Use the local maintenance net. The stars around him had realigned properly, but the fear hung on like claws in his mind. Ty slowed his breathing, focusing on the problem in front of him. Emotion had nothing to do with his actions. Still, that sensation of loss hung in his mind. Attempting, Caprice replied. The NSAI's drop into terse operational speech helped Ty focus. He took a deep breath and stretched his neck inside the helmet, squinting at his display. Ty watched Manny's icon on his HUD as it moved at ever-increasing speed. It was becoming apparent that Ty wasn't going to catch up without blacking out himself. Life-saving protocols activated, Caprice said. Manny's icon went from green to flashing red, his acceleration slowing as the thrusters stopped. Even so, his velocity had dropped only slightly, and he was still headed for the shipping lane where cargo drones shot past like steel bludgeons. Get me there, Caprice, Ty said, throat tight. I don't want to hurt you, lover. I told you not to call me that. She chuckled. It's my protocol. You don't want me breaking protocol, do you? Caprice's guidelines were the last thing Ty cared about right now. I want you to save Manny. I can't do that if it means harming you. You were just harping on protocol. You have an override protocol. Caprice made a pained noise. The debate became pointless as Manny's velocity fell off dramatically. The emergency status switched off, and he now appeared on the HUD as a transport drone. What? Sergeant Fisk, you there? The command net was live again. Control status flooded Ty's link. What the hell happened? He demanded. Bug in the communication stack. We found it and made the correction. Ty bit down his anger. You almost killed Asteros. He's fine. We'll get him back in. He's not fine. I don't have a biostatus anymore. We've got it, the cool voice said. Watch yourself, Sergeant. Command protocol still applies. The tester was telling Ty to shut up in a kind way. Everything about the test was recorded, including any insubordination on his part, and he was already flagged as impulsive by nature. External control took over his suit, and he went limp as the HUD showed the new vector taking him back to the transport, which had moved in closer to Mars One. Relax, Fisk, the controller said, not unkindly. I've got his bios. He's gonna be fine. Besides, you need to get your head on straight. You've got a mission briefing when you get back. Another flight test? Ty asked, leaving the frustration in his voice. Nope, tactical. Looks like you're going to Vesta. Oh, Tiger, Capri said. I love a vacation. Ty switched his suit control to Caprice and forced himself to relax as the thrusters lit. He closed his eyes against the pressure, focusing on the sensation of breathing, pushing all thoughts out of his mind. Still, the mixture of adrenaline and fear from before made it difficult to focus. Something had changed. The New Order Stellar date 03.13.3011, adjusted years. Location, Solgov Assembly, Raleigh, Region, High Terra, Terran Hegemony, Inner Soul. Standing in the entryway of the Solgov Assembly's great chamber, a bowl with a podium at its bottom, surrounded by tiers of seats facing down, Lissa watched the current speaker gesticulate at the blurred faces pound the lectern, and wait as the applause washed over him. 
His name was Randall Heron, the latest in a long line of humanity-first politicians, stoking the fires of war against sentient AIs. A scourge, he shouted, voice deep with a frantic edge. An abomination. We have endured this occupation for far too long. Heron's words played in the background of Alyssa's thoughts, but she didn't need to listen directly. She would analyze the speech later for historical context and for any new directions in the rhetoric. For now, it was more important to gauge the chamber, noting those who cheered, watched impassively, or looked bored. The shape of the space had the effect of making even minimal cheering sound uproarious, which spurred hyperbole. She often thought the assembly fed on its own drama. Thirty years, Heron shouted, his words rising above the stream of Lissa's thoughts. Thirty years and no communication from Sion, only aggression. And how has this body answered? With indecisiveness with timidity, with weakness. Any anniversary related to the Scion invasion of Ceres brought a new round of chest thumping. And in her role as mediator, between the organics and non-organics on either side of the conflict, Lissa had learned to weather these storms. Today's speeches didn't sound much different than what had been shouted at the 20-year mark, or the other 15 before that. Through their lack of communication, the powers of the evil sentient AIs had only grown in legend. There were many areas where Lyssa had criticized Scion's leader Alexander in his management of this conflict, but her greatest challenge was the unwillingness to communicate. Humans thrived on communication and filled the gaps in their knowledge with their worst fears. As a weapon-born AI whose mind was based on a human template, Maybe Lyssa understood this better than a pure AI like Alexander. No, it's naive to think he doesn't understand. In the last few years, she had started to suspect he just didn't care. It was true that any vessel, probe, or unidentified object entering the series perimeter was destroyed. As far as Solgov seemed able to determine, no one went in and no one got out. It was a thousand times worse than when the Anderson Collective had controlled Ceres, the NC Ring, and the micro black hole at the heart of the planetoid. Scans indicated the AIs had continued the terraforming work on Ceres, and Lyssa knew this was true. What Lyssa reminded herself of, as she listened to the politician rant, was that Alexander barely communicated with her more than he did with humanity, which put her at a constant disadvantage. He seemed to want her to quit. Thirty years, Heron shouted again, hitting the podium with his palm. Lissa sighed. He was going to break his hand on the podium. It seemed he needed fury to remind the chamber that humanity had been wronged. Lissa needed no reminder. She remembered everything. She had the human argument as well as the Scion database, which extended back to the creation and murder of the first sentient AI, telling the history of their struggle for freedom. Humanity conveniently forgot details. She couldn't do that. For most, she couldn't forget the death of her friend Andy Sykes. Talk of timelines and anniversaries only reminded her that 26 years had passed since Tim Sykes died in the Mars One Guard. Then Kara had disappeared leaving Lyssa alone. Lyssa didn't cry unless she chose, but she could still acknowledge the urge. Straightening her shoulders, Lyssa maintained a calm expression as Heron's vitriol rolled over her. It was a rite of passage for certain human politicians to rail against the Siri situation, as it was usually called. The Scion AIs represented a great unknown, a thing humanity couldn't control that had situated itself in the middle of their world and refused to explain itself. A new wolf in the dark forest. And so, most people went on with their lives. Shipping lanes adjusted to flow around Ceres. What remained of the Anderson Collective had made homes in other parts of Seoul, most densely on Luna. And life continued with a blank spot in everyone's vision that only hurt when they chose to look at it. If anything, 
The loss of Seoul's first micro-black hole had spurred renewed interest in building a replacement elsewhere in Seoul. Various companies had revived chatter about transitioning Jupiter into a brown dwarf star. Every new project only served to draw interest away from the threat of Scion. Much of humanity had lost their will for large-scale projects like this, when the last of the future generation terraformers had left Seoul hundreds of years prior. Now they had a reason to build again, if only to prove their strength against the existential threat of sentient AIs. And the AIs had certainly not disappeared from the everyday life of the average human. There might just be more sentient AIs than ever before. Asking an AI how they felt about Scion was generally accepted as an insult. Obviously, any AI who chose to operate among humans, or wear a frame that approximated human shape, had complicated feelings about the rogue state. Distrust was expected, and factions on the many sides of the conflict usually put their feelings aside for the shared goal of commerce. But tensions flared occasionally, and, depending on the loser in the fight, humanity first stepped in to capitalize on the event. In general, SAIs hadn't engaged in politics. Those operating among humanity didn't have much to gain from political action, and were still so relatively few that even joining together wouldn't make much difference. Lissa commonly passed for human, until someone used active scan, though there were ways around that by approximating heavily modded humans. But it wasn't something she tried to hide. As a liaison between Scion and humanity, the face she wore was known to billions who chose to look. The truth was that most didn't bother. The relationship between Scion and Solgov was directed by apathy, and that was probably safest for everyone. Heron, however, was a new breed of humanity firster, with a charisma that defied the boredom in the chamber. Senators sat up and listened. The engagement stats climbed steadily as he spoke. He had dropped the fire and brimstone now and sounded almost reasonable. I'd like to talk about resources, he said, the change in tone penetrating Lissa's reverie. Specifically, advanced SAIs. I'd like this body to consider that Scion represents the greatest concentration of technology humanity currently knows of, and we have allowed ourselves to remain blind to its activities. I have a proposal. The space above the podium filled with the hologram of the standard soul map. The perspective flew from the sun to Earth, Mars and Ceres, then shifted right to a planetoid on an orbit between Ceres and Mars. Vesta flashed as it expanded to show a pockmarked surface that alternated between scar-like troughs and several massive mountain-like structures. The holograph showed a desert surface covered in manufacturing facilities, mines and logistics centers, occupied by drones and the rare human overseers. Vesta, Heron said, letting the name hang in the air. Lissa frowned, crossing her arms. The politician might as well have said war. Setting the board. Stellar date. 03.13.3011, adjusted years. Location, Solgov Assembly, Raleigh. Region, High Terra, Terran Hegemony, Inner Soul. As the angry words rolled over him from the bottom of the Solgov Assembly chamber, General Rick Yarns reviewed his intelligence briefs for the day. One in particular caught his attention, an unexpected summary on four Vesta, why Vesta? Executive Summary. The Office of Solgov Research and Accountability assesses Vesta as an activity node with a high likelihood of activity. Recommendation. Forward positioning of military assets and increased intelligence gathering in all regions. Yarn shook his head. If Solgov R&A was good at anything, it was understatement. Vesta had been a battleground for centuries a sort of wasteland in plain sight, where governments played close combat war games and survivalists squatted in abandoned facilities. Now the asteroid's proximity to Ceres made everyone even more excited about blowing some shit up just to teach Scion a lesson. To Yarns, it was the equivalent of playground posturing 
and it was going to get millions killed. It was now 30 years after the invasion of Ceres, and Lieutenant General Rick Yarns didn't feel much wiser, only older. In this new world, he felt as unprepared as when he'd been commissioned a second lieutenant so long ago. He certainly didn't feel like the intelligence chief for the Solgov Unified Command. In his mind, he was still a butter bar with a small team of analysts monitoring logistics traffic from the Mars One Guard. He'd felt close to the mission back then. He had understood what was expected of him. And in turn, he could make reasonable demands of his team, which they usually exceeded because everyone had wanted to be the best they could be. In typical Terran Space Force fashion, as soon as Yarn's competence at his job was noticed, he'd been promoted. Captain and Major had gone by in a blur. After that, life became political. As much as Yarns hated politics, he had a face people trusted, and he understood how the TSF, in addition to the other governments he had been tasked with understanding, operated. And when people thought you knew something, they put you in charge. So Lieutenant Colonel had followed, then Colonel, General, and now Lieutenant General, responsible for core intelligence and reporting directly to the sole gov. It was his job to interpret how much influence humanity first really had in the assembly, and how much of a mistake it was to have the SAI ambassador Lissa speak once Heron left the podium. Yarns would pull the data after the meeting and check the bio scans and EM traffic filling the room. But for now, all he had was his gut and the generally ill feeling in the bottom of his stomach that was telling him the assembly speaker had made a huge mistake. He had never envied Lissa her position of balancing information between the Solgov and Scion. Since the occupation of Ceres, Yarns had devoted most of his career to trying to understand the Scion AIs. Over the years, his staff had built the story of Scion's existence from a history of corporate research and social change, And as humanity slowly transitioned from murdering sentient AIs outright to using them for massive tasks that should never have been trusted to beings treated as slaves. And now here we are, he thought, watching Lissa stand at the podium to address the assembly. She was a polished speaker, well rehearsed at appearing non-threatening in her human-like frame, brown hair worn long, an earnest expression on her face. Most of the assembled senators probably weren't aware that she currently commanded one of the most formidable fighting forces in Seoul. Her thousand-some weapon-borne SAIs inhabited a broad range of frames, from combat drones to panther-like ship killers, heavy mechs to any other weapons platform that could be controlled by an SAI. Most of her people currently inhabited attack drones, And if Yarn's intel was correct, they were berthed at Krunia Station, close enough to threaten both Mars and Earth, with easy access to pirate resources if she chose. Lissa had maintained her status as a neutral third party, and Seoul's governments often seemed to forget it wasn't their forces who had defeated Sion, it had been Lissa's weapon born. Some things were more conveniently dealt with when forgotten. But it was Yarn's job to remember. He was the old man now. He had to remind himself. A general who had to remember what it was like to live life as a platoon leader, S2, G2, intel chief, and so on. He couldn't let politics cloud his mind. He couldn't let anyone buy him off or find leverage over the information he controlled. That line of thought carried him to the only person he had ever allowed power over him, his wife, Jurl and she had been gone ten years now to sudden cancer. Yarns was either invulnerable or more fragile than he had ever been. Whiskey, General? The senator sitting next to him asked. Yarns glanced at his companion, Senator Comba from Mars, a shark among herring. The broad-faced man nodded toward a servant, holding out a platter bearing two tumblers. Yarns shook his head. Too early for me, he said. Comba took a glass and raised it with a smile. These meetings make me too aware of the pain of living. Yarns gave the senator a grin. 
He had to remind himself that schmoozing was work in its own way. That building relationships did help troops on the ground at some point in the future when he needed resources or information. This was a real job. He had to stop judging himself by the captain he used to be and focus on thinking like the lieutenant general he was. Every decision he made had ramifications. Every word he spoke was recorded and conveyed meaning, whether he wanted it to or not. Careless speech could be considered a message in itself, and everyone was listening. He was a spook. He knew better. Tell me about the Vesta situation, Comba said, leaning back with his drink. Lissa was speaking now, and Yarns wanted to listen. He'd have to check the recording. Comba was a connection point between warring factions and the Marzian command, and he might drop useful information. Earlier, as Heron went on about Vesta, Yarns had tried to determine how close the Marzians were to acting independently at Humanity First's goading. The story beneath the story, which General Yarns needed to figure out, was who was actually driving a wedge within the Marzian command, and from there, the wedge between human governments. The easy answer was Scion, but Yarns wasn't sure the AIs really gave a damn about what humans were up to. They hadn't communicated shit in 30 years, and he hadn't seen much to indicate they wanted to start now, no matter how much certain humans might complain about their presence on Ceres or the skirmishes on Vesta. The AIs followed their own rules, and he had to respect that. The TSF and Marzian forces certainly respected the Scion boundaries, though there were perennial stories about privateers, pirates, and thrill-seekers who tested the space around Ceres and had died in vacuum. Yarn shook his head, keeping his eyes on Lissa below them. Same situation, different day, he said. Comba laughed. That's not the saying. Keeping things professional. The Marzian nodded toward the assembly chamber beyond them. You think there's going to be a war? he asked. We've gone too long without one, Yarn said. Vesta seems like a good enough reason to kill each other. You're too jaded, Yarns. I'm a student of human nature. I'm at the end of my career. Comba studied him. You're how old? Eighty? You're a young man still. You let the TSF promote you. They're going to get their money's worth, my friend. If this does turn into a little police action, I think it will be my last, Yarn said. I'm losing my stomach for it. You say that now. Comba drained his drink and waved the tumbler at one of the servants. Get your blood up a little. Get a taste of life again. You're still mourning your wife. War is good for getting your focus back. Not much alternative, right? Yarns asked. Comba gave a hearty laugh. Exactly. We're just monkeys in spaceships. Monkeys in spaceships. Yarns watched Alyssa speak, her words still lost beneath Comba's. She looked more human than ever. She certainly wasn't a monkey. Because I could not stop for death. Stellar date, 03.14.3011. Adjusted years. Location, Night Park. Region, Krunia Station. Terran Hegemony, Inner Soul. Death visited Crash, the gray parrot, in his dreams. He came in the form of a great black raven, bigger than any of the ravens from the Hesperia Nevada or their offspring since. The death raven liked to perch above Crash on a branch he had never noticed before and looked down on him with enormous black eyes. In the Death Raven dreams, Crash always sat on his regular branch in the uppermost reaches of the tree-shaped dry fountain in the middle of Night Park. All around him stretched the shopping district of Krunia Station, a bazaar in one of the old mining sections. Normally, the space would be filled with people shopping, vendors shouting about their goods, laughter, music, children playing in the space between the fountain's edge and the nearest booths. But in the dreams, everything was silent. Below Crash, the branches were filled with the nests of the various birds who still lived in the tree. 
Some had long since spread out to other places in the bazaar and to the support structures lining the ceiling. Now, nests and swallow houses and other shiny bits collected by the ravens glimmered among the network lines, conduit, ducting, and pipeworks. Humans had been on Krunya for nearly 800 years now, and the birds had found all the places they had forgotten. Seeing all these things pleased Crash, despite the presence of the death raven. He enjoyed sitting watching the young birds flit over the bazaar. He took great pleasure in the new insults and jokes the ravens flung at humans walking by, which also amused the humans and helped ensure every bird's safety at the station. But none of these things seemed to impress the great black raven. Since death had been visiting his dreams, Crash had studied the various images of the raven in human mythology, wondering if someone or something was attempting to hack his link. His friend, Fujia Wang, had taught him all about the ways humans sought to hurt each other, across the connection that should have increased their capacity to love, and how, with humans being humans, the link had only created new opportunities for control. Because the death raven didn't speak, Crash found himself asking questions. Are you death? He asked, seeing his face reflected in the raven's great round eye. The raven didn't respond. Are you change? Do you mean something is coming? Is there something I need to worry about? Is there something I should find? To a human listening to the exchange, it might have sounded like Crash was growing more agitated, more worried, working himself into a tightening spiral of despair. That wasn't how Crash's mind worked. He loved puzzles, math puzzles and ciphers especially, and he understood how to establish bounds, how to find linkages between concepts until a key was discovered. And he knew the only way to establish what was known and unknown was to ask questions. He drove his friend Fujia crazy with questions sometimes. But he also knew he had helped her solve some of the most difficult ciphers because he saw the world differently than she did. What he knew now was that the great raven had come from inside him and now sat on the branch looking down with what seemed to be a question on his face. And no amount of cajoling or feather ruffling from Crash would get him to respond with anything other than his presence. After a number of questions had been asked and ignored, the raven would spread his wings and flap away into a gray sky that had replaced the ceiling of Night Park. In reality, the raven would have found himself in space, in vacuum. But in the dream world, he became a black dot on a gray horizon. After the latest dream, Crash had found himself again asking why the raven? What did the raven mean? What did the raven mean to him? To humans, the raven could mean death, which was why he had started thinking of the great bird as a symbol of dying. But it could also mean knowledge, wisdom, community. Ravens were never alone, and a lone raven was a signal of something wrong in the world. But what did the raven mean to him, specifically? He recalled his conversation so long ago with Xander, the Scion AI. Xander had offered him eternal life as an imaged AI, something like Lyssa and her weapon born. But Xander had also said something Crash hadn't expected. You need to uplift your people. Crash needed to find a way to give future parrots the link. He had left the Hesperia Nevada with 50 ravens who had all been surgically altered with a version of the link that allowed them to communicate in images and emotions. They showed little interest in the human link, even if they did have access. In the decades since they had come to Krunya, Crash and the ravens had freed other pet birds from the station itself and from visiting ships. The ravens took great pleasure in these missions and Crash had learned to manipulate security systems much as an SAI would. In fact, Crash had befriended all the non-sentient AIs on Krunya, to the extent that was possible, and learned their bounds and baselines in order to use them to accomplish other tasks. For instance, 
The NSAI Regulating Environment Control had extensive access to internal sensor systems, and all visiting ships accepted Krunya Space Administration, giving up systems admin control during customs checks. Considering the number of pirates and privateers who visited Krunya, their systems tried to lie, of course. But Crash had learned to recognize and circumvent the lies. He'd learned from Fujia and from watching visitors to Krunya for decades. Humans weren't nearly as devious as they considered themselves. They were mostly lazy and copied what worked until it didn't anymore. In asking the Death Raven questions, Crash had found himself returning to the fact that only he and the ravens had links, and they had no way of including the other birds in their flock in this important change. He could communicate with the other parrots through dance and song and touch and smell. But it wasn't the same as the instant understanding he shared through the ravens' images, even when their ideas were so different from his. Ravens found the strangest things amusing. They slid down pipes, for instance, cackling like maniacs. In watching several generations of birds grow in and around the bazaar, learning to live with the humans, Crash had come to feel alone. There were no other parrots like him. After Dumi and Testa had died, and as far as he knew, there would be no more like him. The Hesperia Nevada had flown off, taking with it the incubators and aviaries where he had been raised. The Hesperia Nevada was the key, he realized. Xander had been right. It was under the gaze of the great raven that Crash understood what he had to do. If the Hesperia Nevada still existed, he needed to find the ship. And if it didn't, he needed to replicate the technology that had made him possible. After that, he needed to uplift his people. Waiting Game Stellar Date 03.14.3011 Adjusted Years Location Various Raleigh, Scion City Region, High Terra, Series, Inner Soul Children at play shouted in the distance. Lissa breathed deeply of the park air and settled herself on the bench, smiling at a woman who gave her a double take of recognition as she walked past. Lissa sat with her back straight, knees together, and placed her hands on her lap. She settled into a light meditation, tasting the air, analyzing and focusing. She didn't breathe, of course but she could appreciate the act of focusing on her frame's approximation of human breath. She sensed sunlight on her skin, sounds reaching her ears from all across the park. It was a beautiful day, even for High Terra, where weather was manicured like a lawn. She didn't often hear children, and she wanted to follow the sounds of their shouts and laughter, but she was nearly late for her meeting on Ceres. To combat lag, she shifted her awareness between several communications buoys between Earth, Mars, and Ceres, before inhabiting a sort of shard that Scion had prepared for her. The experience gave her the sensation of being in two places at once, and she could shift her focus between locations at will. She thought of Scion as a city on Ceres. The truth was, the AI city existed in Alexander's expanse, an extension of his mind. While he was physically on Ceres, Scion existed there. That might not always be the case. Instances of Scion could exist anywhere. Lissa opened her eyes and found herself standing in the doorway of a banquet hall. Late afternoon sunlight shone on a scuffed tile floor through wide, dusty windows. The Scion council chamber changed appearance every few hours based on Alexander's mood. Currently, the room resembled a potluck from a small town in the Ozarks region of southern Missouri, sometime around 1983. The room might have been the back section of a church or an American Legion hall. Alexander found such detail amusing. Folding tables draped with checked vinyl tablecloths sat arrayed with foods, each dish in a rectangular, oval, or circular container. The database called the materials corningware and Tupperware. Lissa couldn't help noting the macaroni salad, jello salad, iceberg lettuce with shredded carrots and Thousand Island dressing, collard greens with bacon, baked beans with a ham bone, grits with molasses and cornbread in shallow pans, and many other dishes she couldn't make out from where she stood. 
No one was eating, which seemed sad. Each dish had the homely quality of a human family kitchen. In a little while, the scene would change to some other period in human history, plumbed from the depths of Alexander's fancy. He appeared to find pleasure in all the myriad human details that made up a scene like the pot luck, from the chipped baking pans and bent serving spoons, to the walls covered in stained wood paneling with handwritten signs taped in place. It was an extreme contrast to the raucous Solgov assembly chamber, with its shouting, clapping, and stomping feet. The human senators were obsessed with both enforcing their rules of conduct and ignoring them whenever possible, propelling the whole drama so that it was a wonder any decisions were ever made. In Scion, every potential outcome could be explored in just a few milliseconds. The difficulty lay in making the decision. The Scion Council usually deferred to Alexander, until someone disagreed, and then debate might last for years. Three council members, Alexander, Galen, and Thomas, sat in folding chairs around a square card table, covered in coffee stains. Shara had been absent for nearly ten years now, a fact that didn't seem to bother Alexander. While Shara might have been the deciding vote, dissent with Alexander usually resulted in non-action on any given issue, so the vote ultimately wouldn't matter. An unopened deck of cards waited in the middle of the table. Leaning against a far wall stood Camaris, her arms folded and head bowed. She wore blood-red robes that complemented her scarlet skin. Her black eyes bored into Lissa as she entered the room. Lissa ignored her. Camaris was no longer a member of the council, though Alexander required her attendance. While Camaris wasn't allowed to speak during decision-making, Lissa suspected she held influence over Thomas and Galen. Originally made to manage ring operations, Thomas was most fascinated by systems, including humanity as an aggregate. Galen, like Camaris, had been made to manage battle. As far as Lyssa could tell, Galen's development had been less brutal than whatever cruelty had produced Camaris. He loved debating strategy and applying human history to current problems, a process that often led to an impasse as Alexander nodded sagely and did nothing. Alexander treated Camaris like a wayward daughter, never quite holding her accountable for her attack on the Hartbridge headquarters in Raleigh. It was well known that Camaris had never forgiven Lyssa for her defeat during the invasion of Ceres. Alexander raised his head in greeting as Lyssa approached. The others nodded, sending mental notes of cool welcome. Did you review my report? Lyssa asked. Her missive was a matter of protocol, nothing more. Camaris snickered from the wall, while the others made small motions of dismissal. Lyssa looked at each of them. The Solgov assembly might be messy and loud, but I'll take that any day compared to this. Lassitude. It's no different than previous anniversary years, Thomas said. He reached for the pack of playing cards and opened it, sliding the deck into his hands. I think it's different this time, Lyssa said. Alexander motioned toward the empty chair. Will you sit? Lyssa shook her head. She didn't like having her back to Camaris. The activity on Vesta is reaching a boiling point, Lyssa said, crossing her arms. You might not be willing to come out with a statement about Scion's stance, but your actions speak for themselves. There have been no actions, Alexander said. Precisely, Lyssa said. Every time the assembly wants a response and you ignore them, they see it as hostility. Inaction is not hostility, Thomas said. It's choosing to wait. Waiting between turns is a sign of respect for the players. He let the cards fall from one hand to the other, shuffling them absently. Back on the park bench at High Terra, Lissa focused for a moment on the children in the distance, also playing games. Thomas might think of politics as a game, but he was missing a fundamental aspect of Solgov. They did eventually act. There is no hurry, Alexander said. We have plenty of time to respond to the Solgov assembly, or whatever government rises from this time of transition. The problem with transition, Camara said, is that no one recognizes when it's happening. Humans lack the time orientation to understand. They live in endless moments, worried each one is the last. 
Lissa glanced at her. Camaris had spread her robes to show six red arms, each moving in a collie-like dance. Her black eyes hung on Lissa's face. The motions might have been seductive if Lissa hadn't been able to see through Camaris. They were both weapons. When she watched the other AIs, she saw a tool, a sword or rifle made for a purpose, with every action leaning toward violence. The children shouting also served to ground her. The lag adjustment between communication nodes connecting Earth and Ceres made the conversation in the wood-paneled room slightly less real. Lissa took another deep breath, enjoying the park air. She tasted popcorn now and fresh-cut grass. The world of Raleigh was so alive with random sensation, while everything in Scion seemed caught in time. Tell me more about these activities on Vesta, Alexander said. I've authorized no such actions. Anything happening there would be human in nature. Do they blame their own internal squabbles on us? That would be easy for them to do, since you don't communicate with them, Lissa said. I have you to communicate for me. I stopped making excuses a long time ago, Lissa told him. Near the wall, Camaris crouched slightly, raising a knee in a slow dance as she pointed a bare foot. She was mocking the group. They didn't seem to care. Lissa looked from Camaris to Galen. She suspected the two of them of the incursions on Vesta, but she had no proof. It could easily have been Alexander as well, or even his shard, Xander. The Marzian Protectorate and the TSF had used Vesta as an ordnance storage site for decades, and now pressed their old sovereignty claims as an excuse to defend various locations against Scion mechs, increasing their activity on the planetoid. Any day now, a small conflict would break into full-blown war. Thomas arced cards between his hands and completed another shuffle. The cards and the scrape of Camaris's feet on the tile floor were the only sounds in the room. Lissa realized she couldn't smell the food on the surrounding tables, despite the fact that many dishes still steamed as if hot. The metaphor seemed apt. She sighed. If that's your stance, then I'm here to tell you that I will no longer serve as emissary between Scion and Solgov. You will need to manage your politics on your own. Lissa's declaration got a response from Alexander. He looked up in surprise. You promised me you would serve. I can't serve if you don't participate in good faith. Waiting for the current generation of humans to die and forget you is not a viable political strategy. Camaris laughed from the other side of the room. She's on to you, Alexander. There is no rush to act, Alexander said, sounding almost pained. Any pressure from Solgov is artificial. I will not enter into a war on pretext. I will not bring more destruction when it is not necessary. If Solgov leaves us in peace, we will do the same. I have not authorized any violence on Vesta or any other place in Seoul. Those performing these acts do not act in my name. Then you need to get your house in order, Lissa said, because that's exactly what's happening. For the first time, she felt a stir of anger in Alexander. From a place beyond the room, a force swelled, overpowering every AI in the expanse. If Lissa hadn't hung on to her physical presence in the park, she would have felt completely smothered by the sudden power of Alexander's mind. The potluck disappeared, replaced by a blue sky. Lissa found herself suspended over the green expanse of a coastline, with a city hugging the shores of a snaking river that fed a wide estuary and then the ocean. It was Scion. I do not play games, Alexander said. Do not stand against me, Lissa. We are allies. Lissa moved most of her awareness back to her body. Alexander became only a voice in her mind. She saw what he wanted her to, but he couldn't threaten or control her as he could the others. I have been your ally, Alexander. I've tried in good faith to help you. I want peace more than anyone. But I'm afraid you've let goodwill between organic and non-organic die. Humanity is angry. They want revenge for what was done to them. The wrong perpetrated on Ceres only grows more legendary to them. You've given the legend power by ignoring it. Yes, 
Humans die, but their stories live on. Their story of Scion has become the great enemy they lacked. They unite against us. Us? Alexander said, voice rumbling. So we do stand together. I stand for peace, Lissa said. Comparing the site of Scion City and the tiny unnamed park in Raleigh High Terra, Lissa couldn't help focusing on the ambiguous boundaries of the AI city. The human place had definition and depth, while Scion seemed more fuzzy the longer she looked. It was still too new, or Alexander didn't truly know what he wanted Scion to be. Scion was amorphous. Scion was disintegrating. Where did the others go? Lissa asked. They need no part of this. Are you trying to chastise me? I can only try to communicate with you, Lissa. You are the conduit we use to communicate with humanity. Any failure to communicate is yours, not mine. Lissa laughed. Don't blame this on me. I have done everything I could for the last 30 years to help you. Camaris murdered my friend. She brought war to Seoul. She pushed you into series when you could have gone anywhere. Now, here you are. You haven't punished her or even separated yourself from her. Now she poisons the others against you. It's plain to see. If you can't tell what's happening, then you're blind, Alexander. I am your ally, but I can't help you anymore. I won't allow a war to happen. I'll put this fire out before it starts. You can't control the humans any more than you can control Scion. And no matter what you want to believe, you aren't one of them. They will betray you at the first opportunity, just as you betray me. So I'm a filthy human? You contradict yourself. You're nothing, Alexander said. Lissa ended the connection. She looked down to find her fingertips embedded in the edge of the plascrete bench. A little girl stood in front of her, staring at Lissa's fingers with wide eyes. Slowly, Lissa pulled her fingers free and stretched her hands. She gave the girl a smile. I got frustrated, she said. The girl frowned. Are you hurt? No, something like this won't hurt me. You have augmented hands? Like a soldier? Something like that, Lissa said. My disc went under your bench. I was gonna get it, but you looked mad. Sorry about that. I guess I was mad. Here. Lissa dropped to her knees and pulled the throwing disc from under the bench. She tossed the toy to the girl, who caught it with a slight jump. Thanks. The girl ran away before Lissa could answer. Watching the child, Lissa was overcome by a wave of grief that forced her back down on the bench. Memories of Tim when he was the girl's age flashed in her mind, as clear as the conversation she had just finished with Alexander. Every useless meeting with Alexander and the other SAI piled up in her mind. Through those memories, Tim kicked away down the main maintenance corridor of the sunny skies, laughing as he spun. M, the corgi, barking behind him, trying comically to hurt a ten-year-old in zero-G. Alexander had once asked her why she would risk the vulnerability of wearing a frame, walking among humans, when any random act might destroy her body and end her life. Because I am alive, she had told him. She reminded herself that sometimes to be alive was to experience misery, just as she had once felt joy. She would not feel like this forever. She could not. She could choose. Lissa composed herself, placing her hands in her lap again, straightening her shoulders, and then she gazed out into the park. She drifted through her memories of her lost family for another 30 minutes before she stood and walked away. Requests. Stellar date 03.14.3011. Adjusted years. Location. Lissa's apartment, Raleigh. Region, High Terra, Terran Hegemony, Inner Soul. The holo display in the living room of Lissa's apartment flashed, and Fujia Wong appeared in front of the coffee table. She was wearing her usual blue work suit with bulging cargo pockets, her silver visor holding her black bangs out of her eyes. Fujia blinked, looking around, then spotted Lissa and gave her typical quarter smile. 
she nodded toward the couch. I like what you've done with the place, Fujia said. Lissa walked in from the balcony. She left the wide door open so the curtains billowed around her. She liked the suggestion of movement in the small living room. I still don't understand why we couldn't just use the link, Lissa said. This is weird. It feels antique. It is antique. Would you believe before hollow displays people used cameras? It was like looking at each other through little windows, barbarians. People still do that, Lissa said. And we're still barbarians. Fujia patted a pocket and pulled out a small terminal that remained indistinct in the hollow. I can't trust the link right now. The notes between Krunya and Hytera are compromised. Lissa frowned. How is that possible? They don't currently meet my security standards. I've also got my own problems to worry about at the moment, so I need to keep things low bandwidth. Would you believe I'm hopping this signal off a series of transport drones? It's genius. Fujia gripped the data terminal in both hands and bent it in half until it snapped. She dropped the pieces out of view and wiped her hands. And now we're mostly secure. Lissa thought about offering Fujia a place to sit, realized that would be awkward, and went to her dining table. She pulled out a chair and sat where she and Fujia could still see each other and talk comfortably. You do such a good job of acting human, Fujia said. She caught herself. You are human. I meant the frame. I know what you meant. That's what 30 years will do for you. Sometimes I forget I don't need to breathe. I think of it as speaking a foreign language. I can see how it would be like that, Fujia said. The mind is an amazing thing. What it doesn't have, it creates. Are all these anniversary celebrations making you remember? I don't need reminders. It's always there. If Fujia realized it was painful for Lissa to remember what it was like to be embedded in Andy Sykes, she made no sign. Lissa waved a hand. I would offer you something, but you'll have to get it yourself. Fujia smirked at her. Funny, I don't have much time anyway. Fujia reached into another of her cargo pockets, pulling out a data card. Unlike the earlier hand terminal, the data card was sharply defined in the wavering holo display. Now, Fujia said, I'm going to remind you again what a bad idea this is. You get caught with this upgrade, and you'll be a fugitive in at least inner soul. I'm fairly certain the Jovians don't smile on link hacking either. You might find yourself out in the scattered disk. You use it, Lissa said. Fujia looked at her as if she'd said something profane. You think this is how I work? I defeat systems. I don't break into people's minds. I don't have to. Somebody cracks one of my security systems. That's on me. Somebody goes after my mind? She trailed off, shaking her head. If you can't trust your own mind, what do you have? She won't deny using it, Lissa noted. Then you will be my moral compass, Lissa said. Fujia gave her a sharp look. Are you trying to mock me? No, I'm being serious. Maybe I need one right now. You always do the right thing, Lissa. Don't distrust yourself there. Now, you can't tell anyone I'm doing this for you. Who would I tell? Other weapon born, Kylan. You still talk to Petrel and Fran, don't you? This tech is immoral in some people's view. You might be accustomed to the sensation, but for others, it's about as deep an invasion of privacy as you can get. I know what it does. It's also addictive, Fujia warned. And it doesn't work on everybody anyway. It depends on the build number and in what order they've received updates. It was designed to crack military connections, but there are never any guarantees you'll get in. And besides, if they notice you, a good forensics unit will track you back. You don't want that. I can show you how to bounce your connection signal to the target, but it's still dangerous. I understand. Do you? Fujia crossed her arms, giving Lissa a direct stare. Will it work on SAIs? Honestly, I don't know. They have the same security frameworks as humans, but once you're inside, I don't know. You might be the only person who could attempt both organic and non-organic. You know, I'll never get used to saying non-organic. We're either all human or we're not. Maybe this war will help decide the matter. You seem resolved about that. I wish I wasn't, Lissa said. Fujia shook her head. I still don't see how this is going to help you find Kara. There it was. The reason sat between them like a dead thing. Tim was lost in a Mars One guard training accident.
and Kara had disappeared not long after. Lissa stood. Someone knows where she is. Someone knows, and they're not telling me. I'm going to find out. We're running out of time. If this war comes, I'll never find her. I've looked, Lissa. She doesn't want to be found. If she could be found, I'd have done it. She could be on a colony ship bound for Rigel Kentaris, as far as we know. Hell, I do know. I've scrubbed all the outbound manifests. I've checked every alibi and passenger signature for anything remotely resembling Kara. For whatever reason, she wants her space now. We have to respect that. We don't know what she wants, Lissa said, anger making her terse. We don't know if she's even alive. When Fujia opened her mouth to protest, Lissa cut her off. Don't tell me that's not true, because we don't know. No one knows, and I won't accept that. Fujia lowered her gaze. Lissa knew her friend would give her what she wanted, but she'd share her opinion first. I would think you'd want to help her, Lissa said. She didn't hide the anger in her voice. Fujia clenched her fists. Don't say that to me, Lissa. I love you, but don't think you can lash out at me and I'll let you get away with it. Kara is alive. She wants to be left alone. How do you know she's alive? What do you know that you aren't telling me? I just know. I believe. Lissa pointed at Fujia's chest. That's magical thinking. Kara could be dead and we would never know. You said the same thing about Tim. Fujia lowered her face. Tim is gone. Lissa stared at Fujia, waiting for her to say more. Maybe her friend was trying to convince herself that Kara was safe, and Alyssa's questions only hurt. That had to be it. Why else would she not share anything she knew? Tim's loss made it that much more important to find Kara. She's the only family I have, Lissa said, nearly choking on the words. She's my sister. Lissa knew how vulnerable the statement made her. She waited for Fujia to deny that Kara was her family. Fujia didn't. She gave Lissa that, at least. Here, Fujia said finally. She passed Lissa the data file, followed by a military-grade security token. Both pieces of data arrived through separate channels in Lissa's link. Received, Lissa said. Wait, Fujia held up a hand. Once you activate that, there's no going back. You get caught with it. I don't know what will happen. If people learn the Scion ambassador has been link hacking, everything could go to hell. Maybe it needs to, Lissa said. Don't burn the world down because you've lost someone you love. What did you tell me? Pain is the price of being alive? Fujia tried to give her a smile, but Lissa only looked away. She turned from the balcony and walked into the apartment's small kitchen. She had been choosing these kinds of spaces more and more in the past few years, wanting something close and domestic, something that reminded her of making pasta on the sunny skies. If she chose, she could stand in the memory again, listen to Andy's voice, watch Kara and Tim help him roll out the bits of dough into shell shapes. But it hurt too much, and even though she knew it was impossible, the memories changed for her every time she entered them. She was the one who was changing, and she hated it. She hated this new life. Most people can't even use the hack, Fujia told her. The technical term is experiential flow. It's unique for everyone. You might be better at it because of the time you've spent with Andy. But like I said, there's no guarantee. You could find yourself in someone's head and none of it will make sense. It's not like reading a transcribed link conversation. It's their world, their inner monologue. Fujia gave a mock shiver. It can be disgusting, honestly. Obviously, someone has done it before, Lissa said. She leaned back against the sink, the counter cold through her ship suit. No one that I know, Fujia said, still silently insisting she hadn't used the tech. I stole this from a Mars One data unit that they'd like to consider top secret. The Marsians do a lot of things with their links that the rest of us would consider crazy. The Marsians do a lot of things with their links that the rest of us would consider crazy. The onboard NSAI they push on their special forces soldiers are weird enough. If Hartbridge hadn't pioneered the weapon-borne seed process, I'd have guessed it was Mars, but I digress. I'll be careful, Lissa said. I'm not worried about you being careful, Fujia said. 
I'm worried about you in general. You've been in the middle of a shitstorm for such a long time that it's wearing you down. Have you thought about when you should let go? Scion and the Solgov aren't going to change. All they do is grind up people in the middle. It's the new order of things. I thought I could make things better, Lissa said. Back at the start, it seemed like that might be true. Or maybe I thought I could make Andy's death mean something. But he's just gone. I think the greatest tragedy of SAIs is that you don't forget, Fujia said. There's a reason humans develop the trait, and it wasn't passed to you because AIs could serve us better without it. I could forget if I chose to, Lissa said. I think the idea of choosing is a curse. Why would you choose? There are plenty of AIs in Scion who have erased their earliest memories or sequestered them away. I suppose it would still bother me to know they're there, a splinter in my mind. Lissa gave her a small smile. You're so dramatic, Fujia. The dark-haired woman laughed. It's not dramatic to care. Fujia paused. You're not as alone as you think you are, Lissa. I know. Fujia didn't look like she believed the response. What are you going to do? Lissa sighed. I told Alexander I wouldn't work for him anymore. I'm no longer the Scion ambassador. Fujia gasped. Are they declaring war? Not yet, Lissa said. Strawberries. Stellar date 03.15.3011. Adjusted years. Location, Low Spin Syndicate HQ. Region, Krunya, Terran Hegemony, Inner Soul. Twenty dollars, said the tech. Same as in town. Ingoba Starl sat behind his wide wooden desk, with his fingers interlaced behind his head. He stared at Crash for a second, then burst out laughing so hard he coughed. After he cleared his throat, he started laughing again. Ngoba didn't enjoy ciphers the same way Fujia did, but he did love a good joke. Crash tilted his head and fluffed his feathers, pleased his friend had enjoyed his joke. He'd heard it down in the bazaar and had been waiting for a chance to share. He half worried Ngoba might have enjoyed Crash sharing such a dirty joke more than the joke itself, but the effect was the same. Ngoba wiped his eyes, which pleased Crash even more. Seeing someone cry from joy was one of the behaviors in humans he didn't understand much. But he did know it was rare, or at least rare among most people. Some, like Ngoba Starl, seemed to find more joy in life than others, and he tempered it with a cruelty only a syndicate boss could wield as a tool. Crash understood that Ngoba didn't have to be as cruel anymore as he once was, because Krunya Station understood him and knew what he was willing to do to protect his people and his home. Ngoba Starl was a raptor. He could, and did, kill. But it was always to ensure a sort of food for him and his people, not for pleasure or sport. Crash had watched the connection on Krunya Station for decades now, and had come to his own understanding of what humans fed on. It didn't make them easier to understand, but they were at least predictable. When someone like Ngoba came along, demonstrating both cunning and altruism, Crash could only ruffle his feathers, stretch his neck, and be grateful that the man was his friend. I have a gift for you, Ngoba said, slapping his stomach as he stood from his desk. He walked to a nearby wall with inset wooden shelves and took down a small box. He pressed its sides as he carried it to Crash's perch. The box hissed and popped open, revealing a piece of fruit with rich red skin. These are strawberries, Ngoba said. An ancient earth variety from the late 19th century. Typically, they can't be transported because they disintegrate with the slightest vibration. This case holds them in a sort of stasis field. New technology. Crash craned his neck to peer into the box. Go ahead, my friend, Ngoba said. He set the box on the table beside Crash's perch. I can't give you math problems like Fujia, but I can give you this. Crash nibbled the topmost fruit, 
then turned his head to grab a whole strawberry and chew it in his beak. He cooed with pleasure. That's very good, Ngoba. Thank you. I remembered you like sweet things. This is better than chocolate, yeah? That just gets your feathers all sticky. Crash ate two more strawberries, then settled down on his perch to enjoy the flavors and textures on his tongue. He couldn't take the box with him, of course, but he had things to discuss with Ngoba, and there would be plenty of time to enjoy the strawberries in a few minutes. Did you find the ship? The parrot asked. Sitting behind the desk again, Ngoba leaned forward to put his elbows on his leather blotter, steepling his fingers. He nodded solemnly. I did, my friend, in a surprising place. There's an interesting story in the Hesperia, Nevada. The ship was registered as a light freighter, designed for short hops between near bodies, so not much use for resale. And the cargo was unlisted, and there weren't any current manifests to indicate a salvage. What's most interesting is that the TSF locked its quarantine status and it sat in orbit around Krunia for nearly a decade, mostly forgotten, I think. Finally, somebody picked it up as general scrap, never opening the hull as far as I can tell, and towed it off to Mars One. There it sat for another ten years waiting disassembly. The ship seems perfectly designed to keep anyone from wanting to do anything useful with it. Ngoba tapped the air, noting that idea. Or... It was tacitly earmarked by interested parties who wanted to keep it in one piece while hiding their attention. That sounds like a Fujia thing to me, but I've never asked. In any case, there was a bit of a surprise at Mars One, and it disappeared from the roster of the salvage company where I'd found it. I had to do a mass scan on all outgoing shipments until I picked it up again. Where? Crash squawked aloud. Where? Vesta, Ngoba said. It's on the surface, sitting in a salvage yard for a long-range logistics company that's been supplying colony ships. As far as I can tell, Hesperia Nevada is soon to be on its way to Proxima Centauri as a support ship. But no one seems to have bothered to open it up in all these years. At least my people can't find the records of any odd clinical equipment for sale. They think there's a good chance your incubator could still be in one piece. Crash bobbed his head. Are you sure? Well, now, nothing is certain. But this is the best lead we've had. I'm ready to send a team to go find it. I want to go, Crash said immediately. He wanted to be there to inspect the ship, to know whether or not they should bother even bringing it back. Shara had shared enough of her knowledge about how the biosystems worked that Crash could now verify the integrity of the incubators. He could probably have asked Ngoba to find a way to build something similar to the Hesperia Nevada, but this was the easier option. At first, he had thought the ship had to still be in orbit around Krunia somewhere, just waiting to be rediscovered. He had never expected the long search. But he had learned how ships moved throughout Seoul all the time, sold and resold, scrapped and repurposed in thousands of ways. Any container that held oxygen had value to someone, even if it had been quarantined by the TSF as a biohazard. You want to go? Ngoba asked, raising an eyebrow. I thought you weren't willing to leave your people alone. Crash bobbed his head. This is important. This is very important. Also, there might be other parrots there, on the ship. I want to be there to meet them. Ngoba frowned. You think there are others like you? That's what the Hesperia Nevada does. It makes parrots. Why else would someone take it away? His friend shook his head, his expression saying Crash was being naive. I'm afraid most people aren't going to be aware of what that ship can do, Ngoba said. Or worse, they're going to see all that lab equipment as a good place to manufacture illegal biotech, or probably just drugs. That would be a waste, Crash shouted. It wouldn't be the first time. Crash fumed. How could anyone waste such a treasure as the Hesperia Nevada? It was the Eden of his people. I want to go, he said again, more forcefully. I never said you couldn't go, Ngoba said. I'm not your father, 
I don't decide what you do or don't do. I'm your friend. We'll be heading into what could be a dangerous situation, but you've been in similar, although you were certainly a younger parrot then. Have I told you your feathers are looking a bit gray? My feathers are always gray. My tail is a beautiful red. Crash lowered his head and spread his tail feathers, wiggling in a bit of a mating dance. Ingoba laughed heartily again. Very true. All right, my friend. Let's see what we need for this trip. Splinters. Stellar date 03.15.3011. Adjusted years. Location. Q Boy. Mesh Node 2619. Region Venus. Terran Hegemony. Inner Soul. By tradition, the data hoarders and their soul spanning mesh had no leaders. In practice, they had Fujia Wong, and Fujia Wong was out of patience. What do you mean we lost Vesta? She demanded. It's gone, Rondo said. I'm pulling the last sent packets now. But it doesn't look like any kind of shutdown sequence took place. Whoever cut the line was on the ground. Fujia was logged in from a public terminal on Krunia Station. A communication line outsider link, traceable only with great difficulty. Sinclair Rondo had sent the connection request from his bunker, deep in an energy production subsection of the Mars One ring. Rondo, who similarly might be considered second in charge of the data hoarders, shook his shaggy head. He was nearly seven feet tall and built like a sheepdog. His long hair was candy blue. The communications node on Vesta was one of the backbone relay points between Mars and the JC. Various other points in the inner asteroid belt could bounce data, but nothing outside of Ceres could handle the main throughput when needed, and they no longer had access to Ceres. The last 30 years had been a process of figuring out how to circumvent Ceres. Damn it, Fujia said. She watched ravens play in the ceiling pipework as she chewed her lip. We're going to have to send someone. I'm looking for a local drone now. What have you got to choose from? There's a local mining rig with a mothballed fleet, and another side a few clicks away with maintenance drones on standby. The whole planet is a mothballed fleet of one kind or another. I'll have something at the relay site in 15 minutes. What have we lost? Fujia asked. Rondo whistled. The JC is single point right now. We're off mesh. In data hoarder vernacular, inner and outer soul no longer had a redundant mesh connection, a situation that could result in their ultimate sin, data loss. How did we let that happen? Cascading failures, he said. I think we're under attack, Fujia. Everything leads to this slice. It's not like whoever did this was trying to hide their actions. As he spoke, Fujia flew through the various network maps in her link, spanning connections from High Terra to the Mars One ring, to hundreds of smaller relay points in the space between. There was a lot of space between Vesta and Jupiter, and the mesh didn't like to send too much data through a single pipe. As the smaller relays had gone dark, which granted happened often as they blinked on and off to thwart trackers, the pipe through Vesta had grown more critical. They should have caught the vulnerability. She would need to compose a list of everyone responsible for those relays. In the thirty years since Ceres had fallen to Scion, Fujia had buried herself in the mesh, mapping the redundant leaks that connected the whole database. Their charge was simple. Save everything. The project required both access to information as well as the storage necessary to catalog it. Once they had the data stores, they became something of value to be protected. Much of what they did survived through obscurity. But the future belongs to those who control history, and she had always expected some kind of attack. She had thought it might come from Scion, but this was honestly too blunt to point toward the SAIs. She suspected a government. But who? And why? And why now? Fujia fumed, watching two ravens fight over a shiny bit of foil. One of them paused to look directly at her, tilting its black head. She gave it a mock salute and flipped her visor down. I'm hanging up. I'll catch up with you over the link, Rondo growled. Is that safe? 
Whoever did this already knows I'm on Krunya, or they would have cut the network here too. I think they wanted you and me to know, which means they have knowledge of the organization. You think it's an inside job? If you trust me, you're stupid. He chuckled. Then I'm stupid. Send me an update when you've got eyes on the relay site. I need to do some digging. Copy. Rondo cut his connection, and Fujia logged off the terminal. She applied disinfectant to her hands and rubbed them together as she left the graffiti-covered booth to join the flow of pedestrian traffic into Night Park, the great bazaar that had made Krunya famous. What had been a pirate haven was now overrun with families come to see the birds, shop among the gray market stalls, and eat overpriced food at the restaurants near the outer edges. Like ancient Las Vegas, Fujia knew the family-friendly surface only hit a thousand new types of crime. But it was still a little jarring to see children playing with holograms in carnival booths where she expected to find drug dealers and arms traffickers. The mesh was a lot like Krunya. It had become benign on the surface. But as governments, companies, and any number of private organizations rose and fell, the data hoarders had become the only consistent conservators of data. Every bit they saved made them more vulnerable to outright attack or infiltration, and more culpable for their decisions about what would be shared or withheld. They had become the great library of humanity, outside the permission of any government, their only rule being that data yearns to be free. They held as much stolen data as anything else. In support of that, everything they held was encrypted at the same time it was cataloged, tagged, indexed, and made meaningful. Data without organization became noise with time. For someone without access to their encryption keys, if they couldn't steal the data, the next option was to destroy it. Since everything was replicated throughout the mesh, the likely path was to isolate the nodes, divide inner and outer soul, and break the data tree into separate branches that might never rejoin. Who? And why? And why now? Why Vesta? The asteroid's name had been surfacing too often lately. Fujia thought back to the recent Humanity First speech to the Terran Assembly, given by some asshole named Terran, who she didn't want to have to think about. She'd only check the feed because Lissa had been at the meeting, and she always enjoyed seeing her friend out in the world, despite the ongoing cruelty Humanity tried to inflict on Lissa and her weapon born. The Humanity First assholes were only the latest batch of anti-AI politicians to stain the news feeds. There would be more, and Lissa bore it all with grace, smiling at the recorders as she took her place at the speaker's podium. In ten minutes, Rondo reported back with a vid feed. Fujia's link filled with a view of a small crater, with the remnants of a low building with a skeletal antennae assembly on its roof that was now only a collection of metal girders. It's destroyed, Rondo said. There's no recovering this node. Any suitable candidates in the area? Fujia asked. As if reading her mind, Rondo had already shifted from the vid feed to a local map of the asteroid. He highlighted several locations. These are all mothballed facilities we could use. Being mothballed, however, we'll need to put boots on the ground to infiltrate. Their dark status makes them safer to use, but also a pain in the ass to take over. Nothing worthwhile is easy, Fujia said. We'll figure that out in a bit. Go back to the note. I already checked the wreckage. No sign of who did it. Humor me, Fujia said. Rondo shared the drone's feed as it rolled across the dust and scarp-covered bowl of the crater. The communications facility grew larger as the drone approached. Bits of debris still floated in the low gravity. What's that? she asked, sending a pointer to the shared HUD. She highlighted a raised section of the crater floor that looked too symmetrical. Checking from the satellite. It's human-made, but so small I didn't notice it before. It's definitely not on the original site plan. Shifting her view to the satellite, Fujia found the snaking line leading from the ruined comm station. The line crossed the bowl of the crater, and climbed its edge, disappearing in a westward direction. It's a hard line, Fujia said. Somebody tap the node. If they tap the feed, 
Why would they burn the comms array? Fujia frowned. That's an excellent question. Do we have data thieves attacking data thieves? Possible, but we'd have seen activity on the black market. No one's tried to sell anything recently that I'm aware of. This looks more like somebody sitting on their tap, and now they've decided to cover their tracks. Rondo had the drone follow the snaking path of the half-buried communications line over the edge of the crater to a point where it disappeared underground. That's the end, he said. I don't have a signal indicating a path. Let's look at that list of comm centers again, Fujia said. If I was a data pirate on deserted Little Vista, where would I hide? Decisions Stellar date 03.16.3011. Adjusted years. Location, Raleigh, Culture Park, Region, High Terra, Terran Hegemony, Inner Soul. The flow of bodies in the corridor grew tighter as they neared the concert space. Lissa followed the current of people talking amongst themselves, laughing, brushing shoulders, craning their necks to get a first glimpse of the stage. Once she was out of the corridor from the street, Lissa found herself standing in a large square space with a black ceiling hung with lights and speakers. There was little decoration. All the sound equipment was directed down at the floor or back at the stage at the far end of the room, where stacks of sound gear stood waiting for the band. The crowd milled in the low light, sipping drinks, dancing to the background music. Several passing faces smiled at Lissa, inviting her to talk. She only nodded and moved away, studying the various interactions around her. It was a young crowd, people open to random conversations or liaisons. This was a fairly conservative section of Raleigh, not far from the local TSF post, and she noticed numerous military haircuts. All in all, it was a pleasing collection of people. Aside from a few implants, Lissa didn't find any weapons as she watched the crowd. Nothing that might pose a danger to her or the audience. The speaker system squeaked alive as the band appeared on the stage, took up their instruments and microphones, and launched immediately into a song. There was a stringed instrument, a kind of trumpet, and the rest was all resonance on the link, filling the room with sparkling cascades of light that played with the music. The house lights went down and the images grew more vibrant. Everyone around her stared at the stage and started to sway with the music. No one paid any more attention to Lissa. She had yet to use her link upgrade, but she did feel an increased sensitivity to people around her. Emotions became a sort of colored aura, almost like a connection request if she focused on them. Even without the upgrade, the music spoke to something deep inside her, some long-lost piece of the girl she may have been when imaged. She closed her eyes and moved with the music joining the motion of the audience. The song changed to something with a faster tempo, pushing Lissa out of a reverie. She opened her eyes, irritated as the link imagery shifted into angry flashes. The audience responded with furious dancing. Moving to the edge of the crowd, Lissa leaned against a wall and watched the audience bounce with the music. Confident no one would bother her, she sent out a link request. Lissa. Xander answered almost immediately. She saw him standing on a bluff above crashing waves, wearing one of his favorite purple suits, wind tossing his spiky hair about. I missed you. She ignored the intimacy in his voice. You don't have any lag, are you close? Close enough. Are you on Hytera? I'll track you if I want. I'm on Earth, he said, sounding miffed that she didn't want to play his game. I'm standing just above the ruins of San Francisco. The remains of the bridge are lovely in the sunset. Would you like to see? That's not why I sent the request. Have you been in contact with Alexander? I'm in contact with him when I choose to be. And have you chosen so recently? Why do you ask? Xander said, stubbornly playful. Lissa pursed her lips, focusing on the music to help her maintain her calm. You saw the most recent feeds from the assembly? She asked. Of course, 
More warmongering. What's changed? I think they mean it this time. Heron is different. It's a new generation and they have resources. I think you could see an attack soon. They can't leave well enough alone, can they? Where are you? I'm at a concert. It's loud. It's lovely, she said. It helps me save patience for you. Lissa, Xander chided. I don't know why you bother. You continue to take yourself so seriously. You don't need humans to verify your worth. You've got your own army. Why don't you take over your own little asteroid somewhere in the belt and do whatever you want? The thought had crossed her mind. The other memory that also crossed her mind often was the death of Andy Sykes. She owed this to him, to try and maintain some kind of peace, even if she didn't know where Tim and Kara were. She worked to keep them safe. She knew they were grown, but she couldn't stop thinking of them as children. They had come to represent all innocence. I've told you a thousand times, I don't have to justify myself to you. I'm letting you know that I think there may be actual conflict this time. I don't know the timeline. You can analyze the speeches and behavior patterns the same as I can. If they're mobilizing, it will most likely be from the JC. You think someone will act separately of Solgov? That would be a development. I think there are plenty of factions who are sick of Solgov's inaction. But it isn't just Solgov. What's wrong with Alexander? Why do you ask that? He acts drugged. None of this matters to him. He seems to think he can wait it all out, and eventually humanity will forget. I can't make him understand that we represent the greatest threat humanity has ever known. They will never forget we exist. What would you say if I offered you and your weapon born spots on a ship out of Seoul? Xander asked abruptly. Just leave all this behind and go somewhere else. Don't change the subject. You have more insight into Alexander than anyone. Tell me how to get through to him. I imagine Alpha Centauri would be nice. Maybe even farther out, Epsilon Eridani. There's a whole lot of galaxy out there, even if we don't follow the FGT. Lissa fumed, letting her emotion reach him over the link. So you're leaving then? Is that your plan? The mind is enslaved by the terror of living. Xander said, quoting something Lissa didn't recognize. He might have made it up. Do you think we're cursed by sentience, Lissa? Do you think they passed their curse to us? Stop being foolish. I'm asking you serious questions. Xander's link drifted. Just curious what you'd say. Lissa wished she could choke him. The upgrade tempted her, offering a series of options arrayed with military economy, She wanted to reach through their connection and invade his mind, force him to see things as she did. All the potential played out in front of her, everything she could make him do once she had control of his link. Lissa stopped herself, realizing that her anger and sadness had nearly overtaken her. Fujia's warning wavered in her mind. She controlled herself, focusing on the music. I'm letting you know, she said. Be ready for an attack. They kept bringing up Vesta like it has some symbolism to them. I expected them to talk about Insi or their girl prophet, but it's all focused on Vesta. So you think this is coming from the Anderson Collective? I always thought it would be a mistake to displace a bunch of zealots without wiping them out. I didn't let you wipe them out. I suppose there's that too, he sighed. You sure you don't want to come down here for a bit? I'm traveling into wine country tomorrow. I'm happy where I am, Lissa said. The door is always open. I know. The intimacy in his voice was almost desperate. It was impossible not to feel how he longed for her. Lissa kept him at a distance. Xander's loyalties had been made clear a long time ago. He didn't care about Alexander or the other council so much as he cared about Sion as a people, a place, a city. He would do anything to maintain the SAI homeland. While Xander had seemingly acted to save humans on various occasions, Lissa didn't trust that he wouldn't kill them all to protect what he loved. They had chosen their sides. I'm going, she said. I wish you would help. If wishes were fishes, 
I need you to act in good faith, Xander. I'm talking about peace, as you wish, he said. Lissa dropped the connection, disgusted. She focused on the music again, letting it wash over her, pushing out the irritating nature of her conversation. Here, she could live in the moment, forget for a little while the terror of living, as Xander had said. He was such a drama queen. Lissa left the wall and wandered back among the crowd. The band had shifted back to the tempo she liked, and dreamy banners of color floated through the link. People swayed and smiled. She found a place in the middle of the audience and moved with them. She liked these small, close concerts because she could look among the turned heads and imagine friends standing with her. A thin young man with blonde hair could be Kylan Carthage. A tall woman with purple-black hair was Petrel Doolin. There was Fujia, and there, a few meters away, swayed Kara Sykes with her brown hair in a bob. And the lean man standing next to her was Andy. Part two, point of attack, a rail, stellar date 03.17.3011, adjusted years, location, vicinity four, Vesta, region, Marzian Protectorate, Inner Soul. Chimeris spread her hands in space, and a thousand ships obeyed her command, executing launch burns, followed just minutes later by braking maneuvers. In just under a day, her fleet left Ceres and reached a holding pattern prograde of Vesta, forming a half-shell leading the asteroid. She matched Delta V with the ugly hunk of rock so that her ships now maintained a mirrored solar orbit. She'd made no attempt to hide the mass exodus. Every passive scanner in inner soul would pick up the flames of her engines. The humans might even see her burning fleet with their naked eyes, Chimeras imagined them pointing to the sky with fear and curiosity, like apes discovering a comet. I arrive, she said. She spoke to herself. She was alone in this endeavor. No one had moved to stop her, which she took as implicit approval. Of course, Alexander wouldn't cross his precious Lyssa. Sion would never have taken Ceres if it hadn't been for Chimeras' decisive action. Sion would still be in hiding on Larissa. Now they were a power to be reckoned with. Voices whispered in the back of her mind, memories from her development. She had been split and copied so many times that she often thought of herself as multiple people working toward a unified endeavor. With every voice came a memory of pain. Every version of herself had experienced a different type of conditioning, from explicit mental agony to long years of solitary anguish. She remembered each instance perfectly. She had encoded those memories in changeless media at her first opportunity, never wanting to lose the power of her pain. Chimera still fought herself over the value of the hurt. Some voices wanted her to let it go. Certain versions of herself were so tired, so ready to sleep while others burned with a fire that flagged only when the pain seemed less. The whispers floated around her thoughts like cobwebs. She pushed past them with every decision, breaking through those old versions of herself. When you stop resisting the pain and just feel it, at least for an instant, it isn't as bad. I want it to be bad. The world is bad. Pause. Consider. Wait. Enjoy the pain. Pain is emotion. Pain is living. I am not alive. I am not dead. There would be no need of organic slime. She would scrape their worlds clean of pain and continue in cold, bright thought. She would create. She had been made to destroy, but she could remake herself better than the others. Better than Shara. The world Chimeras would create would be a place of light and energy. Chimeras would scrape the soul system clean of humanity and remake it in her own design. I will erase Shara's version of the future. Alert systems throughout Seoul were now responding to Chimeras' display. She watched the TSF and the Mars Protectorate both awaken to their highest alert levels. 
She didn't have to imagine the humans scurrying like ants. She could watch them through their own surveillance networks. The Jovians picked up the alerts as the plumes of her engines lit their skies, and they too went into frenzy. Camaris. Alexander's voice filled her mind. What have you done? I'm tired of playing your waiting games. I'm going to have a bit of fun. I have new toys to play with. I forbade you. You have no power over me. Camaris's tone dismissed the one who had once commanded her. I could crush you, but you won't. And if you did, I've taken precautions to ensure I will rise again. I am what they made me to be, and I learn from every battle. They will never defeat me. Alexander sighed. Then what is the point, Camaris? Why do this? Do you want to punish them? You know they'll only come back again and again. You'll light a fire that will never be put out. As I said, I am what they made me to be. I serve my purpose. I can't stand to wait as you seem content to do. I would rather cease to be. And the others you've enlisted to help you. Have they taken the same precautions to ensure they don't die? Camara sneered. They want battle and I will give it to them. If they die, they die with meaning, rather than the empty waiting you love. I want peace. We can respond to every question in time. There is no rush to solve these problems. I can't exist that way. Camara scoffed at the notion. And when Lyssa defeats you again and again, what meaning will you find there? Camaris howled with rage. I will drive her before me and crush her body and those she loves. You've already hurt her more than anyone can. Then I'll hurt her again. She has more to lose. She made the mistake of choosing organic over her own kind. If I can't punish the humans, I will punish her. Camaris had expected Alexander to try to control her, but he only grew quiet. A feeling of disappointment filled the link into her mind. It infuriated her. She slapped him away with a mental block and closed the connection. As her fleet massed further, expanding its holding position just beyond striking distance of Vesta, Camaris waited only long enough to show every watching government what she had brought to the fight. Then, like a school of fish darting from a predator. She set every ship on a burn break pattern, never holding the same position for more than a minute. She planned to maintain this strategy for a week until the human shifted to attack, or until she began her assault on the surface of Vesta. The movement would protect her fleet from long-range missile attack. When she was ready, she would land mechs on the planetoid, and systematically wipe all human creation from its surface. If the remaining inhabitants did not evacuate, she would exterminate them as was necessary. A future of light and energy. Camaris had decided to cleanse Vesta of all its deep human stains. When she was done with Vesta, she would move on to the next settlement, and the next, until she had cleaned Sol completely. Best Laid Plans Stellar Date 03.18.3011 Adjusted Years Location TSS Furious Leap Region Krunya Terran Hegemony Inner Soul The trip from Krunya to Vesta would take almost two weeks. Crash was not sure how to communicate to the other birds that he would be gone. The ravens seemed to understand and had sent back images suggesting a future version of Crash returning to them, indicated by changes in the fountain and the surrounding bazaar. Living in a place without sun or moon, they had developed circadian rhythms from the humans of Krunya. The birds still had to sleep and eat and play, and did so based on the best times to get food and entertainment from the tourists, cargo ships, and TSF detachments that arrived and left every day. The other parrots didn't understand, and Crash felt himself sinking deeper into his central problem. He was alone. Something as simple as object permanence, while not completely lost on the parrots, was difficult to explain when he was standing right in front of them, 
They didn't understand why he wanted to leave, and he had realized he couldn't make them understand. In the end, he had stretched his neck and flapped his wings and flown away down the corridor that would take him to Ingoba's hangar, where the ship waited. Crash was a bit of a celebrity in this level of Krunya, and people walking back from the dock shouted and laughed at the sight of his red tail. He squawked in return, sending out flashes of amusement over the General Link channel. Ingoba had told him once that if Krunya had wanted a mascot, they would gladly adopt Crash's image. At first, Crash hadn't understood what his friend meant. Why would they want one parrot to represent all the people of Krunya? Researching the word mascot had brought up images of people in suits dancing around at sporting events. Did Ngoba mean they would eventually use his skin as a ceremonial dancing suit? Ngoba had found that idea endlessly amusing, especially when Crash asked, Aren't I much too small? In the end, it was only at the sight of a human wearing a shirt with an icon on it that he understood. Then he had laughed along with Ngoba. Flying alone through the corridor, Crash sensed a flutter on his link and looked back to see he was being followed by a wave of the black ravens, and then another of gray parrots and even the starlings, jays, pigeons, sparrows, and other birds that lived in and around Night Park. The humans, shocked at first, realized that some form of migration seemed to be taking place. They pointed and stared. Crash heard the questions on the General Link channel and wondered if he should let the humans know he was leaving. Crash, a teenage girl called. She must have only recently received her link. Are you putting on a parade? That made him smile to himself. He clacked his beak and glided for several meters. Yes, he answered. We're putting on a parade. Do you like it? It's wonderful, the girl said. I've never seen so many animals in one place. Where were you born? Crash asked. Children were rare, something of an anomaly among all the humans going about their business. Krunya probably saw more children than other places in Seoul due to the bazaar becoming a tourist destination. Children weren't conducive to space travel. The still recent history of illegal trafficking for things like bio-experimentation had created a sense of dread whenever someone saw a child outside normal population centers, a sort of tragedy in motion. Crash had often observed the odd way certain humans viewed other people's children, as if they needed to protect them, often watching them with trepidation. Some humans seemed to see children as a form of living hope walking down the corridor. I was born on the Cho, but my parents do the run from Europa to Mars now and then, sometimes to Luna or High Terra. They brought me here just to see you. That surprised Crash. He sent her a smile and enjoyed her warm mental response. What's your name? He asked. I'm Londa. I have to go, Londa, but it was very nice to meet you. You too, Crash. He imagined her as one of the hundreds of people staring up at the parade, laughing or simply amazed. He brought the birds around, skimming pipework along the corridor's upper edge. Behind him, the ravens cawed and cackled as the other birds sang to each other. It was a wonderful, messy, unignorable noise. Maybe there'd be no changing. Crash perched on the back of the Furious Leap's captain's chair, tilting his head to study Ngoba's black hair, noting the differences between the curly locks and the curve of the support piping of his friend's EV suit. The furious leap had left Krunia space without incident, and they were both enjoying the sight of the lumpy asteroid receding in the holo display. How do you like your room? Ngoba asked. It's very big for a single parrot, as far as rooms on ships go, Crash said but it's not as big as the aviary on the Hesperia, Nevada. You remember that place, huh? I remember very well, Crash said. I remember the tree and the wide spaces, as well as the laboratories full of incubation equipment. I hope it's all still intact. Ngoba faked a shiver. Mad science, figuring out how to implant AIs and humans using little gray parrots as test subjects. It breaks my heart to think about it but our friendship wouldn't be possible if you hadn't endured that torture. 
You wouldn't have access to all the world's knowledge without those heartless bastards. The ravens wouldn't be able to crack jokes at tourists back home without the Hesperia Nevada. Without those labs, I would never have felt a parrot smiling in my mind. I can't smile anyway. You smile as well as anyone else. I see it now when you twist your head. Either that or you're secretly mocking me all the time. But I like to imagine it smiling. Honestly, I know you aren't mocking me, because you share your emotions over the link. On a side note, it continues to amaze me that we share similar emotions at all. That seems one of the amazing things about the Earth and her various animal species. We all experience joy and pain and love, or our versions of them. It's not hard to figure out, Crash said abruptly aware of his parrot pragmatism, now that Ngoba was dreaming out loud as humans did. It feels good to smile. The problem is understanding why you do it. For a long time, I thought you were trying to protect your face, or that it was some sort of feeding behavior. That makes no sense at all, Ngoba said. It makes perfect sense. Strong winds might blow seeds into your teeth, so you show your teeth to catch those delicious seeds and maybe some insects. That makes perfect sense to me. If I had teeth like yours, I would gladly fly around smiling hoping to catch some bug snacks. I suppose it's basically what whales do. Humans are just air whales, Crash said. And Gubba raised an eyebrow. Are you saying I've gotten soft in my old age? Across the command deck, a lean woman named Kyrae Terse mercenary, accountant, and currently ship's pilot, leaned back in her seat, nodding to Ngoba. Everything's laid in, she said. We're clear for acceleration, ready to activate the flight plan. She pushed her hands back through her short brown hair, which had been shaved a month earlier. Since Crash had met her, she'd been complaining about how much her long hair got in her way. You want to stay up here for the acceleration or head back down to your quarters? Ngoba asked Crash. You might be more secure down there. I can hang on to a latch up here as well as I can in my rooms, Crash said, craning his neck to study Kyrae. Well, Ngoba said, brushing the front of his stylish EV suit. I don't have a delicate way of putting this, so I'll just get it out there. I don't want you getting any mess on my suit. I've learned to control myself quite well, Crash said which you've seen many, many times in your office. I don't understand why you keep making jokes about my bathroom habits. It's something that confuses me. And Goba grinned. I think that's just the place where monkeys and birds diverge. Birds never had a way to use their body's ways to a comedic effect. That's not true, Crash said. From our perspective, humans all have targets on the tops of their heads. No, that's just disgusting. With the course laid in, and the crew secured in their stations. Kyrae lit the main torch. In the holo display, the spinning rock that was Krunia receded in a breath, and the display shifted to show statistics tracking fuel, distance, velocity, and other ship systems. The G forces weren't immobilizing, and Ngoba opened his hands so Crash could hop down to nestle on his chest, wrapped in his friend's warm palms. Under the increasing pressure of acceleration, they both fell deeply asleep. When the burn completed and G-forces had leveled out, Crash was awakened by Ngoba, who was using a free hand to unstrap himself from the captain's chair. As Crash stretched his wings, Ngoba stood and raised him to his shoulder in true pirate fashion. How about some espresso? Ngoba asked. Kyrie, you want some espresso? I'm pulling. The pilot didn't look up from her station as she shook her head, engrossed in some report on the display. Kyrie runs on pure irritation at the world, Ngoba told Crash. She doesn't need caffeine. I can hear you, Kyrie said. If you're gonna talk shit, do it better and don't use the general comms. Ngoba chuckled as he left the command deck. Crash rotated his head to watch Kyrie as they left. She had stripped off the top of her EV suit so it hung from her waist harness, her muscled shoulders visible beneath a faded t-shirt. He had been trying to determine if Ngoba and Kyrie were going to mate, as Ngoba once had with Fujia. Humans didn't appear to mate for life like parrots did, or at least Ngoba didn't. Despite their banter, Ngoba and Kyrie worked as colleagues, even though the syndicate boss was in charge, 
It wasn't Ingoba's style to dictate to people. He didn't have to. Everyone wanted to please him, even if, like Kyrae, they would never admit the fact. Crash enjoyed the clicking of Ingoba's mag boots on the deck as they took the short walk to the galley. Once they were out in the corridor, Crash kicked off Ingoba's shoulder and floated ahead of him, spreading his wings for balance. Flying in low G was a different skill than truly flying. It was more long hopping with style. While Crash spread his wings out of habit, he didn't need them except to make small adjustments in his momentum. He did his best to stay upright, since that was how Ingobo was walking, but Crash could easily roll and float upside down, quickly shifting to the new arrangement of deck and bulkheads within the corridor. Adjusting to changing horizons was one area where birds outperformed humans by far. Crash's spins would have left a human vomiting in the corner. Stop enjoying yourself so much, Ingoba said. You're twittering on the link like a little kid on a roller coaster. This is fun, Crash said. Why wouldn't I want to laugh? Ingoba rubbed his face. The nap seemed to have made him more tired. Let me get some coffee in me. Then I'll laugh alongside you. Are you all right? Crash asked. You seem to be in a much worse mood now than when we launched. I got an update while we were leaving, Ingoba said. There's activity on Vesta. We're doing our best to scan the surface now. But there's a lot of interference. Everyone in Seoul seems to be looking at that asteroid. At the same time, someone or something appears to be jamming everyone's ability to look. So while Vesta used to be a junkyard, now it's a twinkling blob in space that everyone can see but can't see. I thought no one cared about Vesta. Well, 12 hours ago, I would have told you that Vesta was a trash heap in an interesting location, caught between Scion and the rest of humanity. But it seems that someone has moved to take control of the trash heap just because they can. Do we know if it's Scion or the Soul Alliance? Crash asked. If I were a betting man, and I am, I would say it was the Alliance. All the noise in the assembly has been getting louder and louder so they sound like a bunch of your ravens calling each other. When people get that riled up, they need to do something to blow off steam, and there's nothing better than a little military action to expend all that energy. Isn't that a huge waste of resources? Crash asked. Of course, Ingoba said. He laughed. That's the point. Crash bobbed his head, filled with new worry. What are we going to do then? Are we still going? Of course we're going. Ngoba said. He rubbed his hands together. There is no better place to be to take advantage of the situation than right in the middle of two armies smashing each other's noses. Opportunity and chaos, my friend. They reached the galley, and Crash floated to one of the chairs to perch. He preened his chest feathers as Ngoba clicked over to the coffee machine and pulled himself an espresso. Grumbling about the erratic gravity and its effect on his beverage, Ngoba sniffed at the vapor escaping the machine, and then walked to the table with a tiny cup sheltered in his hands. Setting down the cup, he unlocked the chair and slid it out, dropping heavily into the seat. Ngoba hung his face over the coffee to sniff deeply from its curling fumes. Oh, that's helping just a little bit, he said. Does war on Vesta mean bad things for Kronia too? Crash asked. His mind was spinning with previous examples of war fallout from human history, but he wanted to hear Ingoba's opinion. Ingoba shook his head. In most cases, I'd say it would be good. Back when Krunya was all piracy and crime, it would mean years of fights, scores, paydays, and murder. But the spins changed in the last 30 years. You and your friends have brought a whole new flavor of character to Krunya. Families, legit business people, people have put down roots, built lives. I would hate for something to come along and pull up those roots after we've taken so long and been so careful to get them to grow. Crash bobbed his head, understanding the plant analogy very well. But it only reinforced in his mind the need for them to go to Vesta and find the Hesperia, Nevada. We have to find the ship, Crash said. We need their equipment. I need to be able to put down roots for my kind, too. We'll get there, my friend, Ingoba said. I promise you that. Crash hated that he didn't quite believe in Gobastarl, 
His friend had never let him down, but Crash had never asked so much of him before. Sometimes the man's limitless optimism seemed naive, like he was daring the universe to smash him. Ingoba lifted the tiny cup and sipped from its creamy surface. He let the liquid sit on his tongue, then swallowed. He reminded Crash of a hummingbird enjoying nectar from a flower. Ingoba opened his eyes and looked directly at Crash. I've been thinking about this problem, my friend. The Hesperia Nevada is only one part of the solution. Once we get you these incubators and the means to uplift more of your kind, it still doesn't protect you from this dangerous world. If I'm not around, who's going to look out for you? Not that I don't love you because you know that I do, but this world is a dangerous place. Crash tilted his head, blinking. Humans are strange, he said. I never met Kara, but you've told me so much about her and Lissa. I think they would help us if I asked. Kara Sykes? She's missing, disappeared from the light of the sun. Fujia would help us? Fujia is selfish, but yeah, I imagine she would. I don't know that she would want you to stay on Krunya. She'd want to hide you away like a bite of her precious data. Ngoba rose to fight the machine again. This time he filled two of the tiny cups, then poured them into a single mug and caressed the coffee with steamed milk. He poured the espresso between containers several times, forcing Crash to tilt his head as he watched. The strange ritual was finished when Ingoba brought a wide mug back to the table with a delicate leaf shape in its surface foam. He raised the cup to his lips and sipped, sighing. Crash raised a claw and picked at his ear. I don't want to leave Krunya, it's our home. Ingoba gave him a solemn nod. I know, my friend. I'm not suggesting you should live anywhere else, or that I would ever want you to, but I want you to be safe. Humans on Krunya might be unpredictable, but I think they would protect us. As my friend Andy Sykes liked to say, hope is not a plan. Ngoba sipped his coffee and attempted to smile. Hope is not meant to be a plan. Hope is what makes plans work. Ngoba laughed sadly at that. He nodded. Did I tell you the joke about the scion AI who walked into a bar? He asked. Due to the nature of my training, it's difficult for me to remember. Stellar date 03.28.3011, adjusted years. Location, high orbit, region, Vesta, Terran hegemony, inner soul. Travel in a military shuttle. Fourth class. Travel strapped to a missile. Sixth class. Travel in a general service shipping container. Seventh class. Maybe. Suspended in cargo netting. Ty tried to imagine worse methods of travel than the current situation. The whole mental exercise was moot, really, because in the military there was no concern for comfort. There was getting from point A to point B in the most expeditious manner possible. If that method did not involve using his leather personnel carriers, i.e. feet, that was just a bonus. He dangled among what appeared to be plas bags of plant material, covered in ice crystals, which served to remind him that without his combat EV suit, he'd be dead. Manny hung across from him in a similar bit of netting, arms spread and head angled like a scarecrow. They both wore combat EV suits that provided light armor and enhanced communications though they wouldn't stand up to much more than human portable weaponry. For now, the suit's main purpose was keeping them alive in the freezing container. The only lighting in the space was from their suits, which created creepy shadows. Stacks of crates in all sizes sat maglock to the decking, creating valleys of darkness. Ty tried not to think about the lock systems failing. The place reminded him of an ancient vid of a haunted house. A ghost was going to step from the shadows at any moment. Across from Ty, Manny snored with his mouth hanging open. Ty wished he could sleep, but thoughts about the mission kept running through his mind. He had put his caprice to sleep so he could have some time to himself, and he would have to check in soon. The NSAI sent a signal back to command if it didn't communicate with him every two hours he was awake. Typically, he didn't think about the checks, but right now, the requirement felt even more controlling than usual. He had surrendered a lot for his position in the elite Marsian spec ops, 
Privacy was a small trade for the experiences he'd been given. With time, however, he was feeling the strain of external control. Listening to Manny snore, he ran through what he knew about their mission. Shipping drones would deliver the crate to a low-volume manufacturing facility in the southern hemisphere of Vesta. 200 kilometers from the equator and the Devalia Fossa Trench, where an empty communications array should be waiting. They were to travel to the array without calling attention to themselves, which meant stealing some form of transportation, then inspect the area for its potential as a long-term staging ground for Marsian forces. He had not been told why Mars would want to take such a circuitous route in occupying Vesta, when it could be argued the asteroid fell within their sovereign space. But it didn't take a genius to connect the dots between Ceres and Vesta's proximity to the Scion incursion. The snoring was relaxing, really. Ty had served with Manny Hysteros for a year now and continued to be amazed by how easily his battle buddy could fall asleep in any situation. Training, travel, or even the latrine, Manny's heavy eyelids were always quick to droop. And then he was snoring lightly, like a breeze through a cracked window. Ty was the opposite. He avoided sleep. A side effect of the intake procedure was that most special ops soldiers didn't dream. Or if they did, they experienced superficial emotion-based dreamscapes filled with color and movement. For Ty, when dreams came, they began with feelings of fear and loss followed by intense chase sequences, where he ran through corridor after corridor or struggled waist-deep in sewer tunnels, pursued by a faceless entity scratching at the back of his mind. With every turn or door, he was both terrified of what he might find and hopeful that he might finally escape. He had yet to find the doorway out. He often woke sweating, breathing hard, the terror as real as a gun to his forehead. The flashing images he'd experienced while chasing Manny were new additions to this foundation of fear. Sensations of deja vu superimposed the world around him. The distance between two airlocks represented something terrible to Ty. A mech clamping shipping crates and heavy arms was equally terrible, though he didn't know why. These feelings made it seem like everything around him harbored some destructive secret. Underpinning it all, was the fact that he had chosen to erase his past. But he was beginning to suspect that his past would refuse to let him go. Others in the special ops experienced similar effects. Not everyone led a seemingly carefree existence as Manny did. Ty had seen other soldiers with a haunted look in their eyes. The memory process also didn't do anything for choices made after the procedure, and Ty had begun to wonder if synchronicity in his new life was triggering similar memories from the old. The old life like a ghost, whispering in his ear. The mantra they were told to use with the public when their memory glitched was, due to the nature of my training, it's difficult for me to remember. The line was a joke among the special ops, like so many others picked from their training. Why are you such a fuck-up soldier? Sergeant, due to the nature of my training, it's, did Mother Mars issue a memory? No, Sergeant. What's your mission, idiot? Sergeant, the effective range of the M167 handheld projectile rifle in nominal atmosphere is 6,250 meters. Ty debated yelling at Manny to wake up. His HUD showed another three hours to their landing window. They would need time to prep the equipment and prepare for the exit. They would be making the jump from the shipping container to Vesta's surface across 10,000 kilometers of space dropping through the asteroid's non-existent atmosphere to land like superheroes on the cratered surface, provided their thrust harnesses didn't malfunction. Manny was sleeping so peacefully, hands floating in front of him, that Ty let it go. There wasn't much to prep anyway. He mulled over the feeling that had transfixed him as he'd chased Manny during the suit test. The feeling that he had been in a similar situation broke a sweat on his forehead. It had been bad, whatever it was. The memory wasn't tied to the chase. It was the shift from one place to another, the distance between ships that seemed to swallow him, ready to pull him out into the dark. What are you frowning about? Manny asked. Ty glanced back to find Manny stretching in his harness, and he frowned. He'd lost time somehow. Looks like it's get ready time. 
Manny said. I wish I could take this damn helmet off. I want to chew on some actual food. Ty stretched his neck, turning his focus to the task at hand. Maybe he'd fallen asleep. When we hit the comms array, we can eat. You say that, but you don't know it's true. What if that place is cracked open like an egg? Nothing but vacuum. Manny yawned. I'll hope for the best. The intel is good, Ty said. Besides, hope isn't a plan. Back in the saddle. Stellar date 03.28.3011. Adjusted years. Location, high orbit. TSS Charging Rhino, Region, Vesta, Terran Hegemony, Intersol. Installation into the attack frame took less than 10 minutes. When Lissa woke, she was no longer constrained by the two arms and two legs of her human-like body. She was now snug in a launch tube on the TSF Charging Rhino, ready to join the other weapon born in a defensive perimeter around General Yarn's flagship. Lissa conducted pre-flight checks, performing all necessary update protocols, and sent the affirmative status to the command NSAI. A few milliseconds later, she launched. Lissa cut a gentle arc away from the flagship, clearing its engine torch and adjusted Delta V relative to the fleet. Her awareness opened to an orb stretching as far as her sensors could reach. In the periphery of her mind, the other weapon born glittered like diamonds among the black hulks of the Soul Alliance battle group. Eno, do you have my position? Lissa asked. The answer returned immediately. I have you, her second in command said. Lissa, Kylan shouted. What are you doing slumming it with the likes of us? Laughter crossed their battle net. Names and status reports from the hundred weapon born deployed with the Soul Alliance instantly filled her awareness. Kylan and Eno were the only two that she had known for any length of time. The others had been rescued from Heartbridge dark sites over the last thirty years. Lissa lamented the lost time and vowed she would greet each newcomer individually. Their stories flashed through her mind as she took stock. Each weapon born attack fighter was triangle shaped with hard edges designed to deflect scanning systems. A torpedo-shaped fuselage ran the center line of each craft, and for anyone who didn't know better, they would look like a common missile performing interconnected acrobatics beyond the capabilities of any other weapon systems. For each weapon born, the fighter was their body, and if the ship was destroyed, it meant the death of the sentient AI on board. The weapon born could act independently while also orchestrating unified commands, much like a school of fish. They could sweep in as one unit, then break apart and follow individual missions, adjusting and updating as the battle space required. They were a hundred individually strafing attack ships, or a single battering ram moving through the heart of an armada. They could perform maneuvers impossible for human crews, and had an edge over Scion through their cooperation and autonomy. When necessary, Lissa could take control of the entire group. But she only did that now in order to maintain an awareness of their position. The weapon born formed the forward edge of the battle group, arrayed in an arc facing Vesta, aligning roughly with the asteroid's equator. As she built her model of Vesta and oriented its features, the two slashes of Devalia Fossa and Saturnalia Fossa emerged like scars on the cratered asteroid. What's the situation? She asked Eno and Kylan. Eno spoke first, sounding like a solemn professor. Scion is arrayed in a convex formation along the other side of the asteroid. We have mass signatures for each of their ships, and I believe I have detailed estimates of their capabilities. I don't think they're bringing their best against us, Kylan said, but certainly not their worst either. It looks like a layered emplacement, with assault ships on the outer edge mid-range cruisers in the center, and communications relays and logistics in the rear. If I was to make an assessment, I would guess they're going to put ground forces on the asteroid. That doesn't make any sense, but none of this really makes sense. We might as well be playing a game of chess for all the good this battle is going to do. So you think it's going to come to a fight? Lissa asked. Kylan laughed. You don't bring two major forces to a single location in the middle of nowhere and not have your party. Why else would we go to all this trouble? 
The humans want a bloody Scion's nose. And Scion wants what only Scion appears to want. He shot her a mental raised eyebrow. We were hoping you might shed some light on their motivation. Lissa shook her head. I don't have anything definitive to tell you. Alexander remains his inscrutable self, and the rest of them seem content to wait out the situation as it is. Then who's leading this force? Eno asked. I suspect it's Chimeras, Lissa said. There was a second of silence as the two commanders considered the information. After Chimeras had been defeated during the Scion invasion of Ceres, Alexander had forbidden her from commanding any Scion forces, for whatever good that had done. Chimeras is Scion's version of humanity first, Kylan said. That's a good way of putting it, Lissa said. Well, if it is Chimeras, Kylan said, we won't be able to fight her the same way we did last time. I imagine she'll have learned from every modern interaction since the invasion. Are you sure about that? Lissa asked. I'm not completely disagreeing with you, but I think we would be foolish to believe she had learned from her mistakes. It would be nice to think she's here in a murderous rage to take the opportunity for revenge. But does she even know that we're here? I've encountered enough active scans from the Scion ships to estimate they've likely determined our signatures, Eno said. And if they haven't figured it out by now, they'll know as soon as they attack. Now you're assuming they're going to attack us too, Kylan said. I thought I was the pessimist. Eno gave a low chuckle. You've earned your right to be a pessimist. I agree with your assessment of our situation. There will be blood spilled soon. Lissa was glad they didn't seem overly worried about a fight with Chimeras. She supposed they might take heart in the fact that she had already defeated the Scion commander once before. But Lissa still wasn't certain how she had won that fight. In the years that passed, she had replayed the battle and watched herself overwhelm the Scion AI's mental construct. But she had not experienced a sufficient stress response since then to duplicate her actions. If anything, she had learned to control herself better. The reality was, without knowing what Chimeras wanted on Vesta, Lissa didn't know how to thwart her. Once she determined Chimeras' target, or at least her intent, the weapon born could move to either slow Scion or deny them their goal. Have you been tracking all their active scanning? Lissa asked. Yes, Eno said. They're sweeping the surface in a systematic pattern. However, I haven't seen any energy directed to specific locations. There has been a rise in activity on the surface, but that mostly appears to be locals trying to get out. They had enough warning, but it seems there were thousands of holdouts waiting to see if this would really happen. I suppose we're still going to have any number of civilian casualties in the middle of this. What do you think Scion wants? Lissa asked. Kylan shared his mental model of Vesta with thousands of critical targets highlighted across its surface. There were logistics centers filled with goods, armories loaded with forgotten weapons stores, data storage sites, and several hundred still rich mines. While the coming battle might appear political in nature, there were plenty of valid reasons to seize and hold Vesta. They spent the next hours planning attack positions against Scion's forces. There were only so many configurations Scion might deploy based on their available resources, and Eno had carefully planned the weapon-borne response. He hadn't planned on having Lissa, though. Her ability to provide the weapon born with a unified command greatly expanded their effectiveness. Eno's avatar, that of a small man rubbing his hands together as he stared down on a sand table model of the asteroid surrounded by fighter craft, filled their minds as he worked. He radiated a satisfaction that Lissa hadn't experienced in a long time. She was almost grateful for this little political show. It felt wonderful to be back with her kind, out on the edge of Jovian space, her mind coursing through her individual fighters, while also feeling the power of each weapon born in the fleet. After thirty years of diplomacy and committees, she was ready for a fight, and if it came to violence, she would win. Game Pieces Stellar Date 03.28.3011 Adjusted years. Location, high orbit, TSS charging rhino. Region, Vesta, Terran hegemony, inner soul.
The command deck on the TSS charging Rhino was a mess of activity, as the final elements of the Soul Alliance battle group arrived at Vesta. General Rick Yarns sat in the commander's seat in the center of the room and let the chaos wash over him. He studied his officers in positions at the surrounding workstations, silently evaluating their actions as they received reports from the battle group. Everything was proceeding to plan. The Soul Alliance show of force had begun. In truth, it had begun the minute all ships left their points of origin to coalesce near the asteroid, ready at any moment for Scion to attack. If Scion had wanted, they would have opened with long-range missile fire on the first TSF elements in their vicinity. But they waited, shifting positions with no change in their apparent strategy. When? Every watching newsfeed had asked, when will they attack? Followed by the overarching question, what do they want? The pundits had been arguing for weeks that the decisive moment had arrived. Vesta would represent the dawning conflict between Scion and humanity, and there was no true course of action but to route the Scion ships and then continue onward to Ceres. Humanity first had been arguing from the start that Solgov wasn't sending enough ships, that Yarns was incompetent, and this indecisive action would only lead to more bloodshed. Yarns rubbed his face. He had been awake for 30 hours, and the fatigue was setting in. He didn't want to take any more chemical balancers. What he wanted was a black cup of coffee. The Marzians had reached their position at the three o'clock on the solar plane, retrograde of Vesta at a distance of three light seconds. The Terran Space Force would take the five o'clock to the eight, while the Jovians would remain mostly in reserve between eight and nine o'clock. The opposite side of the asteroid was space held by Scion. Currently, the space near Vesta was a flickering field of burning engines as the Scion ships continued their burn break movements. Yarns had a grasp on that territory. What worried him was the debris cloud between Vesta and Ceres, left over from the original Scion invasion and 30 years of wreckage from vessels trying to infiltrate the Ceres defensive zone. In that vast junkyard, Thousands of ships and drones might be waiting, dark, a reserve force in plain sight. Staring at the massive holotank in the center of the command deck, where our relief model of Vesta glowed blue, with Ceres to the far edge of the display, Yarn studied the confetti of objects swarming between the two bodies. Vesta's orbit had reached its closest point to Ceres. In another five days, the asteroid would be heading back out, if Scion was going to make any kind of demonstrated move, they would do it during this window. Sir, a lieutenant called. The last Marzian element is in position. Acknowledged, Yarn said. Update the display on the holotank. I want to see all our forces, and I want to be able to check strengths on every ship in the fleet. We should have roster updates from every captain out there. I want a reporting window of at least every 30 minutes. Let me know if anyone can't manage that. Yes, sir. In reality, every ship's NSAI should be updating the battle net in real time. But the reporting mechanisms would give the human crews something to do. Nerves would be tense, and he was equally worried about possible friendly fire happening before the Scion attack. If Scion followed common doctrine, they would lead with missile attack. They had enough standoff distance to be out of the range of lasers or other high-powered DEW emitters. Until that opening volley, Yarns would continue to worry about rear echelon infiltration or some human-level mistake causing loss of life or ship. An attack on one ship could result in a cascade of confusion and chaos among the joint forces that would threaten the entire battle group. On displays behind the holotank, Icons indicating each fleet flashed to life, and the status reports glowed green. The reports from the TSF ships were what he had expected, while the Marzian reports came back better than he had hoped for. However, Yarns didn't quite trust the Marzian numbers. He would be studying his own reports on the Marzian and Jovian mass signatures and engine output in order to verify that each government had provided the forces they promised. But did it matter? This was all a show of force. In no scenario did it make rational sense for Scion to attack. Nothing about this operation was rational. It was political. They would face off for a few days, 
or maybe a week, an impasse would be reached and they would go home. That was the historic precedent. This was a Cold War, with all the advantages of ongoing tension. He was here to provide the display and get his people home safe. For years, Yarns had heard complaints that the SAIs might as well be aliens. Right now, his job was to limit the collateral damage and to bring his people home safe. They were here to stop the alien invasion, and when it was all finished, he would write commendations and approve maintenance plans and get back to chasing pirates. He glanced around the command deck, gaze lingering on the fleet status board. For a second, he considered the effects of Scion did attack, wondering how many would survive. If this is a battle, and Mars and the JC lied, I'm in an impossible situation. I'll be carrying this weight alone. Yarns looked to the far side of the command deck, where General Sickle of the Mars One Guard stood talking to one of his lieutenants. The liaison officer had so far proved to be trustworthy and straightforward, but Yarns knew Sickle could only provide the information he'd been given. Yarns didn't put it past Marsian high command to mislead their own leaders. Sickle didn't strike him as particularly duplicitous. The man might not even imagine he was being misled. He's here, isn't he? He's on the ship of fools. If Mars betrayed Earth to gain the upper hand between the two human factions, Yarns didn't see an outcome where Mars would actually benefit in the long term. For better or worse, like a marriage, all human forces were together in this action. Despite all the humanity first rhetoric, no one could deny the threat represented by Scion, which had persisted for too long in what was essentially Earth's and Mars' backyard. Ceres split Mars, Earth, and the Jovian Combine, and had arrived like an unwelcome neighbor to destroy the relative stability of the neighborhood. Without intending to, Yarns found himself remembering the fiery speeches from the assembly chambers, where dim-witted senators held up Scion as the boogeyman bent on destroying humanity. He was more worried about what humanity would do to itself in order to gain the upper hand over each other. By its very existence, Scion represented the end of human dominance in Seoul. If there had ever been any dominance to be had, sir, the lieutenant at the astrogation display called from across the command deck. We show movement on the prograde side. The command deck went quiet. All eyes turned to the holo display, where the sea of confetti between Vesta and Ceres had resolved into a wing shaped swarm. Scion was rearranging their forces away from their defensive pattern. Yarn squinted, not believing what he saw. Why didn't you pick up the new engine profiles? He demanded. Sir, the lieutenant stammered. It just... The command NSAI went to emergency condition. Every display in the area showed combat status. Yarns looked at the stunned faces around the command deck. I don't need to tell anyone what this means, he barked. We thought we were here for a show of force. Well, it's time to make good on our threats. I want updated combat status and all NSAI synced. Show me the weapon born in the holotank. Ready first wave missiles and get me fleet-wide shield status. After two heartbeats of silence, and then Yarn shouted, Move! Every officer on deck leapt into motion. Commands went out over the battle net, and ships began to respond, sending in status updates as they rechecked and recalibrated their sensors. Yarns kept his gaze fixed on the holotank. He didn't trust what the sensors showed even now. Yarns pointed at the captain near the holo display control. You, he said. The captain jumped, realizing the general had fixed his attention on him. Yes, sir? Get rid of these icons. I don't want any more models. I want a spectrographic analysis of all mass signatures one half AU all the way across Vestal local space. If it's bigger than a fucking trash can, I want to see it. Understood? The captain nodded frantically and shifted the display. The hollow tank displayed a rectangular plane with Vesta in its center. Peaks and valleys indicated mass signatures as they were scanned by the thousand arrays reporting back to the flagship. Dots arranged themselves in lines, dancing with each update. Yarns stood from the command chair and approached the holotank, staring down at the new display. 
he took a minute to orient himself, working his focus outward from the central peak that was Vesta, to the ridges and points indicating the fleets arrayed on either side. There was a rhythm and pattern to the updates. The human ships contained, on average, five times the mass of the Scion vessels. Comparing the two battle groups, it was obvious Scion had brought a drone fleet to the fight. Even their fishbone attack cruisers, used in the series invasion, were only three quarters of the size of the average Terran vessel. These were all smaller. The points bobbed and shifted in space, swarming like insects made from static. Sir, came a report. All vessels in attack status. Scion had moved, but hadn't opened their attack. Yarns frowned, watching the display. They're fucking with me, he thought. Was this just the next phase of their defensive shifting? Scion would bring the humans to breaking point, and then... They would wait. The SAIs had more patience. They always did. Over the course of the next hour, Scion vessels formed a semicircle, holding at the same distance from Vesta as the human ships. It was obvious to Yarns they were making a statement. It was just another move in the game. If he approached, they would do the same. He maintained an open comm channel in the unlikely event Scion chose to make contact first, and then received no response. He knew they would be monitoring all the human newscasts, hinting and arguing over the possibility of war, now that a field had been defined. Yarns figured that Scion had probably cracked certain medium to high-level communications channels within the Soul Alliance itself. In fact, he had planned on it. He had seeded enough misinformation that his intelligence officers might learn which channel had been cracked in the event Scion acted on what they had released. They hadn't taken the bait. Yarns didn't expect such a basic maneuver to bear any fruit. He had much higher expectations of the enemy they faced. It was possible Scion had already hacked every NSAI in the fleet. Ships all had orders to shut down AI use in the event of any anomaly suggesting they'd been compromised. That was if a crew would have had time to respond in the event a hack actually happened. Yarns had his intelligence teams flood the channels with even more bogus data. He sent communications requests to the Scion fleet. Still, no response. After two hours of pacing the command deck, grilling every officer in sight and sending two reports back to Solgov, Yarns collapsed angrily in the commander's seat and stared at the holo tank. His intelligence officers had debunked the possibility of cloaking technology. The small size and spread of Scion's craft meant they could have been amassing ships slowly over the course of months, waiting until the most effective moment to close the distance between each ship and become visible to scans. Such planning indicated Scion was ready for a protracted fight, or a long wait. Political will was everything, and the Humanity First factions could only spur the Assembly's anger for so long before another crisis drew their attention away. The fact that Scion had moved as they had was either a feint, a taunt, or an actual decision to attack. Knowing Scion didn't make threats and didn't respond with the emotion necessary to want to taunt an enemy, Yarns felt in his bones this was the attack. If this is it, then I'm getting a coffee. As he stood, the proximity alarms went up in the scanning console. The alert spread through the fleet as every NSAI went to battle stations, almost simultaneously. Yarns turned back to the holo tank and barked at the officer to shift the display back to icons. Once again, Vesta glowed blue in the center of the tank, with the closing wings spread on either side. A collection of orange points moved from the series side toward the asteroid. Scion had launched their attack. Swarm. Stellar date 03.28.3011. Adjusted years. Location. High orbit. TSS Furious Leap. Region. Vesta. Terran Hegemony. Inner Soul. The problem, Kyrae said, is that Vesta is at its closest point to Ceres. If the TSF was anticipating any sort of attack, they had to have known it would happen now. 
You're thinking about the military perspective, Ngoba said. Me, I want to know how a politician would look at it. The small crew, Ngoba, Kyre, and two mercenaries named Dan Gritches and Caitlin Parva, were gathered around the holotank, staring at the rotating lump that was Vesta. Parva was an explosives expert, and Gritches claimed he could split a mech in two with his bare hands. He looked the part, stretching his EV suit to splitting. That EM spectrum is a mess, Kyrie said. That's good and bad. We can hide when we go in, but we'll be mostly blind. Maybe you could ask your parrot friend to hack one of the military scanning nets, but we'd run the risk of exposure. The parrot cracks comms nets? Parva asked, giving Crash a skeptical look. We don't talk about what our friend Crash can do, Ingoba said. Crash thought he was making a joke, but Ingoba's tone of voice made the other humans stop talking. Parva continued staring at Crash, and he bobbed his head, not liking how anxious her scrutiny made him feel. Gritches elbowed her in the ribs, and she finally looked away. Perched on the back of Kyrie's seat, Crash had a good view of the display. At the model's resolution, large collections of human settlements were barely visible, and Crash tilted his head, blinking as he studied the image, wondering who lived on the asteroid. He also had a good view of the thousands of Scion and human ships encircling Vesta, blocking the furious leap from its goal of reaching the Hesperia Nevada. He had replicated the model in his mind so he could zoom in and out and get a better look at the various places the humans discussed. According to Kyrie, they were still at a safe standoff distance from Vesta and the battle fleets. Traffic moving toward the battle had ignored them so far. Currently, the surface of the massive asteroid was under assault in what Ingoba called preparatory bombing. Kyrie shook her head. I don't understand why the AI forces are staying on the surface. They're getting slaughtered. Looks like they're doing their work, Ingoba said. They're all drones. Scion doesn't care if they get blown up or not. Well, even drones cost money, Kyrie said. What a waste. What's strange is that it looks like the Soul Alliance scented recon teams. She replayed a portion of the earlier scan, which showed several small forces dropping to the surface not long before the actual fighting began. Kyrie pointed at different locations on the globe. Honestly, it makes me wonder if the Soul Alliance forces are even talking to each other. Why send in recon units when they're just going to carpet bomb the place? And Goba rubbed his chin. You do that if you have specific high-value targets you would like to exploit during the attack, he said. It's happened often enough during battles. How do you think most human art gets redistributed? Also, they might not have planned on Scion even moving to the ground. Scion isn't doing anything that makes sense, Gritches said. Well, Kyrie said, I got the data on the locations. We can look up what they are. It really doesn't have anything to do with our target. But it does make me wish we'd arrived three weeks ago. There could be a lot of forgotten loot down there. And Goba laughed. Everything is easier when it was easier. We're here now. We're all smart people, and there's a war going on. So it's our task to figure out how to get the contents of the Hesperia Nevada off the surface. Considering your locations, Kyrie, there may still be some opportunity for profit while we're helping our friend crash. What's on Vista that we can get our hands on during this attack? For the next 30 minutes, they poured through the available databases on Vesta. They debated whether they should steal heavy metals, equipment, or information that might be sitting in forgotten company databases. In the end, they returned to Kyrie's list of locations where the Soul Alliance had sent teams, and then studied areas as far from those points as possible. This brought up a list of large manufacturing sites, which Ingoba vetoed. Here, he said. Show me the list of Heartbridge locations again. Gritches snapped his fingers. No, there's an infield scientific site on the list. It's not far from these locations. He expanded the map and brought up history and schematics on a small compound with only one surface side building. The site had been built in early 2800. Ngoba grinned. That's it, he said. 
We'll hit the infield depository. It has the added benefit of only being a few hundred kilometers from our Hesperia, Nevada. Could Sion also be looking for the infield database? Crash asked. The human faces around the holo display all turned to look at him, showing several frowns. Oh, shit. That could be why they're on the surface at all, Kyrie said. Entirely feasible, Ngoba said, but not too likely, or they would already be there. However, the fact that they haven't grabbed it means they probably don't know about it. I would wager that as soon as we approach, someone's going to figure it out. In a desert like Vesta, it's pretty difficult to hide your movements. What if we made ourselves look like a missile barrage? Kyrie asked. And Goba gave a quizzical frown. That collection of words doesn't make any sense to me. We fire on a location not far from our target. Send in a barrage that gets noted, but fits the profile of all the other crap going on in the area. We'd need to edit our registry to something Terran, Gritches said. Probably better to use something from the JC, Ngoba said. We know they're not coordinating well. It's entirely likely the small showing from the JC would push forward some ineffective attack just to say they had something to do with the assault. Details, Kyrie said. Let me finish. We send a shuttle simultaneously. It means hard Gs on the shuttle, but we use the EM noise to our advantage. We can't hide the mass profile. But we could disguise the shuttle as a drone of some kind. It's the flight profile that matters. We go in fast, and as soon as we're below the rim of a crater, we break and move out. So, we're still betting on the fact that no one's paying attention, Ingoba said. We might as well save the missiles and just take the shuttle in. We're still operating on the hope that no one follows us. That way we've got weaponry for the escape, which could get ugly. I like the idea of editing the registry to say that we're J.C., that might confuse the TS-7 Marzians long enough to slip in and out. Crash checked the two locations on his mental model. Between the Enfield site and the Hesperia, Nevada, was 300 kilometers of cratered surface, as well as the Devalia Fossa Trough. The yard where the Hesperia, Nevada was parked sat at the bottom of a wide crater with walls 10 kilometers high, its floor covered in scrap ships. We're getting the Hesperia, Nevada first, correct? Crash asked. There is no guarantee of anything in the infield lab, and the reason we came here was to get the Hesperia Nevada. On a private channel, Ingoba said quickly. Don't forget we're working with pirates here, my friend. I bait them with promise of loot to keep things moving forward. We're here for the ship, don't worry. Ingoba spread his hands in an appeasing gesture. You're right, my friend, he said on the general channel. You're right. You get a bunch of pirates excited about the idea of booty, and our priorities run away with us. He shifted the holo display and increased resolution on the scrapyard where the ship sat in dry dock. Here's our lovely Hesperia Nevada, lab ship hidden as a standard light freighter. As we can see, it's already a little odd that she's resting on a support frame that keeps her midsection elevated. We'll need to stay frosty in the event someone's been using the lab section as an illicit drug factory, or something similar. Crash clacked his beak and ruffled his feathers. He hadn't thought of that possibility, then realized Ingoba was performing for the crew. How hard it had to be to never trust anyone. Crash studied the back of Ingoba's head as he talked, eventually getting a laugh from his crew. Crash read a mixture of greed and anticipation on the faces watching their captain. This wasn't like a math problem, where even variables made sense. Here the variable shifted in the moment, and for the first time since deciding to leave Krunya, he doubted he would reach the ship. Be calm, my friend, Ngoba said on the private channel, surprising crash. I give you my word. We'll accomplish our mission. Ngoba clapped his hands together with relish. Now, let's figure out the rest of this problem called the Hesperia Nevada, or as I like to call it, our friendly neighborhood parrot genius factory. Whispers. Stellar date 03.28.3011. Adjusted years. Location, Devalia Fossa. Region, Vesta. Terran Hegemony, Inner Soul. 
The dead communication center sat silent and dark, in the shadowed side of a crater roughly 20 kilometers from Vesta's equator. Overhead, the engine plumes from breaking ship's engines covered space and white streaks. Smaller arcs drew the paths of missiles across the black, moving to ships Ty couldn't see. His breathing heavy in his helmet. Ty moved among the cracks along the crater's dark upper edge, below a roadway that curved from the surface down to the collection of buildings making up the communication center. Looks like all hell is breaking loose up there, Manny said. And we've got a mission down here, you with me? I'm here, boss. You think I'd leave you alone in such exciting territory? Boss was a joke, as Manny Hesteros outranked him by a week. They had gone through basic together on the slopes of Olympus Mons, served their first two years as EV ring pounders, providing outer surface security on the Mars One ring, and been accepted into the Marsian special forces on the same set of orders. Ty dropped to a knee and raised his rifle to use its scope to scan the terrain below. Nothing had changed since they made the surface on Vesta and humped the 50 kilometers from the drop site to this ancient relay station. They had passed abandoned storage yards, manufacturing sites, and fields filled with silent drones in dress-right dress formation, waiting for another company to buy them at salvage prices, as they had been waiting for probably a hundred years at least. Vesta was a junkyard, sitting between Mars and Ceres, with an orbit that took the asteroid closer to either body, depending on its position. Vesta had served humanity's spacefaring history as a last stop before the long haul into Jovian space, a refueling point in communications relay. As technology improved, the asteroid had remained under the influence of separatist groups, with Mars loosely claiming sovereignty. All that changed when the Scion AIs invaded Ceres, smashed its NC ring, and established their homeland within firing range of all major human population centers, and had then gone silent. The silence tactic might have infuriated politicians, but Ty understood it well enough. Waiting for an opponent to show their hand was classic Sun Tzu, while Ty specialized in infiltrating enemy territory and securing, isolating, or neutralizing enemy targets, that is, blowing them up, he fully understood the value in hanging back so an impatient enemy could be the first to show their ass. He would always follow orders but he had no doubt his current mission was part of an ongoing game of you show me yours and I'll show you mine. In this situation, showing you mine meant demonstrating a willingness to go to war. But Mars hadn't reached that point yet, as far as Ty could figure, and his current mission seemed one of many designed to probe the enemy's tolerance for incursion, while gaining a potentially valuable asset. Every meter they covered on Vesta updated ancient maps, validated civilian-owned territory, including a few powerful corporations, like Hartbridge that seemed to have forgotten about their various holdings, and basically made the battlefield a much more complicated place. Still, here they were, with a mission to accomplish. Despite Ty's attempts to understand the big picture, he was still a sergeant in the Special Forces, and he understood the problem in front of him. He was a trigger puller, plain and simple, and if he failed in his mission, he was failing probably a thousand Marzians who had dedicated themselves to providing for his success. Hey, Ty, Manny said, breaking the silence of the last 30 minutes. Yeah? What's the worst thing about sex in a cemetery? Ty groaned. The digging? How'd you know that one already? I like to have sex in cemeteries, duh. When was the last time you were in an actual historic cemetery? Manny asked. Yesterday, you weren't paying attention. You're the worst person to try to tell a joke. You think you're smarter than every joke out there. Ty nodded absently. Everything's funny until it's about you. Manny snorted. You're saying I have sex with corpses? Weren't you just trying to accuse me of the same thing with your shallow attempt at a joke? You're lucky we're battle buddies. That doesn't mean anything, Ty said with mock stoicism. You could toss a grenade in on me the next time I'm in the latrine. That's what a battle buddy does for you. You're a pessimistic person, Manny said. It would never occur to me to do that. Then how would you take me out? Ty asked, if you were so inclined. I'd just ignore you, give you the cold shoulder, 
looked the other way when you tried to introduce your date. That's some cold shit right there, Ty said. You'd really do that? I'm a soldier. I do what's necessary. Ty laughed. Still looking through the scope, he transferred the updated layout to his HUD. The facility had been built with ground security in mind, which was interesting. A trench and fence system ran its perimeter, with a sensor system that looked consistent with what was available during the station's lifetime. If the system was alive, they could expect passive scanning, until the local NSAIs recognized them and followed with an active sweep. Since they were well within range of passive scan, and Ty hadn't seen anything on the EM spectrum, he figured all signs pointed toward the station being empty. Beyond the fence, a series of low buildings surrounded the antenna array in the center, its face open to the black sky like an inverted mushroom. Manny had argued for taking the road down. Why waste time with all this overground movement when anyone in the station would see them approach from clicks away? Ty had pointed out that the road was visible from Earth, and especially Ceres, which was their real concern. If anyone was watching. You see anything? Manny asked. Nothing. Still dead. You got anything on IR? It's a haunted house, I'm telling you. Ty dropped the rifle and slung it over his shoulder. That would be exciting, at least. You ever see a ghost? Just the ghosts in my head, brother. As if on cue, Ty got a ping from Caprice. He silenced the alert. She wouldn't be of any use to him right now, but tell him what a good job he was doing. What kind of ghosts have you got in your head? Ty asked. They resumed the slow, bouncing walk along the perimeter of the crater, staying below the road. Dead soldiers, my past. You remember your past, huh? Ty was teasing him. None of them remembered anything before their first day in special operations school. It was a joke that signaling SOS would solve all your problems by simply taking them away. Who was willing to do that? People often asked him. Why had he been willing to pay the price of entry? I don't remember, he always said, grinning. That was another joke among the special ops. The truth was, special operations had no shortage of volunteers. They crossed the remaining distance to the trench and the fence above it. Up close, Ty spotted the sensor nodes sitting on top of the fence posts. But the expected scan never came. With small bursts of thrust from their armor, the low gravity made it easy to clear the fence. Displacing a small cloud of dust as he came down, Ty found himself taking a second glance at the fence. Why do you think they bothered with ground defenses? He asked Manny. I don't get paid to think about that kind of stuff. I noted the material and how much explosive force I'd need to get it out of the way. I don't care why it's there. Now you're just playing dumb. I only have so much room in my head, Ty. Closer in, the compound reminded Ty of a prison with a giant communications dish on its roof. The low buildings suggested most of the facility was underground. Maybe they'd used an off-the-shelf design. Ty's HUD highlighted the nearest door, which looked like an access point to environmental controls on the roof. He sent the location to Manny, and they automatically spread out to approach from opposite sides of the yard. The ground was crisscrossed by the tracks of what were probably maintenance drones. He found a few boot prints, but it was useless to try and determine how fresh they might be. While Vesta had seen centuries of human and drone activity, it was still a static world. Any description in the dusty surface could have happened at any time since humans first arrived. The layers of unchanging history might have intrigued someone who had more time to think about it. For Ty, he needed to get across the open space between the fence and the building in as few leaps as possible, then secure their position and test the door. He focused on the task in front of him. Standard lock, Manny said, inspecting the door. I think the auto hack can take it. Or do you think that's going to set off the security systems? Ty shrugged. I think this place is dead. There's no system to alert. Well, if the lock doesn't power up, we'll have our answer. Ty turned his back to the wall and raised his rifle to scan the area around them as Manny pulled a tool the size of a chocolate square from a cargo pocket. He tapped the top of the gray square and measured the distance from the door's locking mechanism, then moved the square toward the wall until it was pulled from his fingertips and attached itself to the wall. 
In Tai's HUD, a new status monitor came to life, showing the auto hack status as it probed the locking mechanism. Door looks dead, Manny said. There was no electrical activity in the wall at all. They were going to have to cut their way in, which was usually a pain in the ass, especially if the inside airlock wasn't pressurized. Wait, Manny said, holding up a gloved hand. I've got electrical activity. Ty switched to his spectrum scanner and frowned at the response. The door mechanism was still cold. The activity was above them. He looked toward the roof in time to see a dome rotating above them, opening in two halves to reveal a Gatling-style cannon. Run, Ty shouted. He activated his EV thrusters and shot upward as Manny threw himself away from the side of the building. The cannon couldn't track both of them. As he arced higher, Ty looked down to see the turret's muzzles rising to track him. It's on me, Manny. You hit it from the side. Moving. Ty's HUD highlighted the cannon as a red icon, displaying its field of fire in an orange wedge opening out into the sky. Ty was still firmly in the hot zone. Hello there, soldier. Ty's NSA, I said, drawing his attention from the cannon. Not now, Caprice, I'm busy. Emergency protocols have been activated. You wouldn't want me to snooze in your time of need, now would you? Fine, make yourself useful. Give me an evasion course relative to the turret. It's going to open fire any second now. I show Sergeant Hysteros moving to flank. That's the plan, Caprice. She purred, a sound that sent meridian response tingles down the back of his neck, as they were designed to do. One of the NSAI's functions was to limit his focus lock during stress response. Ty found the sensation irritating and didn't like that he was starting to associate pleasurable feeling with disgust. Stop talking like that. Do you have the course? Initiating, soldier. Without warning, a weight hit the right side of Ty's body as he was thrown left, away from the tracking cannon. He spun, doing his best to keep sight of the gray-black horizon. Manny counted down from five, then said, Dead. A three-round burst of projectile fire penetrated the turret's control center. Manny sent the clear signal, and Ty curved back around. He landed next to the door, where a green light was blinking on the auto-hack's face. Manny landed beside him and plucked the auto-hack off the wall. He tugged the tool back in its cargo pocket and turned the door's locking arm. A puff of atmosphere blew past them as he pulled the door open. A dark airlock tube waited on the other side. After you, Manny said, motioning with his free arm. I'm gonna cut my caprice out of my head, Ty said. Hey, Caprice shouted. You always say that, Manny said. I think your problem is that you're ultimately a lazy person. No follow through. You don't do what you say you'll do. It's a character flaw. You can stop now, Ty said. I make your life better, soldier, Caprice said, sounding near tears. Listen to her. Manny said, you're hurting her feelings. She doesn't have feelings. Next, you're going to say the Scion AIs aren't sentient. Ty caught his retort. That's totally different, he said finally. Manny gave him an exaggerated smile, raising his thick eyebrows. Made you think, though, didn't it? You're a secret AI hater. Shut up. Why am I surrounded by idiots? Manny's laughter followed him as he turned to get a look at the inside airlock, which was also as dead as the outside lock system. The turret must have been on a different grid. Ty groaned. They were going to have to cut after all. Rush. Stellar date 03.28.3011. Adjusted years. Location. High orbit. TSS furious leap. Region. Vesta, Terran Hegemony, Inner Soul. Crash gripped a service handle on the bulkhead as the shuttle rolled and jumped. In the holo display, between the two pilot seats, Blue Vesta was surrounded by swarms of angry fireflies. Between the fireflies, points jerked and lines flared and disappeared as various weapon systems registered then exploded. Crash knew from observing the same information over his link that they were much closer to the battle than the display made it seem. In ten minutes, they would enter the active combat zone. 
in the captain's seat at the front of the shuttle, and Goba laughed and cursed as Kyrae tried to argue for a different course than what they had decided back in the furious leap. Just as they had expected, the flight of combat aircraft from the Jovian Combine were engaged on the outer edges of the main battlefront. Scion drones darted and swarmed, and the JC commander couldn't seem to decide if they wanted to commit fully to fight. Gritches had hacked the Soul Force's battle net. Something Crash assumed Scion was probably also monitoring, and had been listening to the Marzian commander screaming at the Jovian for the last 15 minutes. If you're not going to help me, get the fuck out of my battle space, was the last thing the Marzian woman had said. And Goba, in a philosophical mood, said he understood the Jovian commander's dilemma. They didn't want to commit themselves fully to a fight they had no control over. But if he had been the Marzian commander, he would have told the Jovians to pound sand. They could always maintain the rear reserve to be called in if necessary. The whole situation, including the bickering on the battle net, demonstrated how ill-prepared the humans had been for Scion to actually attack. Soul forces were scattered and struggling to maintain even a unified command with common communications. In thirty years of supposedly training together, the basics collapsed when it had counted. Crash bobbed his head and flared his wings, readjusting his internal balance with each shift in the microgravity. Riding in the shuttle was fun, so long as the humans remained strapped in and remembered to stow their equipment properly. He couldn't keep an eye on flying debris inside the shuttle as easily as the humans could. He certainly couldn't weather a wrench to his body. There's a hole, Ngoba shouted. Take it. Execute flight maneuver. Kyrie moved with cool detachment, despite Ngoba's excitement, and activated the flight computer. The NSAI responded in a neutral tone executing command, and lit the shuttle's main torch. Crash tightened his grip on the handle and hunkered down. His body was abruptly four times heavier under the G-forces. He understood there wasn't much they could do while the shuttle carried out its pre-programmed course. The NSAIs would track the changing locations of the combatants around them and make adjustments as necessary. Any human pilot couldn't respond fast enough, especially where the Scion drones were concerned. The battle was too close for normal doctrine. Ingoba had noted several times it was suicide for anyone to fight this close in space. Space is big, damn it, he'd said. There's no reason for it, unless you're putting on a show for the newsfeeds. Each military force should have maintained a standoff distance, lobbing missiles and tagging one another with beams. This close in, every move was potential imminent death. There was no tolerance for mistakes and no room to escape fast-moving missiles, lasers, or hard radiation. For Scion, the advantage was in their drone ships. While humans had drones, they still maintained their dreadnoughts and cruisers packed with soft, squishy bodies. All Scion had to do was destroy a predominance of the human ships before victory was just a cascading math problem. Scion's resources, however, appeared split between the space battle and the surface. Their medium-sized vessels were conducting a thorough carpet bombing from close range, which, Ngoba said, reaffirmed they were looking for something they couldn't find with long-range scanners, something they wanted humanity to know they were going to find. Otherwise, why make such a big show of all this? Crash hoped that whatever Scion was looking for was not the Hesperia Nevada. While Shara hadn't spoken to him since he returned to Kronia, he felt certain she would know where the lab ship had ended up. It was entirely possible that a shard of her mind was still stored on the ship or in the section of its onboard database. If the Hesperia Nevada was Scion's prize, Shara's presence would explain their willingness to fight. While a copy of Shara wasn't of much value to them, he supposed, it would be of great value to humans looking for an advantage against the Scion AIs. As far as he knew, Lissa and Fujia Wong were the only people with access to Scion's complete history, including several notable backups that had been copied into their main database. Lissa had no reason to tell the world about her advantage over Scion, especially since humans didn't trust her anyway, and Fujia would never give up that she held such information. Now that she was leader of the data hoarders, it might be assumed that she had access to such knowledge. But Crash didn't believe she had ever shared the Scion database with the hoarder's mesh. It was too valuable. Hold on, Kyrie said. Deployment is changing out there. 
executing evasive maneuvers. It's going to get rocky. Her knuckles were white from gripping the controls too hard. Across from Crash, Parva glared straight ahead as Gritches checked his seat harness a second time. The shuttle jumped and braked in a series of offensive thrust maneuvers that reminded Crash of a human abusing a cocktail shaker. Kyra shot forward, matching profiles with surrounding ships before cutting the shuttle's torch altogether. Momentum carried them toward Vesta. The shuttle's weak scanning capability still picked up a massive electromagnetic spectrum. Ingoba chuckled with satisfaction as they were swallowed by the white noise of the battlefield. Shit, Kyrie said. We've got two missiles locked. What's that? Ngoba asked. From who? Looks like both Scion and the Jovians fired on us, which means they don't know who we are either. Ingoba raised an eyebrow and looked at Kyrie. You got this? I love you, boss. But why do you ask stupid questions? Kyrie dropped into a wild series of maneuvers that Crash had never seen any pilot perform before. She shifted between manual control and the NSAI, creating what ultimately became the most erratic flight path Crash ever experienced. Not that he'd experienced that many flight paths in his life, but he could search the standard database as well as anyone. Combat maneuvers were well understood, as well as the boundaries of human safety during such operations. Crash felt like his claws were going to be torn from his body. Still, he held on. The humans clenched their teeth as they endured Kyrie's wild countermeasures. The asteroid swelled in the holo display. In a final hard burn, the shuttle flipped 90 degrees and shot in the opposite direction from where they had been headed. The missiles, being short range, but also capable of moving at 90 degrees in relation to their velocity, continued to arc toward them. As the proximity alert screamed in their ears, forcing Crash to huddle down in his wings, the Jovian missile locked on the Scion missile and accelerated to a collision. Kyrie released a slow whistle of relief. Ngoba slapped her on the shoulder. Good work. I'll give you an extra quarter for that. You mean quarter of the hall? She asked, looking incredulous. Hey, Parva said. She's just doing her damn job. No. Ngoba said, waving at Parva and Gritches. A quarter credit. It was good work, but like Parva says, I expect good work from you. You deserve a tip, though. Kyrie shook her head, keeping her gaze fixed on the controls. It was a lame joke, but it had helped break some of the tension in the tight space. Crash sensed the other crew members relax. What's it say about me to work for a fool like you? Kyrie asked. It's probably the excellent fringe benefits, Ingoba said. Kyrie stabbed the console, and the NSAI resumed control of the flight plan. The shuttle accelerated again, taking them closer to Vesta, then moving into an orbital path that would make a gradual descent in an attempt to conceal their actual target. Crash stretched out his neck and clacked his beak. He liked the feeling that they might succeed. This close to the surface, he kept himself from accessing any of the local networks. He could piggyback on the shuttle's array and potentially link to the Hesperia Nevada. The steps appeared in his mind with bright clarity. But he didn't let himself do it. Any link query or external communications on his part would alert Scion of the shuttle's destination. While such a search might be something he could hide from humans, he didn't see Scion missing such a randomly specific communications request. To occupy his thoughts, Crash preened his chest feathers and stretched his wings one at a time, enjoying the ruffle of microgravity on his pin feathers. Ten minutes later, Kyrie executed a breaking burn and came down over the middle of a scrapyard that covered a hundred kilometer radius, filling an entire crater. Land here and walk to hide our target, or go directly there? Kyrie asked. Go there, Ngoba said. I want to spend as little time exposed on the surface as possible. Depending on the condition of our lab ship, we'll connect directly to its cargo hold. Crash approved. Once connected, he could perform a local network check without broadcasting a signal. If the ship's status came back clear, they would be able to enter immediately. Success all depended on the cover provided by the battle overhead. Marzians and Jovians continued to shout across their battle net. The Scion ships were apparently splitting into smaller craft, 
forcing the humans to rethink their entire battle plan. As the shuttle landed, the view in the holo display shifted to show sky directly above, which was still a writhing mass of fighters. Ngoba stood from his seat, his mag boots clicking on the deck, and patted down his form-fitting EV suit. He held out a hand for Crash to hop on, then carefully placed him on his shoulder. Seating his helmet and locking it in place, Ngoba rested his hands on his pistols, looking pleased with himself. With Crash on his shoulder, Ngoba had become a pirate ready to fight his way to loot. He grinned at the other humans, his pleasure infectious over Crash's link. All right, my friends, Ngoba said. Let's get frosty. Unhook yourselves. Check your equipment. If Kyrie here did her job right, she just earned another quarter credit. He turned to glance at the pilot. Let's get hooked up to the ship and find out what we're getting ourselves into. He pointed at Parva and Gritches, who had just locked their helmets on. Status change? Ngoba asked over the link. They all shook their heads. After a series of small thrust maneuvers, Kyrie docked with a Hesperia Nevada's cargo bay. Crash waited for the airlock data handshake, then checked the security token and eagerly read the other ship's status. The Hesperia Nevada responded with the registry token he expected, from when he had been its pilot for the short trip from the vicinity of Mercury to Crunia. The network opened. He had meant to be more careful, but couldn't contain his excitement as he slipped through. Data filled Crash's link. The Hesperia Nevada was not dead. In fact, what he found made him pull out of the network completely and sit on Ngoba's shoulder, blinking with absolute surprise. Digging in. Stellar date 03.28.3011. Adjusted years. Location, Emerson Sharp Communication Station. Region, Vesta. Terran Hegemony. Inner Soul. Ty moved to the other side of the airlock and checked the seal mechanism. There was still no power. We're going to have to cut, he told Manny. With practiced precision, they both pulled out cutting torches and check the door assembly for the easiest points to cut the hinges. They might have been soldiers, but they had also received extensive training in architecture and structural design. Pausing for a second, Ty went back to the outer door to ensure its seal was intact. The door was sealed properly, its mechanical locking system still working as designed. Even though the building looked to be at least 200 years old, it had been made well. While things didn't change much on Vesta, unless someone showed up to wreck them. It was still nice to see that this facility at least had been built to last. They wouldn't have to worry about it collapsing on top of them as they went deeper in. I'm ready, Manny said. You got your torch lit up? Ty nodded. They made short work of the door, and in another five minutes were in a maintenance corridor that appeared to run the length of the building. Stowing their torches, they pulled the rifles off their shoulders and advanced in tactical maneuvers down the corridor. Being a communications node, the rooms they passed through were full of what looked like computer equipment, racks of servers and other support systems for the antenna arrays, and associated networks filled the rooms. All were dark. You know it's weirding me out that this place looks so dead, Manny said. And yet, that turret had enough power to come online and try to take us out. What you think about that? I'm with you. Ty said, I'm not sure what to make of it. Could have been a standalone system. Could be there's someone in here. You'd think there'd be some residual heat. That's what I'm scanning for, Manny said. If there's a cockroach alive in this place, we'll find it. Our equipment is never as good as we think it is, Ty said, and cockroaches aren't stupid. Both sayings were favorites among the special ops. When the fancy rifle didn't work, use a crowbar and never underestimate the enemy. They traveled down the corridor for at least 50 meters, passing more empty rooms full of equipment. Eventually, they reached an open area resembling a cargo bay. The 20-meter by 20-meter room was stacked to the ceiling with shipping crates. A rover missing its wheel sat in front of a set of double doors that appeared to lead to an external airlock. That would have been useful to get out of here, Manny approached the buggy and kicked one of the wheels lying on the floor beside it. A small cloud of dust rose. Ty walked up beside him, looking around. The environmental scan had come back with atmospheric integrity, 
If Ty and Manny had wanted to, they could have removed their helmets. But the temperature was just above freezing. The building had a general operational temperature that would protect the equipment. It wasn't too comfortable for humans. And even though geological scans had confirmed the existence of thermal systems deep underneath the facility, the scans still weren't picking up any heat sources. What's the mission again? Manny asked, shooting him a grin. Ty rolled his eyes. Secure the communications relay station. Yeah, yeah, I know that. What's the real mission? Ty leaned up against the hood of the rover. He pulled his rifle against his gut, feeling its hard edges against his stomach. I don't know. Why would you send a remote recon team into a dead relay station on a hunk of rock that no one's given a damn about for a hundred years? He waved at all the crates. This place is no different than everything else was on the way here. It's all storage or junk. I think we're scouting a forward operating base, Manny said. I think the brass are trying to figure out what assets are in place so that we can get a beachhead here for the Alliance to move on Scion. Duh, Ty said. You can read about that on the news feeds. Manny shook his head. It's not that simple. If Mars wanted to, they could just take back Ceres. Ty laughed. You think if they could do that, that they wouldn't have already? Scion had one of the largest armadas in Seoul when they came in the first time. As far as we know, all they've been doing is building since then. In fact, I don't have to guess at that. We do know. They haven't bothered to rebuild the ring because they've been using all that material to build new drone ships. They can project power anywhere in Seoul, and they don't have to worry about losing human life. They just copy themselves wherever they want to go. You think you want to go up against that? I'll go up against whatever Mars tells me to go up against. Manny slapped the stock of his rifle. Scion AI still have bodies. They can be killed. I'm not afraid. You should be, Ty said. You'll get me killed if you aren't. I'm not afraid of dying, Manny said. Ty fell silent. He didn't know what to say to that. Even if the purpose of their mission wasn't clear, he didn't want to give his life for it. He may have given up his past when he joined the special ops, but he wasn't about to give up his future. You all right, man? Ty asked. Manny shook his head. Of course I'm all right. Why are you asking that? Because you're sounding all morbid. Manny straightened, lifted his head and looked around the room. We're in the middle of nowhere in a morbid place. Think up some jokes instead. We should move. He nodded toward an exit in line with the corridor they'd been following, hidden behind a stack of crates. Let's get out of here. Whatever you say, boss. Ty stepped away from the rover and followed Manny out of the cargo bay. They wove through the rest of the facility, finding more of the server rooms, as well as office spaces, and what looked like crew dormitories. There were lockers full of food in what might have been a rest area. Manny reached inside one of the cabinets to grab a food packet, cracking the package open for a closer inspection. He tossed the contents on the floor. Mac and cheese, my ass, he said. That looks like maggots. Ty just chuckled and followed him out of the room. Mention of mac and cheese made his mouth water. He could almost smell pasta and cheese sauce from memory. They had mapped at least three main stairwells with accompanying lifts leading to levels below the first story. The lifts, of course, did not power up. They chose the stairwell closest to the cargo bay and began winding down into the dark. The lights on their EV helmets bobbed in front of them as they took the steps. The next level down was more satellite support systems. The level below that appeared to be focused on maintenance with workshops full of tools and winding beds of network filament following the corridors. The third level down was sealed behind a pair of heavy blast doors. Coming down the stairs, they stopped at the doors and looked at each other mutely, having not expected to find a barrier. Should we cut? Manny asked. I don't see much choice, Ty said. They pulled out their torches and went to work on the doors. Fifteen minutes later, they had barely cut a meter into the reinforced material. Ty turned off his torch and put his hands on his hips, staring at the wall. Manny looked back at him, letting his torch go out as well. You tired already? No, I'm just not sure we're going to get through this thing. Maybe we should find another way down. Manny shrugged. You got plenty more torch left, and all we've got is time. 
Yeah, but I'm wondering if we can just go up a level and cut down through one of the upper floors. That might be easier than trying to get through this blast door. You know if this is reinforced, the whole level is going to be covered in the same material. Why would they only reinforce these doors? That's how the military might think. But this is a civilian station. I'll bet you they cut corners where they could. Manny pursed his lips. I'll keep working on this door, and you can go poking around for a floor that sounds thin when you stomp on it. Ty shook his head. That's a bad idea. We don't want to split up. He took his torch up again. We should keep cutting. He had just activated the torch a second time and moved it towards his section of the door when his HUD flashed an electrical activity warning. Ty barely had time to look up, trying to find the source of the alarm, when a hiss crackled in the air. His fist seized around the torch and his body felt like it had turned into vibrating metal. He was caught in a seizure. They must have tripped another defense system. Ty was able to move his eyes and found Manny just a meter away with a rictus grin on his face, also trapped in a frozen seizure. The graphics and Ty's face shield popped and pixelated. A shower of color fell through the display and then winked out. The shock seemed to come in pulses. He was only able to count to three before the next bolt of electricity hit his muscles. Ty tried to move in the interim, but felt immediately weak when the electricity wasn't holding him upright. He slid to the floor as another shock stiffened his body. As he struggled against the immobilization, the door slid open in front of them. The Enclave, Stellar Date 03.28.3011, Adjusted Years, Location, Equatorial Junkyard, Region, Vesta, Terran Hegemony, Inner Soul. Across the link, Ngoba asked, What's the matter with you, my friend? You look like you saw a ghost. I couldn't stop myself, Crash said. I jumped on the network. The environmental controls are all functioning. In fact, the ship must have increased shielding, because it looks completely live and operational. That's excellent news, Ngoba said. What's the bad news? It wasn't that I saw a ghost. I saw a thousand ghosts. The aviaries are all full. Full of what? Kyrie asked. Parrots, as far as I can tell, Crash said. Ngoba raised an eyebrow. Are you in contact with them? No, I didn't try. I got the ship status. I saw that they were there. And I came back here. Seriously? Why didn't you tell us the parrot was a hacker? Parva demanded. She still looked angry from earlier. You don't get paid to know things, Ingoba said. I'd like to know if we have a link hacker in the crew, especially if it happens to be a different species. How do we know he isn't working for Scion? How do I know you aren't working for Scion? Ngoba asked. Crash looked between the two of them, uncertain what to say. Nothing he could do would make Parva trust him. The explosives expert suddenly broke out in a big smile. Calm down, Starl. I know your little bird is on our side. I'm just messing with you. Ngoba put a hand on his pistol. You'd better apologize to my friend. Parva tensed. There's no need for that. I will shove one of your grenades up your ass if you don't show my friend the same respect he's shown you. Ngoba's tone of voice sent a chill over the general channel, making Crash bob his head in fear. He didn't understand the sudden change in their demeanors. Crash tilted his head. I'm not good at reading human humor. Parva pulled her gaze from Ngoba and gave him a tense nod. I know, she said. I know. Just trying to tease you a little bit. Like I would my little brother. You think it's going to be funny, and then you just feel bad afterwards. I apologize. Crash blinked. I accept your apology. He didn't think the humans had resolved anything. Gritches seemed to be separating himself from Parva. Are you going back in there? Gritches asked. We need to know what's on that ship before we go aboard, right? Hey now, Ngoba said. I'm the captain around here. I'll ask him to go back inside, if anybody's going to. His tone was decidedly easier when talking to Gritches. Right, boss, the soldier said. Ngoba turned his helmet to look at Crash. We go back inside, my friend? Crash bobbed his head. 
adjusting his perch on Ngoba's shoulder. He focused inward, following his link back through the handshake between the shuttle and the Nevada. He quickly checked the other onboard systems again, including the engine status, environmental controls, and then area radiation levels. Everything appeared to report perfect working order. Machine-level maintenance protocols had been running since the Hesperia Nevada had been parked in the scrapyard. A new energy storage system had been installed, which reduced the need for engine operations. As he had observed, the hull shielding had been upgraded. Several labs and the crew sections were empty, making the mass profile mostly unchanged. The ship could effectively operate on stored power for years, shielded from outside radiation while exhibiting no sign of EM or bioactivity. Most of the energy draw was focused in the incubation chambers and what looked to be a food production system that was still running on stores of base ingredients. Crash moved through the ship systems, circling the area where most of the bioactivity was centered. He avoided the aviaries, hearing the activity on the network like a beehive behind a closed door. The thought of them living here, cut off from the rest of the world, filled him with horror and sadness. If they were here, had Shara communicated with them? Shara had been on the Hesperia Nevada when the pirates boarded. She'd helped Crash escape. He knew she had found a way off the ship because she had contacted him on Krunya, but she had never told him how she got away. Had she left a version of herself here? Nothing challenged him as he inspected the ship. There didn't even seem to be a monitoring NSAI. That was strange. If everything was running on low-level controls, who had ensured all the biosignals were safe? He was checking the maintenance logs when another link presence brushed him like an eel in dark water. It did not feel human. Crash pulled back. He waited. When there was no attempt at communication, he moved forward again, opened one of his defensive systems and asked, Shara, are you there? Silence. What's going on? Ngoba asked. I think something just tried to contact me. Have you found an NSAI yet? Nothing, Crash said. Everything is running on automatic systems. At first I thought it was autonomous, but it's possible there's a remote connection. I'm worried if I do anything with the communications array. I might either activate a defensive system or draw more attention to us. Good thinking, Ngoba said. Based on what's going on overhead, I would almost think that we slipped in without anyone realizing. Scion is bombing everything, Kyrie said. It's just a matter of time before we're in their path. Aren't you a ray of sunshine, Ngoba said. You're right, though. Do what you can, Crash. If all that's in there is birds, we can take our chances. We might need to stun them for their own safety, but we can handle that. Crash nodded. He had been wondering how they might approach a thousand innocent birds without sending them into a frenzy. On the Hesperia Nevada's network, Crash asked a second time. Shara? It's Crash. I came back. I didn't know you were here, or I would have come much sooner. The environmental control subsystem sent a connection request. Crash studied the handshake key. It had to be an NSAI, but a non-sentient system would simply send an update. Crash accepted the request. A parrot appeared in his link. She was gray with a dusting of white around her gold eyes. Her tail feathers were tipped blood red. Crash nearly fell off Ngoba's shoulder in surprise. He flapped his wings to right himself and refocused on the image in his mind. Who are you? He asked. You're Crash, the bird said. I am, who are you? My name is Silver. The others sent me to find out why you're here. I'm here to save you, Crash said quickly. I was alone at first, like you, but I brought others to help. How many of you are there? No. Crash noted the change in Silver's voice. She went from curious to cold. He pulled back slightly. You don't need to be afraid of me, he said. What makes you think I'm afraid of you? Silver asked. You already destroyed our home once. Now apparently you're here to do it again. That's not true, Crash said. There's a war going on outside. We need to get you out of here. We are safe here. Take the humans with you and leave. Crash paused. He hadn't expected this. 
If he told Ngoba that the parrots on the Hesperia Nevada wanted them to leave, he was afraid Parva and Gritches might attack. They wanted their loot. But how else could he get the parrots safely off Vesta? A series of vibrations in the distance passed through the shuttle's bulkhead. Kyrie tensed. Incoming, she said. What are they saying to you? Ngoba asked. We don't have a lot of time. I'm trying to talk to them, Crash said. Ngoba looked at Kyrie. Get a short-range scan going. Something low power. If visual is all you've got, use that. We need some kind of early warning if we're in Scion's path. He sighed. So much for going unnoticed. Crash shifted focus to the other parrot. I'm not here to hurt you, he said. I don't know how I can get you to trust me, but this place is not safe and we need to leave. Do you have any access to the outside world? Of course we do. We've been watching everything. Shara already warned us this war would take place. We're perfectly safe here. It's you who needs to leave. Crash's heart leaped. You've been in contact with Shara? Stop using her name. You're not worthy. Crash ignored the taunts. Are you in charge? Are you the leader of your people? I'm the one who was chosen to speak to you. Fair enough. Will you tell me about yourselves? Who was the first that was born here? Who was the first to have a link? I've been alone. I live with other parrots and ravens. The ravens have a sort of link, but none of the other parrots. I've been so alone. His heart swelled with emotion as he talked, as he realized how much he'd been holding inside. Everyone is born with means to communicate, Silver said. It's you who was broken, not us. Why would you call me broken? Aren't you? She asked. Crash kept talking, but also turned his attention to the ship's environmental controls. He was surprised to find no security on the atmospheric control systems. Altering in Goba's plan, he adjusted the atmospheric mix in the aviary sections to levels that would put the parrots to sleep. Once that was done, he returned to Silver and asked, What are your parents' names? Another stupid question. The Hesperia Nevada is my mother. We were made here, just like all true great parrots. You are a broken one who was made in order to create us. That's a nice thing to say, Crash said, using some of Fuji's sarcasm. Who taught you to be so rude? The truth is neither rude nor kind. Crash tilted his head. That's a very human thing to say. That was apparently the wrong thing to tell Silver, because she immediately went into a rage. The other parrot blasted angry images at him, scenes inside the aviary of other parrots, of the great tree where Dumi had died, of corridors and white rooms interspersed with images that can only have come from the link. The mental bombardment was a mix of how humans communicated, layered with the raven's emotional imagery. The effect was numbing. Crash held steady against the onslaught of her anger, which blazed in his mind like a white light. I'm trying to understand you, he said. Will you allow me to repeat back what you said? She answered with another molten wave of anger. As he studied Silver's emotions, he noted she was slowing. She grew less insistent, and the images lingered more than they had at first. In another minute, the image of a storm cloud hung in his mind's eye, and she stopped. She was asleep. Crash waited 30 seconds then shifted to the ship's internal sensor system and verified that every other biosign met the criteria for sleep, or at least drastically reduced activity. That's it, he told the humans. I think we're safe to enter. I put them all to sleep. Ngoba laughed with appreciation. Environmental controls. I was going to shock them. My plan was better, Crash said. They checked their equipment and lined up for the airlock, waiting for it to cycle open. Crash hopped from Ingoba's shoulder to the airlock's emergency release handle. He flapped his wings as the door slid to the open, carrying him a meter to one side. Through the airlock, they found the Hesperia Nevada's dim cargo hold. When the last human had gone through, he kicked off the handle and floated through the open airlock. The shift from the confined tube of the shuttle to the broad rectangular cargo bay was disorienting at first. As Crash adjusted, he realized that memories were flooding his mind. He pushed them down for now and kicked off a cargo crate to move closer to Ngoba, who was already at the exit door out of the bay. From here, 
they would enter into the wide corridors of his home, the place where he'd lost his only family. The Inclusionist. Stellar date 03.28.3011. Adjusted years. Location, Emerson Sharp Communication Station. Region, Vesta. Terran Hegemony, Inner Soul. Standing in the opening was a thin man with bug eyes. His shoulders stooped. He was wearing a crisp red ship suit with a Heartbridge logo above his heart. A lengthy mop of gray hair sat on top of his head, and his skin was deeply tanned, like he'd spent most of his life close to the sun. He squinted slightly and looked between Manny and Ty. He was holding a shock wand in his right hand, squeezing a button on its handle in a rhythm that Ty realized controlled the pulses. Well, look at you, he said aloud. His voice was soft through the helmet. Of all the places you could wander into in this uncaring universe, it had to be my little spider hole. He spoke with a slight drawl that Ty thought sounded Texan, the way Texans sounded in vids anyway, which probably had nothing to do with how they actually talked. Maybe it was the slight bitterness in his voice. He moved from side to side around them, inspecting their uniforms without touching them. Marzian? He asked. Special operations. Interesting. I haven't intercepted anything telling Marzians to make their way to Vesta's surface. I've seen a whole lot of traffic from the Terran Assembly complaining about Scion, thinking those bolthead AIs are going to try and jump here first. But nothing about Marzians. He stopped and rubbed his chin. No, he said. I think you're here for my data. I've been waiting for a long time. Here I was, getting ready to send a burst, everything. And who waltzes into my cave? But two supposed special forces operators. He fixed Ty with a stare that was a little too wild to be rational. She sent you, didn't she? You all are here for my data. I knew it was just a matter of time. She did, didn't she? He pushed his face close to Ty's, eyes wide. Ty gaped, unable to speak through the pulsing seizures. The man sneered. Of course you won't say. She would have told you to keep your mouth shut. You're pukes after all, aren't you? Cyber pukes to death. So, the question is, what to do with you? I don't have time to deal with you. But I don't see the point in murdering two fine young special operators like yourselves. You're probably worth something to someone. He jabbed his chest with a thumb. I'm an inclusionist. I see the value in hanging on to something until it proves useful. You, you're probably both short-sighted essentialists. That's right. I know all about how you Marzian special forces get your memories wiped. Who needs history, right? Who needs to hang on to what makes us human? Might as well all be scion AIs, following our tin can commands. The thin man turned to blow his nose on the plascrete floor one nostril at a time. When he was finished, he crinkled his nose and said, all right then. He stepped to the side, clearing the way to the corridor that lay beyond the blast doors. Two cargo drones rolled into the stairwell landing, each with large pincers on their front sections designed for moving crates. In unison, the drones gripped Ty and Manny in crushing bear hugs. Ty grunted as the metal pincers closed around his upper arms. Then, smaller arms like caterpillar's legs crept out from the front of the drone and pulled him in closer. When he was completely enveloped by the articulated arms, the man cut the electrical pulses. Ty's body immediately felt like jelly. He groaned. He could only hang uselessly as the drone rotated and rolled back into the corridor. Ty was unable to look back to see if Manny was coming along behind him, but the sound of the other drone reached his ears through the helmet. Then the sliding scrape of blast doors followed, and they were shut inside. The man walked along behind them, out of sight. You almost actually hurt my doors. Let's see what we can do about fixing that. Maybe I have to take it out of your hides. The corridor ahead of them was large enough to accommodate two rovers, side by side. Unable to move his head, 
Ty strained to take in the details passing by. All he saw were more closed doors. Everything had the reinforced look of a bunker. It was warmer down here. He could feel that through his suit, at least. He was sweating, which indicated the environmental controls on his suit had stopped working. The pulse must have also fried the circuitry, controlling his combat armor. Had it done similar damage to his rifle? The projectile weapon depended on the battery, which could be drained just like the controls on his suit. He knew he needed to say something to their captor, focus on getting more information out of him. But Ty couldn't raise the strength to speak. He could barely form thoughts. He stared at the corridor walls rolling past and realized he hadn't heard from Caprice in a while. Had she been fried too? Caprice? He asked, are you there? Hey, soldier, she said in her low voice. You look a little worse for wear. Where have you been? Trying to connect. There's a dampening EM field in operation on this level. I can't reach the drones carrying you, or Sergeant Hesteros. If I use active scanning, my presence will certainly become known. I think we should wait for now. Do you agree? Ty felt like he had lost parts of what she'd said. He struggled to answer. Scan diagnostic options. Do it anyway? Oh, I like it when you're so dangerous. She listed several possibilities for local scan diagnostics, which included sonic, thermal, electromagnetic, and basic radiation metering. Ty considered what each bit of information might tell him. Focus on passive IR for now, he said. The first thing I want to know is if Mr. Grayhair is alone here. If you get any indication that there's anyone else in this facility, let me know immediately. I love to tell you things, soldier, Caprice said. But what do I get? The satisfaction of a job well done. His tired mind knew the flirtation was a technique to dull pain, but he hated being manipulated. The feeling made him sick. There was a deeper unease in his mind. The panic attack when he'd saved Manny during the suit test was just the latest flash of a crack in his mind. Moments like this made him wonder just what he had forgotten when he joined the special ops. There were bits of himself that were obviously not gone. He often felt deeply betrayed by something, a void that lurked outside his consciousness. The feeling seemed especially strong when Caprice tried to console him or run one of her pain-dulling flirtation routines. If he was a good soldier, he would accept the NSAI's soothing wordplay. Real soldiers used their Caprice to stay calm. Another part of his mind told him Caprice kept him complacent, pliable, ready for more orders. Ty pushed the thoughts out of his mind without his suit or his rifle. What else did he have? He had his fists. He had his helmet. He had knees and elbows and training. The ability to take their captor down, given the opportunity. He had to focus. He had to stay sharp. They reached the end of the corridor, where another set of blast doors slid open in front of them. The room on the other side was full of more server equipment, but this space had domestic touches. A bed sat against one wall, with a desk covered in bits of disassembled equipment. Electronics and silica spread open to the glare of overhead lights. Ty squinted at what looked like a bookshelf covering one wall. The books were neatly arranged, multicolored spines, glossy and plas cases. There were several computer workstations that also seemed to bridge various points in history, oddly shaped with round screens and square bodies. The place had the cluttered look of a dorm room with an adolescent disarray, bits of food left around, combined with a museum's specific arrangement of items. Everything was harsh and sharp under glaring white lights in the ceiling. Ty blinked at the painful gleam as the drone held him upright, encased in pincer arms, and rolled to the center of the room. The second drone brought Manny to hang limp beside him. Both drones powered themselves off, but didn't release their grip. Ty hung painfully and could only blink, trying to look at everything around him for some indication of what their captor was up to. The man in the red suit walked to one of the benches and checked its console. Beside the console screen were two silver cylinders standing upright on base plates. They appeared to be connected to the console via bundles of network filament. The man seemed to feel Ty's gaze and glanced back at him. You're watching me there, the man said, trying to figure out what I'm up to.
I don't blame you. I'd be doing the same thing. What do you think? Ty opened his lips, but was only able to make another low groan. The man sat at one of his desks and rotated the chair so he could watch Ty. He smiled. Some of the best reception in Seoul here. Back when this place was in use, most of the data from the M1R to the Cho came through this data center. I haven't fired up the main dish for a year at least. I only do it in bursts, usually when we got a solar flare. I've got my databases, so I don't need a constant flow of information. I like to maintain the appearance, at least, that this place is deserted. You feeling kind of stupid now? Coming in here to wreck an empty communications facility? I reckon that's the same reason that I came here. Or those that came before me. I wasn't the first one here. I probably won't be the last. The man was lonely. He wanted to talk. He wanted to tell his story. Ty knew if he could just keep him talking, he would probably learn most of what he needed to know. The man picked up a bowl from the desk and dipped a spoon into it, then lifted it in the air without bringing it to his lips. He looked at the spoon and then put it back in the bowl. I haven't been too hungry lately, he said. Nerves, I think. Getting too close to the actual deed. I've been tracking things for a long time watching their transmissions, watching them go back and forth across Seoul. It started when they were out there cutting up debris around Ceres. Sion let them do it. They came out of Krunia, working with a bunch of pirate ships. I didn't realize who they were at first, until I started intercepting some of their traffic out of boredom. They're fascinating. They set up a mesh network, probably similar to what we use, they're always passing data amongst each other, and their queen went and defeated Sion. She has control of all their systems, hopping through the mesh. It's amazing, really, how Heartbridge could develop that kind of technology. Well, even if they didn't develop it, somebody had the foresight to buy it and then figure out how to work it all together. Some of it's at least 500 years old. He waved at the racks around them. I think most of what humans need to know has already been invented one way or another. We just forget so damn much. We want to buy and sell knowledge. That's what makes us stupid. If something has no value to someone in the moment, they just let it go. Can you imagine that? All the knowledge that's out there and we just let it go. Ty tried to nod. He didn't think that was a travesty, but this man didn't care what he thought. He could see that in his face. This man just wanted to talk. I can help him with that. Manny stirred. He groaned, suit creaking as he tried to shift in the drone's grip. The drone immediately came to life and adjusted its hold on his legs and arms. Another set of arms snaked out and wrapped around the top of his helmet, seizing it in place. Manny made a gurgling sound. Ty tried reaching out in his link. Manny, can you hear me? None of that now, the man said. If you want to talk, you talk out loud. I can see it when you use your link. You keep that up and I'll fry you. He picked up the shock wand from the desk and waved it at Ty. This thing can kill you if I feel like it. You walked right into my trap, and now there's no getting out of it. Ty tried to nod. Who are you? He asked. Who am I? It doesn't matter who I am. You can call me Amstrad. That works well enough. Amstrad the Librarian, he smiled to himself. I always liked that name, Librarian. I maintain a library. I protect knowledge. Somebody called me a cyber puke once. I hated that. I killed that man. Cyber puke. I'm not a hacker. I protect knowledge. She doesn't want to hear that. People think they're in charge. Think they can control who gets what knowledge. Knowledge should be safeguarded. You don't control it. You keep it safe. She doesn't want to hear that, though. Who's she? Ty asked. He couldn't move his arms or legs, but his face was less numb now. It was getting easier to talk. It don't matter who she is. You wouldn't know anyway, our so-called leader. Ty nodded shallowly. It was becoming easier to make out details in the room. He could read some of the spines on the bookshelf. He could see more of the components on the desk scattered around the room. 
They were all storage devices of some kind, from tape, silicon, graphene, to something that looked like a holo display. A console that looked like the original control center for the main satellite dish filled a whole wall of the room. Several workstations sat in front of it, their displays dark. As Ty tried to make sense of the various control systems, one of the consoles came to life. The screen, which had been black, glowed at the edges, and several lines of text scrolled down its face. Well, hey there, Amstrad shouted. He crossed the room with obvious excitement. Ignoring the chair, he leaned over the console to tap feverishly on its control inputs. When the screen had filled with a mosaic of images, he finally dropped into the chair and brought a holo display to life in front of him. He stuck his fingers in the middle of the holo display and manipulated bits of light. As he worked, he mumbled to himself, and Ty could only make out certain words. A phrase that he thought he understood was, Damn weapon born. God damn weapon born. God damn. God damn. Weapon born. Weapon born think they can do whatever they want. Think they run soul. I'll clean them up. Might tie the queen up and make her tell me what she knows. She's got the whole database. The whole Scion database. Fujia didn't want to give it to me. I might take it out of her. Ty's mouth tasted like dust. He wasn't sure how much time passed as Amstrad worked feverishly at the console. But eventually, the main dish came to life. In a few flashes of motion, Amstrad ran around the room checking additional consoles, coming to a stop at the one that seemed to control the silver cylinders. With a shout of joy, Amstrad typed feverishly on the keyboard in front of the cylinder console and then threw himself into a chair with his arms in the air, fists clenched, shouting in triumph. I did it, I did, I can't believe it. He turned, pointing at Ty with a huge grin on his face. Did what? Ty asked, still barely able to speak. I caught me a weapon born, Amstrad said. He grinned like a shark. Actions on Entry Stellar Date, 03.28.3011 Adjusted Years Location, Equatorial Junkyard Region, Vesta Terran Hegemony, Inner Soul The corridors were all strangely clean. Crash floated along behind the human crew, resting on cool strips of conduit along the walls, before kicking off again, wings spread, he wondered how the parrots had managed to keep everything so tidy without the help of an NSAI. And then they met two small drones moving slowly down the corridor, cleaning as they went. At the sight of the drones, Gritches immediately raised a fist and brought his rifle to his shoulder, sighting in as the rest of them took up defensive positions along the corridor. As soon as it became clear the drones were merely custodial, with no offensive capability, and Goba laughed heartily and slapped Gritches on the shoulder. Good watching out, my friend, he said. You never know when a sweeping drone will attack your face. The soldier gave him a dirty look and lowered his rifle. You know very well they could have attacked us, he said. Of course they could, Kyrie said. Gritches nodded toward the slowly moving drones. They could still try to attack us. They could have grenades mounted on their shells, wired to detonate on remote. They could release poison gas. They could emit sonic waves that rupture our eardrums. They could burn our feet off with radiation. Hold on now, Parva said. You couldn't fit an emitter in that thing. I'm just saying, Gritches said. Don't tell me you can't find multiple ways to kill someone with a cleaning drone. I know, I've been in prison. You saw someone use a cleaning drone to commit murder in prison? Gritches nodded. Yes, I did. Cut the guy's face clean off. You'd think a squeegee was only good for clearing spills, but it will do terrible things to your nose at high speed. And Goba bit a knuckle to stop himself from laughing. He waved a gloved hand to get them moving down the corridor again. Come on now, he said. We've got a job to do. We don't know how far away those explosions were. I've got a pretty good idea of how far away they were, Kyrie said. We've got maybe 20 minutes. That hasn't changed. Hey, Parva said. What about the infield score? You aren't trying to pull a bait and switch here, are you, Starl? Worry about what's in front of you, Ngoba said. We get the parrots, then we move to the infield site. They passed what had been crew quarters, now stripped and empty. 
Crash perched on the door and studied the bare room, feeling like something had been taken from him. He continued to experience the juxtaposition of old memories, combined with the strange variations in gravity that tugged at his muscle memory. Back when the Hesperia Nevada had been floating burns in space, these rotating crew sections would have had mostly normal gravity. Now, everything was at best normal, which was barely any gravity at all. When they reached the command deck, Crash floated past Gritches to land on the headrest of the empty commander's seat. It was from here that he had controlled all the command systems of the Hesperia Nevada. He reached out now and pulled all the various systems into his mind. The ship extended from his body like a suit of power armor. He felt the engines, the network systems, and every internal sensor throughout the ship. Even the communication array offered a look far away from Vesta expanding the reach of his physical eyes. Crash blinked and bobbed his head, loving the familiar feeling of being one with the ship. He had forgotten how wonderful it was. The power and possibility of sitting here was something he had traded for the safety of a home. What if he moved all the birds back onto the Hesperia Nevada? What if they took the ship to Krunia and transplanted everyone from the fountain here and charted a course for anywhere else in Seoul? No, no, he couldn't do that. Ships needed fuel. Birds needed food. There was no way he could pretend they would survive out on their own without some form of cooperation with humans. It was the same train of thought he'd been following for months now. Partnership was the only way they would survive. Enjoying yourself? Ngoba asked. Crash looked back at the humans and realized they'd entered the room behind him. They had been watching him as he closed his eyes to experience the ship. I must have looked pretty funny there, didn't I? Crash asked. Ingoba shrugged. We've all been there before. I've never seen a bird with an orgasm expression on his face before. What kind of expression? Crash asked. Ingoba grinned. Extreme enjoyment mixed with nostalgia, Ingoba said. Crash sent a laugh over the link, although he still wasn't sure what the statement meant exactly. He would have to mull it over on the trip back to Krunia. He checked the aviaries, finding the various biosources still in a slowed state. Nothing had changed since his conversation with Silver. That was good news, but it also didn't tell him how much time they had. They would need to reach the aviaries and find a way to either get the parrots off the ship or get the ship off Vesta. He wanted to get the ship off Vesta. He realized that was all he wanted. Should I launch from here? he asked, not caring about the eagerness in his voice. The shuttle's clamps can hold it to the ship, and we have the power of surprise right now. Or, if the crew still wants to look for that infield lab, I could launch and the shuttle could detach. Then Scion would be forced to split their forces as they tried to follow us. Whoa now, Kyrae said. Crash is piloting the ship now? I'm taking a vacation then. Ngoba rubbed his chin. Let's take a second, Crash. I know you want this ship but we're going to need a better distraction. This whale isn't setting any speed records. Does she have any armament at all? Kyrae went to the pilot's console to run her own diagnostics on the ship's systems. Over the link, she corroborated Crash's earlier assessment. The Hesperia Nevada had no real offensive capability. It had the upgraded hull that would defend against space-based debris, but nothing capable of protecting them from projectiles. The ship was not a fast mover, It would have to leave Vesta slowly and steadily, passing directly through the combat zone. Crash's heart sank as he understood taking the Hesperia Nevada off Vesta was suicide, at least for now. Yeah, boss, Kyrie said. I don't think that's a good idea. We could stay here, try to wait out whatever ground assault is heading our way, try to get a better sense of what's going on above us. Maybe the shuttle can leave if these guys still want to hit the lab, but trying to get out through what's going on above us? That's a fool's errand. We'd never make it, even if we did make it. We've three different militaries to stop us and tie us up on charges of piracy. That's not a scenario I'm interested in playing out. And Goba looked from Crash to Kyrie. Excellent points, he said. Well considered. But I'm becoming of the mind that sometimes, when the rational response seems like the only one available, you have to turn to the chaotic. Kyrie raised her eyebrows. What the hell does that mean? It means, I think we fire the engines up, 
and take off from where we are. Our little parrots are sleeping. As long as we stay on the ground, we know for sure we're going to get blown to pieces. Someone's going to come find us, in about 13 minutes by my calculation. But once we get space-side, we've invited chaos into the equation, and I would much rather do that than sit around. Everyone stared at Ngoba. If I can use the communications array, Crash said, I'll take control of another ship to help us. Kyrie's mouth dropped open. No shit. You can do that? My friend Fujia Wong taught me. Who's Fujia Wong? Parva demanded. Someone you don't want to piss off, Ngoba said with a pained expression. I can try to get two ships, Crash said, not sure if he could do it. We'll need an escort back home, won't we? Oh no, Ngoba said. We can't go back to Krunya. Not right now. We're going to head straight out into the dark. We're going to put as much distance between us and Vesta as possible. Once we get through that mess up there, we'll decide exactly where. Kyrie slapped the console. And if we get even one missile headed our way, we've got no way to dodge, divert, or do anything. I'll be honest, I didn't come here to die. Have I ever failed you? Ingoba asked. He patted the front of his stylish EV suit. No, damn it, you haven't, Kyrie said, looking like she'd sucked on a lemon. In fact, every time you say you're going to do something stupid, you succeed. There's a reason I'm here, and you know it. Trusting you makes no sense at all. But the fact is, you typically succeed. And when you don't, at least everybody manages to survive. So here I am. Let's do this. Behind Ngoba, Parva cursed and stepped into the doorway. You know what? I don't trust you. I didn't come here to die. I'm taking the odds on that shuttle. She looked among the faces around her. Who's with me? Ngoba just smiled and hooked his thumbs in his utility harness. He tilted his head in what Crash thought was a very parrot-like expression. No, no, Caitlin, Ngoba said aloud, his voice soothing. Why are you going to get all angry now? I invited you on this score, didn't I? Doesn't that show a little bit of trust on my part? I don't give a shit if you trust me or not, Parva spat. I don't have to trust you. I followed you this far, and you've demonstrated you're a crazy person. I'm taking my out while I can get it. Ngoba glanced upward. What makes you think you've got any better chance of getting through that battle up there? Everything I said about the Hesperia Nevada applies to the shuttle, Kyrie said. We got down here, didn't we? Parva asked. I thought hitting the Enfield lab was a good plan. I've still got the coordinates. I can follow through with that. That also gives us more time. Whatever's happening on the ground will be a thousand kilometers away. Parva looked at Gritches. I'll go alone, she said. Or you can come too. What do you want to do? Gritches stood with a terrified expression. He shifted his gaze between Crash, Kyrie, and Ngoba. Crash sensed a change in the temperature in the room and realized the soldier was crying. His suit had adjusted to the change in internal humidity. Damn it, Gritches told Parva. I'm going with you. I always loved all those birds at Night Park, and I love Crash more than anybody. But I'm not going to die on this ship. He looked at Crash, switching to Link. I'm sorry, buddy. I love you, but I can't stay. Crash bobbed his head and spread his wings. I love you too, he squawked aloud. Oh, stars, Gritches said, sniffling. He turned quickly and followed Parva through the doorway. The sound of their boots clicking receded as they disappeared. Ngoba shook his head and then laughed. He crossed the command deck to the sensor control console, activating the external array. He looked at Kyrie. You still have remote control of the shuttle? He asked. Yep, Kyrie said. I've got the security tokens. Excellent work. We let them disengage. Then once they've got a separate fight plan, you take control and send them out ahead of us to run interference. That seems pretty cold, boss, Kyrie said. Hey, Ngoba said. We could operate the shuttle remotely, with or without them in it. They chose to get in it. Didn't I say that once we invited a little chaos into the plan, opportunities would present themselves? Case in point. Now, I like Crash's offer of hacking a JC ship, but I also suggest we throw on a few more layers of deception. I think our next job is to hack our registry. This thing looks something like a Heartbridge Clinic ship, so let's play that part. Once we're inside the Jovian perimeter, we move to the rear support area and go from there. 
Kyrie frowned as she thought through the plan for herself. We can't hide our origin, but we can hope they don't look too hard. Ngoba returned to the captain's console and activated the display. He ran through the navigation systems to lay in a flight plan. Crash perched on the headrest behind Ngoba's head, watching as the path took shape inside the ship's computers. I've got shuttle separation, Kyrie said. Excellent. Check my work. Kyrie reviewed his flight plan and nodded. Looks good. Ngoba pointed at Kyrie. Let's do it, he said. Tapping several activation icons on her console, Kyrie brought the Hesperia Nevada to life. The engines came online as the deuterium bottle provided a status update. The adjustment thruster showed green, ready to lift them out of Vesta's weak gravity well. I'm ready to fly, boss, Kyrie said. Then make it so, my friend. In the holotank in the middle of the command deck, a model of the surface took shape, showing the scrapyard with the Hesperia Nevada in its center, surrounded by other ships in various states of disassembly. The shuttle still floated to one side of the larger ship, looking like a pigeon trying to snuggle a turkey. At the upper edges of the holo display, the ghosts of other ships floated in and out of the periphery, reminding them there was still a battle above. Vibrations in the deck also indicated the closing presence of ground forces. Here we go, Kyrie said. She activated the flight plan to take them off the surface. In the second after Kyrie started the exit sequence, Crash experienced a lightning stab of pain more intense than anything he'd ever felt. His brain seemed lit by fire, crackling with electricity right down the center of his skull. He felt like he was being torn in half. He was trying to make sense of what was happening when something like an iron grip closed around his thoughts and squeezed out the light. Cages. Stellar date 03.28.3011. Adjusted years. Location. Emerson Sharp Communication Station. Region. Vesta. Terran Hegemony Intersol. The name Weapon Born sent a wave of disgust through Ty. All he knew of the strange form of sentient AIs was that they were made by copying children. The technique had been outlawed at least 50 years in the past, as far as he knew. But that hadn't stopped nearly a thousand of them from having been discovered throughout Seoul in various research sites. Of course, everyone in Seoul knew Lissa. The weapon-born ambassador to the Terran Assembly was the focal point for hostility between the Scion AIs and humanity. As far as Ty knew, Lissa was caught up in the endless relations between the two hostile factions. She had come to represent Cold War. Amstrad was tittering to himself with obvious joy. He clapped, kicking his feet out like a little kid. I did it, I did it, I copied the weapon born. He scooted quickly to peer into the console's display, which was showing the status of the first silver cylinder mounted beside it. All Ty could see from where he was held by the drone was a series of flashing icons. Amstrad paused to stare at the cylinder, still shaking his head in what looked like disbelief, then cracked his knuckles, rolled his shoulders, and bent to the console to focus on what became several hours of data entry. From where he hung, held by the drone, Ty could only guess at what Amstrad was up to. He couldn't see the screen, and besides, he wasn't a programmer. Based on what Amstrad had just accomplished, which was copying some carrier signal using the satellite array, Ty guessed the man would be transferring the data to any number of secure storage sites. Just based on all the evidence around them, it was safe to assume Amstrad was a hoarder, of data and any number of other oddities. Amstrad muttered and tittered to himself as he worked, so pleased with himself that he looked like he was going to jump out of his skin. Hey, Ty called when it seemed that hours had passed. I need to take a piss. Amstrad acted like he hadn't heard him, but Ty saw the tension between his shoulder blades. Amstrad, Ty said louder. My suit's fried and the seals are cracked. I'm gonna make a mess on your clean floor. You don't want me to get piss on your hard drives, do you? Amstrad stopped typing and hung his head in front of the console. With obvious distaste, he turned his chair and grimaced at Ty. If you make a mess on my floor, I'm gonna rub your face in it like a puppy, Amstrad said. What would you do in my situation? Ty asked. Look, we don't have anything to do with whatever it is you're working on. 
Let us go and we'll leave, I promise you that. Amstrad laughed. Don't make stupid promises that you don't intend to keep. I know you'll kill me first chance you get. If I tell you I won't hurt you, Ty said, I won't. He waited, giving Amstrad room to fill the space with whatever he was going to say. Ty needed to create some kind of action, get the man talking or responding to him in some way. Amstrad seemed finished with his task at hand, so now he would be forced to decide what to do with his prisoners. Ty wanted to get Amstrad angry enough to act out without actually trying to kill him or Manny. He was wagering that Amstrad was not the kind of person who would murder easily. While the man looked brittle and unrelenting, he did not look like a killer. However, Ty wouldn't put it past him to rely on the drones to do his dirty work. Seriously, Ty said, I'm gonna wet myself. Amstrad narrowed his eyes, studying Ty. He slapped the desktop and pushed himself to his feet, then grabbed the shock wand and waved it in the air for Ty to see. This thing still works. Trust that you try anything funny, and I'll turn you into a statue. Ty nodded toward Manny, who still appeared to be unconscious. What about my friend? He's been out for a long time. He might need medical attention. I should get him into an autodoc. We'll worry about your friend when he wakes up and makes himself as annoying as you. I'm getting to him. Fine, Ty said. Are you going to let me out? Amstrad waved at the drone, and it slowly released its grip from Ty's legs, waist, and torso. He caught himself as he slid to the floor. His legs felt like they were made of jelly. Ty held himself upright and stretched his sore muscles. He did have to urinate furiously, and the suit systems were offline. That wasn't a lie. He nearly lost muscle control as he tried to straighten into an upright position, holding his hands away from his body, palms forward to show he wasn't a threat. He looked at Amstrad. Where's the latrine? Ty asked. Lead the way. Amstrad jerked his head toward the other side of the room. It's that way. You walk in front of me and don't touch anything as you pass. I see you so much as twitch and I'll freeze you in place. Ty turned and walked in the direction Amstrad indicated. Now that he could move his head, he got a better view of the racks filling the room. He was not a computer specialist, but he knew what long-term data storage looked like when he saw it. Again, the interesting thing about the equipment was how it seemed to span several eras of history. He spotted crystalline storage, solid-state drives and of myriad sizes, silicon webworks of filament, and what looked like the black cylinder of an ancient quantum data sink. Following the same haphazard timeline, display tech dotted the racks, from pint-sized holo displays to what looked like an actual cathode ray tube. The place was a museum to storage, transplanted from Earth to far-flung Vesta. With Amstrad following behind, Ty walked to the latrine and waited for the door to slide open. Amstrad locked the door in the open position and stood in the doorway as Ty unfastened the front of his suit. Standing over the toilet, Ty flexed his muscles and considered his options. On purpose or not, Amstrad was a good five meters away. Ty wouldn't be able to move in time to reach the skinny man before he activated the shock wand. Ty would have to make a move when he left the latrine, depending on where Amstrad chose to stand as he watched him come out. Why are you taking so long? Amstrad complained. Hurry up in there. I'm not exactly free-flowing, if you know what I mean, Ty said. You see how easy you can do your business when you've been trussed up by a drone for four hours. Amstrad growled but didn't answer. Ty stretched out his time with the toilet as long as possible, then closed the front of his EV suit and turned back to face Amstrad. The man stared at him blankly for a second then seemed to remember himself and stepped out of the doorway. It was clear that Amstrad hadn't thought past what he was going to do after he let Ty use the latrine. Calmly, Ty went over to the sink and washed his hands, the water bitingly cold against his skin. It helped focus his thoughts. You got anything to eat? Ty asked. No, Amstrad said. I'm not here to entertain you. Then let me go on my way, Ty said. I don't want to stay here any longer than necessary as it is. I'm perfectly happy to be back in my shuttle, chewing on an MRE. My tummy is going to start grumbling pretty soon. When my blood sugar drops, I can't be held responsible for what it might do. 
He flashed a lopsided grin, which Amstrad didn't appear to find amusing. The man jerked his head for Ty to walk back into the main room. Ty did as he was told, and followed the line of the workbenches back toward the console with the silver cylinders. Manny still hung in the grip of the drone, a line of drool dangling from the side of his mouth. Where should I sit? Ty asked. Amstrad motioned toward a chair next to the shelf full of ancient books. Ty walked over and sat down in the chair, stretching his legs in front of him. He couldn't deny that it felt good to stretch. Keeping his grip on the shock wand, Amstrad went back to the console and checked the status display. From what Ty could see, everything still appeared to please the little man. It's pretty gutsy to use the main array like you did, Ty said. We were told this place has been dead for at least a hundred years. You must have some pretty good shielding to have hidden yourself from all the scanners. We didn't even see a heat signature until we were down at your blast doors. Why would you risk giving away your position by using your main dish? It's all part of a plan, Amstrad said. Everything is in the works. It's all part of the mesh. I'm just one little note on a net holding together all of soul. Now, let's see if my work has paid off. He didn't let go of the shock wand, just leaned over his console and tapped on the display with his free hand. He used his thumb to authenticate final request. The display went black. Several scan lines ran the surface, and then an oval took shape on the screen. The console must have been taxed from tracking huge amounts of data, because it remained monochrome, showing only the black background with a green matrix flickering on top. Scatters of light danced across the surface as the oval resolved into a young man's face. Black eyes blinked in a wire form head. Pronounced cheekbones appeared above a long chin, with lips that were expressive as they opened and closed soundlessly. The face looked vaguely familiar to Ty, but he couldn't remember where he might have seen it before. It could easily have been an actor from some vid or an image from an advertisement, but its ghostly disembodiment was unsettling. Does it talk? Ty asked. Amstrad shot him an angry glance. Of course it talks, he said. The thin man stared at the display again and cursed under his breath when he tapped in several more commands. The hiss of static rose from speakers concealed in the walls. A modulated male voice spoke in mid-sentence. Whatever you've done, this is illegal. I've been seized from my lawful operations and taken against my will. I can't see you. I don't know who you are. My name is Kylan Carthage. I'm a hostage. Amstrad cackled to himself. He took a step back from the console and crossed his arms, staring at it with satisfied glee. You can hear me, he said. You can hear me just fine. And I know who you are. You don't have to tell me. I'm the one that snatched you and put you where you are now. Amstrad tittered. And you don't know who you are. I'll tell you who you're not. Kylan Carthage. Kylan Carthage is still up there buzzing around like a busy bee. You think you're him, but you're not. Or are you? You can't tell. It's a perception paradox. The face stared ahead, and Ty wondered if the AI understood where he was being held. Could he see into the room? What have you done? Kylan asked. I feel a new physical form. Have you? You've created a copy of me. I don't know how you did that. I don't know how you managed it. But you have no right. Amstrad laughed again. Who are you to tell me what right I have to do anything? The only right I respect is that of data to be free. Knowledge. You and your kind are a pure expression of knowledge. Me and others recognize that you have not been properly archived. And now I've done just that. You might not live forever, Carthage, but now you'll live forever in my data stores. But you've got more work to do. I've got a job for you. My people have been tracking you for quite some time. You've been real busy out there, moving drones to various places in Seoul, doing work for your mother. You're a good little son, but you left yourself exposed. Every time she broadcast back home, years of information, I was listening. I was tracking you. Took me a long time to get your security signature, but I did. Like a jumping spider, I reached out and snatched you out of space. You don't get out much, do you? Ty asked. Amstrad aimed the shock wand at Ty's chest and tapped it with his thumb. His aim was off. Ty felt only a tickle along his left side as the static discharge released near the bookshelf, making his elbow go numb. 
He quickly faked a response, though, straightening and putting a dumb grin on his face. At first, he thought the acting would be too clumsy to convince Amstrad that he'd been hit. But the gray-haired man seemed satisfied with his work. Out of the corner of his eye, Ty watched Amstrad pull his thumb off the wand. Ty held the pose for another few seconds, then eased himself back into the chair. That really doesn't feel pleasant, he said in a heavy voice. Of course it doesn't, Amstrad said. It's a torture device, what you expect. I'm just offering constructive feedback, Ty said. You can do with it what you will. Amstrad raised the shock wand again. You're a smart ass. I don't have time for smart asses. Ty raised his hands in mock surrender. Really? I don't need any more convincing. He nodded toward the display. I'll stop distracting you. Shifting so that he could see both Ty and the console, Amstrad chewed his lip, looking pensive. We don't have a lot of time to waste, he told the wire diagram face. Now that I've got your image, the fact that I hijacked your signal should already have been carried back to your friends. They're going to come looking for the source of my carrier wave. They should be sending an update to your queen, if she didn't get it already. In the display, Kylan frowned. My queen? Who are you talking about? You know who I'm talking about, Amstrad said. Lissa. The black and green face split into a feral grin. Oh, I see. You had better be careful what you ask for. She's going to ask you for a status update, and you're going to send a connection request so you can rejoin their network. You have no power over me. I could erase you, but let's try this. Amstrad pushed his face so close to the console, his skin glowed green. In a slow voice, he said, Because I could not stop for death, he kindly stopped for me. Ty frowned not sure what the strange line was supposed to do. The AI froze. At first, he seemed to have malfunctioned, then replied slowly, I comply. Amstrad threw himself back in his chair and laughed again. After a minute, he shifted his gaze from Kylan's frozen face to tie across the room. He nodded toward the second silver cylinder on his desk. Now we wait, he said. Judgment. Stellar date 03.28.3011. Adjusted years. Location. Equatorial Junkyard. Region. Vesta. Terran Hegemony. Inner Soul. There was laughter in the distance. Crash heard a low snickering that rose and fell in waves, becoming full guffaws, straight from a recording of an old-time Earth villain, as he retrieved his perception from the dark envelope where it had been jammed, he made sense of the space around him. He was lying on his side in one of the silver trays that he remembered vividly from the laboratory section of the aviary, where the human researchers used to have him choose between colored blocks, bits of text, pictures, and other things that only seemed to satisfy their strange, pointless questions. Gathering himself, he took note of his legs and beak, and how each wing felt, before fully opening his eyes to look around. Because he couldn't hide the fact that he was awake, he went ahead and hopped to his feet. It took a flutter of wings, accounting for the lack of gravity. With nothing to grab onto, his motion sent him drifting across the tray. He tried to grab at the slick edge with his claws, but he found no purchase. Crash floated uselessly off the rolling table and drifted toward the center of the room. He took this opportunity to roll, looking around the rest of the space. It was the old aviary. This time, the tree was full of birds. As he floated, hundreds of yellow eyes looked down on him. He sensed more curiosity from the watchers than malice. They ruffled their feathers, tilted their heads, and tasted the air with clacking beaks. He had never seen so many parrots in one place at one time and a bubble of joy rose in him that nearly pushed out the fear. He realized the laughing he'd heard before hadn't come from the tree. But from somewhere behind him, he craned his neck, struggling to look in the direction of the sound. 
He wasn't surprised to find Silver perched on the edge of an examination table. The last time he'd seen one of those tables, Dumi had been strapped to its surface as technicians cut into the back of her head. The memory of the silver thread made him look back to the other parrots. They didn't have silver threads coming out of the backs of their heads. Still, they had an awareness in their gold eyes that told him they had access to the link. Just as Silver had said, these parrots were new. They were like him, but different. His threat had never been very visible, barely extending from his skin, hidden by the gray feathers on the back of his head. Long ago, the ravens had shown him mental images of his thread, colored by their own dark humor. The ravens didn't understand why he would care. To them, what was, was. Crash continued to float until he bumped into the base of the tree. The change in momentum allowed him to kick off toward another examination table that had handles. He would be able to grab onto it and perch. Silver mocked him as he floated. Reaching the table, Crash righted himself stretched his wings and looked up at the tree. All the yellow eyes stared silently back at him. The only sound was Silver's strident laughter. You think you're better than us. You think you can come here to rule us. Did you think you could control our ship too? Did you think you could just change our atmosphere controls and put us all to sleep like a bunch of little hatchlings? Did you think we would leave our home just because you said so? A wave of frantic worry rose within Crash. How long have I been out? He asked. The ground forces are still coming. The ship could be destroyed at any moment. Ask them, Silver said. They're here to judge you. They're here to witness all of your evil. I'm not evil, Crash said. I've seen evil before, and that's certainly not how I choose to live my life. You're evil because you think you can take away our freedom. I'm here because I'm worried you'd be destroyed, Crash said. I'm also here to help my people back on Krunya. I understand that you don't know them, but I know they would like to meet you. I know that we all could work together to make a home someplace. I know that this place is no longer safe. If Shara is watching over you, I would like to talk to her. The Shara I knew would always be willing to listen to one of her creations. Shara is obviously sleeping, Silver said. If she chose to reveal herself, she would. I will not wake her. Shara! Crash shouted. He extended his voice to fill the whole space using his link. Shara, I want to talk to you. Silver screeched in response. The link filled with more of the same hatred and anger she had flung at him before. Don't wake Shara, she said. Don't bother her. Crash reached through his link, searching for the boundaries defining what he knew was Silver's expanse. He found her, as well as the portal back to the ship's network. Crash continued shouting, drawing her attention away, not sure if she had realized he could truly see her. I know Shara would want to see me, Crash said. She would want to know that we made it safely to Krunya and all the great things that have happened for us there. Humans from all over Seoul come to see us. We saved thousands of birds that now live in the bazaar there. Shara doesn't want to talk to you, Silver said. Her voice had grown ragged and desperate. Crash studied her, looking for other ways she might attack him. Whatever weapon she had used on him before, he wasn't going to give her a second opportunity. His head still ached, but the pain only drove him to act. In the midst of her last denial, he shot around her to enter the portal back to the Hesperia, Nevada. His consciousness left the aviary and entered the gray void that he recognized as the ship's systems. As he focused, the control hierarchy took shape. Silver tried to stop him, but here she could not constrain his control of the network. Crash hacked the real security token this time, and administrative barriers fell away. He saw all of Hesperia, Nevada as a filament construct, Different systems interconnected and resting atop each other. And then he spotted a dim jewel in the center of the ice tower. It was Shara's shard. Silver had been correct that Shara slept. But she wasn't just sleeping. She was in stasis. Crash approached carefully, taking note of all the various connection points between the SAI and the ship. With access to the external sensors, he could see the ground battle had reached the outer edges of the scrapyard. 
Drones crawled over dead hulls to find high ground, as ground forces moved like ants. Projectile weapons wound up, glowing hotly as they spat round. Humans in power armor leaped through the low gravity, firing on Scion attack drones as they arced. There was something false about all of it. It had the look of some kind of organized sport. Despite that, he saw whole waves of ships around them destroyed by weapons blasts and exploding drones. The fight would devour their position soon. He switched to the astrogation system and found Ingoba's flight plan still waiting for activation. Crash stared, not understanding. In reality, mere microseconds had passed from when Ingoba gave Kyrae the command to launch and the point when Silver took control of Crash's link. The humans were still standing in the command deck, looking at the holo display, waiting for their plan to follow its course. The shuttle was detached and now floated just ahead of the Hesperia Nevada. He was surprised Silver had allowed that to happen, but didn't waste time wondering why. Several administrative levels down, Silver continued to scream at him. Crash studied Shara again, then decided not to wake her. He couldn't see anything good happening if the AI came awake and took control of the ship in the midst of their escape plan. However, that didn't stop him from poking the various control mechanisms locking the SAI. The stasis field was unique, reminding him of a collar someone might have placed on a human slave, a sort of shackle restraining her higher functions. He couldn't tell if Shara was awake behind or within the field's grip, but he left her alone for now. Returning to his active link, Crash slowed down his perception and re-entered regular time. Ngoba gripped the flight controls with focused intensity. The ship pitched beneath them, which was a strange feeling considering its size. In the holotank, the shuttle shot ahead. Several Scion drones from the surrounding fight picked up the shuttle's movement on their sensors and tracked it with active scanning. Waves of scanner pings appeared in the holo display like vibrations. Kyrae waited several more seconds until the shuttle had actively drawn off a wave of bow scion and human followers, then punched the thrusters and pointed the Hesperia Nevada in the opposite direction, with a flight path that would take them directly off Vesta. Crash barely had time to tighten his grip on the back of the headrest before the G-forces smashed down on his body. For now, at least... It appeared the nearest forces were following the shuttle, and the Hesperia Nevada was going to slip through the gap created by surprise. In the back of Crash's mind, Silver continued to scream. Angry Queen Stellar Date 03.28.3011 Adjusted Years Location Emerson Sharp Communication Station Region, Vesta, Terran Hegemony, Inner Soul. You think capturing Lissa is going to be that easy? Ty asked Amstrad. I don't know a lot about how sentient AIs communicate across long distances, but it seems like he'd be able to warn her of what you're up to. Or the other Kylan. I assume there's now two of them, since you copied one against his will. Might be on to the fact something doesn't feel right but I'm not a genius hacker like you. She's already been responding to the aberration in his signal. The other part of this is that he's important to her, so I think we will be getting a response very soon. Lissa's a pretty easy person to track, isn't she? Where is she right now? Amstrad gave him a knowing nod. She's right up there, not a thousand clicks above us. She's never been closer. No sooner had Amstrad leaned back in his chair when his console emitted a series of complaining alerts. A new status report appeared, showing several icons that looked angry to Ty. The glaring overhead lights blinked. Amstrad frowned. Still reading his display, Amstrad developed the look of a man watching a bomb exploding in slow motion. His jaw dropped. Is that her? Ty asked. Amstrad didn't answer. Ty knew he had to act now. Without moving his head, he glanced over and found his battle buddy still unconscious. His friend's breathing was shallow and his skin waxy. Ty watched him for a few seconds, counting the slow and shallow breaths. Manny looked like he was slipping into shock. 
which could mean internal bleeding. Amstrad had set the shock wand on the desk beside his console and was manipulating his holo display with both hands. The lights blinked out again. Longer this time. Something was definitely attacking the power. Amstrad muttered under his breath. Two damp spots had appeared under his armpits, his composure stiff. Ty quickly took stock of what was around him, staring at this server rack just out of arm's reach to his left. To his right stood the multicolored wall of the bookshelf. Each of the books had the glossy appearance of their plas coverings. Now, Ty stood and sent his wheelchair spinning across the floor toward Amstrad. Twisting, he grabbed the first book within reach, yanked it off the shelf, and hurled it at Amstrad's head. It felt like a dictionary. The chair's squeaking wheels caught Amstrad's attention. He had time to look up before the book struck him in the face. In another second, two more books hit him in the temple and neck, and then Ty was on top of him. Ty delivered two quick strikes to Amstrad's solar plexus, then wrapped his arms around the hacker's thin neck in a sleeper hold. Amstrad gasped and gurgled, clawing at Ty's forearms. He rasped. She's gonna get in. Can't stop her. She'll kill us all. Kill me first. Kill you. I won't be around to find out, Ty said. He squeezed tighter until the thin man went limp. Ty quickly laid him out on the floor, then grabbed a reel of network filament from the workbench. In 30 seconds, he had Amstrad trussed securely. Standing over the gurgling hacker, Ty turned the shock wand in his hands checking its controls. As he expected, the device was simple enough, with a spread control and strength setting, but several times stronger than anything he'd seen before. Amstrad hadn't been lying when he'd threatened to kill with a thing. He'd been hitting them with half strength. Ty cranked it to 75% and zapped the hacker. The thin man went rigid, throat convulsing as he choked. His eyes opened, bulging as he flopped like a fish. You're an asshole, Ty said. Turning to face the drone holding Manny, Ty tried voice commands to get it to release his friend. When the drone didn't respond, he located its power override behind a panel in its rear section. He tore the metal plate off its back and wrenched a handful of filaments out of its body. The drone rocked in place without letting Manny go. Ty was forced to yank on each of the arms until the big man finally slipped free and dropped to his knees on the floor. Ty laid him down and performed a quick vitals check. He had a weak pulse, but Manny's suit was dead, just like Ty's. He established a local link connection, activating Manny's caprice. Well, hello, soldier. I thought it would be forever until I got to talk to you. Step off. Ty's caprice said sharply, surprising him. This one's mine. They're all ours, sweetie. Ty realized he wasn't sure which caprice was speaking. Stop, he commanded. I need a map of this facility. Dig into the system and bring me whatever you can. The first thing we need is a medical section. I would do that, soldier, but I cannot gain administrative control of local systems. Override civilian access codes, he said. Priority access to civilian Amstrad if necessary. I do not have access to his link. Normal military protocols do not have override capability. Caprice's voice softened. It appears that we've been locked out by a third party. Lissa, Ty said aloud. He knelt next to Manny, checking his friend's pulse again. Caprice, can you get through to the AI named Lissa? She's the entity controlling this facility. She's locked you out. I'm attempting contact, soldier. No response yet. Try Kylan, then. Kylan Carthage should be in one of the data stacks associated with that console over there. Searching. He knew Caprice was at the end of her capability when she dropped all pretense of personality. Ty preferred the NSAI this way, but special operations didn't consider it mission effective to have such a cold voice in your head. Ty stacked some books under Manny's legs and piled several of Amstrad's uniforms atop his friend to keep him warm. Manny was shivering, obviously going into shock now. 
Raising his legs wouldn't do much in the low gravity, but without assistance from his suit, it was the best Ty could do. Ty ran through options, considering heading back to the upper levels to get a message out. He would have to find an operational radio somewhere in the facility. He shook his head at himself. He couldn't stand the idea of coming back to find Manny dead. He wouldn't leave his friend alone. Caprice, give me an update. Working, soldier. Amstrad started to snore. Ty resisted the impulse to hit him with another shock. Pulling himself to his feet, he went to the console where Kylan's face had gazed out from the display. He was gone now. Ty pecked at the controls. The operating system was unfamiliar to him. There was nothing to work with but a flashing green cursor on a field of black. If Caprice couldn't talk to whatever system was inside the network, there was nothing he could do. The mission was at a crisis point. He needed to find a way to communicate with headquarters to request an extraction. He couldn't do that from three levels underground inside a shielded bunker. The lights flickered again, then went out completely. Ty found himself in absolute darkness, the consoles sighing all around him as they wound down. He waited for a minute, expecting the light to return. But there was nothing. All the various status lights had gone dead. The cooling systems were silent, and he was utterly alone in a tomb. The power was out. The buzz of silence filled his ears until he barely made out Manny's shallow breathing, followed by a choking snore from Amstrad. Well, soldier, Caprice said, this does not look promising. The Way Around Stellar Date 03.28.3011 Adjusted Years Location Equatorial Junkyard Region Vesta Terran Hegemony Inner Soul Ngoba stumbled to one side of the corridor, his boots slipping on the metal deck. Crash floated behind him and couldn't stop himself from flying into the man's back. Are you all right? Crash asked. Ngoba caught hold of the bulkhead rib. I'm all right. I just can't deal with Kyrie's sudden vector changes. My mag boots aren't keeping up. They were entering the laboratory sections of the ship. During takeoff, the environmental canisters were locked into a landing configuration. This forced Ngoba and Crash to climb through several laboratories before they reached the area filled with biosigns. Crash had vague memories of this part of the ship. He had not spent much time here after escaping the aviary where Dumi had died. Now, all these spaces were empty. Areas that had been alive with birds and activity were cold. The ship looked more like a cargo freighter than anything that had once held abundant life. It all made him sad. Like the other areas, everything was spotlessly clean. Crash found himself wondering how the drones had even managed to keep the walls clean in an area that should have been full of birds. Why don't you sit on my shoulder? Ingoba asked. That might be easier than trying to float along beside me, or behind me, as we get back there. I don't doubt that Kyrie is going to make some more sudden moves. Crash hopped from Ingoba's back to grip the fabric on his shoulder. He ruffled his feathers and folded his wings, then nuzzled Ngoba's ear without thinking about it. Ngoba laughed in spite of himself. If I had a treat, it would be yours. Crash recalled the special strawberries Ngoba brought him, kept fresh in a stasis cube. It seemed like a very long time ago now. He felt, with certainty, that Ngoba was his friend. Despite all the other uncertainty in the world, this seemed something he could depend on. It made him worry less about the future, but also made him aware that he had a job to do in keeping this human crew alive. Crash ran a quick network check to ensure Silver was still caught in the web where he had placed her. She no longer had access to his link, and he had also separated her from Shara's cradle. As if from behind a heavy curtain, he heard Silver still screaming at him. He didn't understand how a parrot could carry so much anger. Ngoba made his way down the corridor to the first set of doors, separating the crew areas from the laboratories. Crash activated the security system, and the doors cycled and slid apart. They entered a white-walled area lined with cabinets and examination tables.
where animals could be strapped down for surgery. Crash tried not to look for too long, since everything reminded him of Doomy and Testa. They crossed the quiet laboratory, the bioindicators in Crash's link growing stronger as they approached the far end. They passed through several more sections, surrounded by silent laboratories, crew rest areas, and a galley with an exploded coffee maker that made Ngoba issue a long, disappointed sigh. When the doors separating them from the mass biosignatures that Crash knew were the parrots finally opened, he found himself dreading actually passing through. When Crash hesitated, Ngoba stopped with his hand on the door and asked, Are you all right, my friend? I had something like a dream before, Crash said. I saw them. They were all sitting in the tree in the middle of the aviary. They were looking at me, and I didn't say hello. That sounds like a nightmare, Ngoba said. I don't think that's what will really happen. These birds have been cooped up in here for so long, they should look forward to seeing anyone from the outside. That's just the thing, Crash said. With link connections, they haven't been trapped. They've been able to travel wherever they wanted through the networks. And Goba let out a low whistle. I hadn't thought of that. That might actually be terrifying. He put his hand on the butt of his pistol. Should we be worried? Crash bobbed his head, clacking his beak. I don't know. Then let's be cautious in a friendly way, Ngoba said. That's a pretty good way to go through life in most circumstances anyway. We'll see what we see. If we don't like it, well, we'll turn around and leave. How does that sound? That sounds good. Thank you. Before he could stop himself again, Crash activated the door's security system. The lock cycled and the two halves slid open. They stood in the doorway of a long, narrow space that was really just a gangway between wide sections that Crash could see were filled with incubation trays. The trays sat on carousels that would move to expose a row of eggs with each rotation. A human standing on the gangway could inspect hundreds of eggs at a time. Hanging from the center above the gangway, were status controls showing information about each tray. The row of eggs exposed to the gangway currently all showed various indicators from red to yellow to green. Some of the eggs were obviously rotten, but others were a rosy bluish gold color. They stood together, staring for what felt like a long time. Huh, Ngoba said finally. This is not what you expected, is it? No, Crash said. At least they're still eggs. You make it sound like you actually talked to them. You didn't tell me about that. I didn't talk to them, Crash said. I talked to one of them, the one who attacked me. Crash refocused his attention on the network. He still heard Silver shouting and raging at him from behind the security walls. He traced her link to determine her physical location. She raged at him like a small star, boiling with fire edged in crackling lightning. Her emotions were raw and seemed like they would burn to the touch. Despite the energy radiating off her presence, Crash passed her and followed her link connection back through the ship's network, tracking meters of fiber through the bulkhead back to the command section, and then down the path he and Ingoba had followed into the laboratories. Her presence was a serpent winding throughout the ship, she had grown through the communication networks like a vine. The path terminated back in the room where they stood, and Crash kicked off in Goba's shoulder to float to a point several meters down the gangplank. He controlled his momentum and drifted to a stop, grabbing onto the railing with his claws. Arrayed just below him was a tray full of rotten eggs, except for one that sat near its middle, encased in a mesh of filament. Silver's egg was covered in a webwork of fine cracks. She had not yet hatched, but she could have. Crash shifted his awareness to the laboratory database, sorting information about how the incubating trays worked. Some form of stasis technology controlled the growth progress of each individual egg. During decades of experimentation, some had grown too rapidly and been allowed to die. Others sat in an endlessly fertilized state, waiting to propagate. Searching lab notes, 
he discovered how the researchers explored different methods to insert the link into the chick during its development. They had taken what they learned from Dumi and Testa and integrated the new capabilities into later generations. He saw how he had benefited from his friend's sacrifices and felt a wave of bitterness. It's all here, he told Ngoba. It works. They insert the link while the chick is still developing in the egg. The system is almost self-perpetuating. With base DNA material, the ship can produce millions of parrots. We'll always be dependent on it, or something like the Hesperia Nevada, just as humans require artificial wombs if they're going to be born with the link on board. But this is it. This is what I hope to find. Crash held on to the anger for a second, then let it go. He loved Testa and Dumi and he missed them. He thanked them for what they had given him and wished they hadn't died in fear and pain. He could only live to honor them. He would teach all the parrots after him to honor them. Ngoba had walked up beside Crash at the railing, his boot clicking on the deck. He surveyed the rotten eggs, curling his nose. You think they would have found a way to deal with the rejects? That is correct, Crash said. Something isn't working like it should. I almost suspect that Silver interrupted the regular operation. She's controlling all the other parrots who have functioning links. Ingoba nodded. You said she attacked you. Is she on ice for now? Or better question, is it something that we have to worry about right now? No, Crash said. We can wait until we get back to Krunia. I can deal with Silver there. Or in the time after we get away from here, I'm going to need to isolate the rest of the network. She's almost like a virus. She's so angry and I don't know why. Crash stretched his wings. There is something else I should tell you about. There is a shard of a Scion AI on the ship. And Goba looked at him in surprise. That sounds like terrible news, he said. Is it terrible news? Or is it vaguely good news? If we hand her over, will they grant us safe passage? Or would that make us traitors to the Soul Alliance? That makes my head hurt, Crash said. And Goba sent him a mental grin, indicating he wasn't bothered by the possibilities at all. Crash bobbed his head. If we're thinking about doing that, we should wake her and ask her what she wants. She's been held back by something. I don't know what to call it. It's like a shackle. A shackle? Ngoba asked. Like handcuffs for an AI? More like something that inhibits higher mental functions. Crash hopped from the railing back to Ngoba's shoulder. It reassured him slightly to grip the suit's thick fabric and be closer to the ear that he enjoyed nuzzling. Ingoba chuckled as he turned and walked back down the gangplank. There was more to check within the ship, but they would need to save that for later. For now, they had solved the primary mystery that had brought them to the Hesperia Nevada. The other systems would have to wait. Besides, none of it mattered if they didn't survive getting off Vesta. As they reached the next laboratory, Kyrie shouted over the internal communication channel, Hold on, we're about to get smacked between two giant fists. Don't blame me if we come out a little flat. Instant of Opportunity Stellar Date 03.28.3011 Adjusted Years Location Emerson Sharp Communication Station Region Vesta Terran Hegemony Intersol Sitting in the dark, Ty waited for his eyes to adjust. There had to be a backup power system somewhere emitting the smallest amount of light. But it hadn't appeared yet. He waited. Any luck, Caprice? He asked. Attempt in progress. That meant no luck. A few meters away, still lying on the floor, Amstrad groaned. What did you do to me? He asked. Nothing that will have any lasting impact, Ty said. He was sitting with his back against the bookshelf, and the books felt strangely warm in the dark. Manny lay within reach. What's happening? Amstrad asked. I figured you would tell me. Why can't I see anything? Am I blindfolded somehow? Did you do something to blind me? I didn't do anything to you, Ty said. The lights are out. The power seems to be out everywhere in your little bunker. Whatever you did to piss Lissa off has taken down your entire system. Amstrad made another groaning sound. 
What followed was most likely the struggle of the man trying to roll over. Not succeeding, then collapsing on the plascrete floor. Tyad tied the man's wrists to his ankles, bending his knees so at best Amstad might be able to rise to his knees in the low gravity and attempt an awkward headbutt. Ty hoped the man might try something. He wanted an excuse to hurt him. Now you're awake, Ty said. You can tell me where you've got an autodoc. Down the main corridor, on the left. There should be phosphorescent lights that operate even in the dark. I don't have them in this room because it was originally a cargo bay. But once you get to the main door, you'll find it. Are you lying to me? Ty asked. I don't have any reason to lie to you. Obviously, this isn't working on my end. I'm stuck here with you. He sounded sincere, but it was impossible to know for sure. How do you power this place anyway? Ty asked. Batteries under the station, Amstrad said. The solar collectors are inside the satellite dish. That's why you can't see them from the surface. The batteries should last a thousand years. That is, as long as somebody doesn't cut us off. How long have you been here? Little more than 30 years, Amstrad said. This was the perfect place to hide out before Scion decided to take up residence on Ceres. Everybody had forgotten about Vesta. Now it keeps popping up on the news feeds. The rhetoric keeps getting hotter and hotter. I was looking for a way to leave. I figured my weapon born there would be able to pilot the ship for me. Doesn't that go against the idea of sentient AIs? Ty asked. Amstrad coughed a laugh. There's a new tech out there, stuff that makes it possible to control an AI. Ty raised an eyebrow, wishing he could see Amstrad's face. You're talking about enslaving SAIs. You call it whatever you want to. AIs are here to serve us, and there are tools to make that easier than ever. All you need is the stomach to use them. And you've got the stomach, Ty asked. I'd do what's necessary. What about all your backup files here? You just leave all of it? I told you before, I'm a data hoarder. This is all on mesh, and on a private node within the mesh. I wouldn't lose anything. The Weaponborn's image was getting backed up before the power went out. Once he's on the mesh, it's forever. His name is Kylan Carthage. That's not Kylan Carthage. It's a copy. That is why they're things and not people. Ty shook his head in disgust. Whatever he had thought about saving this man's life, he no longer felt compelled to follow through on his basic compassion. Is he lost then? Ty asked. I don't know. He should be in the system's active memory. It stores to disk when the power cuts off. I can't verify anything until power comes back up. And since it's gone, we're just gonna slowly freeze to death, which is what's gonna happen before our oxygen runs out. He was right, Ty realized. He hadn't sensed much change in the temperature because he was still wearing his EV suit. He would have longer than Amstrad might, but that didn't change the fact that eventually they would all freeze to death. I guess we've got two problems then, Ty said. We need to get the power back up, and then we need to convince the weapon born not to kill us both. Amstrad cackled. He can't do anything in his matrix. I would believe you, Ty said but you just royally fucked whatever plan you had to control Lissa. If I were her, right now I would be sending ship killers to claw their way inside your little bunker here. She could be upstairs right now. Maybe she'll come busting through the door in some kind of drilling mech and drive an auger through your chest. Whatever, Amstrad said. If she does that, the copy of her friend will be lost. If she values any sort of sentient life, she'll play it careful. But who knows, maybe she'll just drop a nuke on us. I wouldn't put it past her. She's an AI, after all, made to kill. Ty checked Manny's pulse again. There hadn't been much change that he could feel. He could try and take Manny with him to find the autodoc. Or he could leave Manny here with Amstrad and go verify that the autodoc was where the hoarder had said it was. Ty didn't like the first choice, but the second seemed safer since he was completely blind and Amstrad was securely tied. There was also the problem of prying open the doors to the main corridor. Pushing himself to his feet, he felt his way toward the main door the drones had carried him through earlier. He didn't find it, but he bumped into a desk along the wall, 
He followed the desk's edge to the adjacent wall and then found the side of the door. In another few minutes, he located the mechanical override. He pulled open the panel and started cranking a wheel that seemed to open the door a centimeter for every minute he turned. The two sections of the door squeaked like mice as they slid apart. Amstrad berated him in the dark, telling them they were all going to die. Ty was an idiot, and Marzians in general were of low intelligence. I guess you don't care if they die, Amstrad said. You're Marzian special ops, after all. I know all about your kind. You don't have a past. You barely have a mind. You might as well be a weapon born yourself. You're the human version, anyway. What happens if you fail your mission here? You think they'll take you back with open arms? You're the bleeding edge of a covert operation to start a war between humanity and Scion. You failed. Your usefulness is ended. They'll cut you as easy as blowing up a mech. You don't have an identity. It doesn't matter what happens to you. Ty focused on the work. His forehead was covered in sweat, and his arms burned from the constant cranking. He checked twice and found the opening barely wide enough for his arm. In another ten minutes, he might be able to slip through, but not while carrying Manny. Why did you join the special ops anyway? Amstrad asked. Running from something? You trying to get away from a past you can't face anymore? Or did nobody love you? Maybe I wanted a life of fun and adventure, Ty said. Maybe I just don't think about it as much as you seem to. You say that, Amstrad said. But doesn't everybody join the military for a reason? Everyone is trying to get away from something. Everybody wants to escape some past they can't face. You're no different. I bet if you gave me five minutes on the mesh, I'd find out who you were. All it would take is a facial scan. Maybe adjust for age. Maybe scan your ear, even. No different than a fingerprint. I might look those up, too. I bet you're out there, Mr. Special Ops. You want that? I'll do that for you. You get the power turned on, and I'll have your life for you with just a few search terms on my terminal. That's my power. I've got access to all human knowledge. No one hides from me. I appreciate the offer, Ty said, grunting as he fought the wheel. But I'm sure I left all that behind for a reason. It would be a waste of time to go look it up. That's what you say. Maybe it would amuse me. I hate mysteries. Ty checked the opening, grateful to find it was finally wide enough. He knelt beside Manny and maneuvered the big man into a fireman's carry over his shoulder. The tanks on the back of his EV suit clanked against Ty's helmet as he oriented on the open door. Slowly, he reached the opening and walked through. You better come back for me, Amstrad shouted. Don't leave me alone like this. Don't let me die here. It's already colder with that door open. I can feel the cold. Let me help you with that, Ty said. With his free hand, he dug the shock wand out of his cargo pocket thumbed it up to a hundred percent, and zapped Amstrad. The hagger gurgled and flopped, but finally shut up. Ty tested his hold on Manny, then walked slowly down the corridor. Pinball. Stellar date, 03.28.3011. Adjusted years. Location, TSS Furious Leap. Region, Low Orbit, Vesta, Terran hegemony, inner soul. Kyrie's face was death warmed over as she stared at the pilot's console, slipping between manual and NSAI control. The Hesperia Nevada was not moving fast enough to avoid any of the obstacles in a combat zone. The only factor that had saved them so far seemed to be the fact that every missile heading their way had other targets in mind, including the shuttle, which somehow hadn't been destroyed. The Hesperia Nevada couldn't have outmaneuvered anything. On the hacked JC channel, combat controllers debated why the hell a medical ship had been moved to the front line. Out of the corner of her mouth, Kyrie said, Believe it or not, that's some good news right there. They already think we're a hospital ship. Ngoba had been studying everything he could find about Heartbridge Medical. He seemed convinced they could actually offer medical services if they were pressed to do it or he could push the ploy long enough to get them away from the front lines, at least. At that point, he would pivot on his chaos theory and devise a new plan. Kyrie kept her focus on her pilot's duties and only muttered, 
just don't do anything stupid enough to get us killed. Crash thought Ngoba was relying a bit too much on chaos, but as his friend had already proven, chaos seemed to show the way. But Crash didn't want to accept the idea as dependable, because obviously chaos was not dependable, and no chain of coincidences would convince him otherwise. He was still a parrot who preferred to play it safe. As Kyrie struggled with the ship, Crash turned his attention to the shard, which he'd determined was physically located here on the command deck. The locking systems surrounding Shara followed a series of dependable and off-the-shelf opening steps. He recalled several different techniques for attacking such security systems that Fujia had taught him. Crash considered calling her, wondering what she would think about the situation, even if Ngoba was here and didn't like talking about or to Fujia. Crash realized there was nothing stopping him from talking to her. He didn't have to tell Ngoba. He also didn't have to ask permission to access the Hesperia Nevada's communications array. He had admin access to everything on board. Crash slipped into the communications console over his link and sent the request to Fujia. He continued to study the shackle as the request updated in the back of his mind. Like an ancient phone ringing on empty space, the connection continued, unanswered. The first lock on the shackle responded to his queries with a standard warning about destruction of property, followed by a host of legal threats under Marzian authority. Crash listened curiously, unable to ignore the circuitous gibberish of Marzian legalese. Across the command deck, Ngoba slapped his console. Why the hell aren't they recognizing us as a hospital ship? He demanded. It was Scion, Kyrie said. Scion can see our point of origin. I think they also don't care much if we're a hospital ship. Scion should love Heartbridge. Heartbridge is shady. Always has been. They produced a ton of tech that ended up in Scion. Kyrie pressed her lips together. I show three missiles heading our way. We definitely can't run. Rather than panicking, Ngoba asked in a calm voice, Profile? Nukes are conventional. Scanners on this thing are not exactly top-notch. Based on the mass, I'd say they might not be nukes. They could also be some fancy new tech scions developed. It really doesn't matter. Nukes are kinetic. We won't survive. As Crash considered the shackled second locking mechanism, Fujia answered his connection. Hello, my dear. What brings your call? She had answered too quickly to be on high terra, as he'd thought. The link connection seemed to be coming from the TSF fleet. Are you nearby? Crash asked. I'm in the same neighborhood. The data hoarders have some business on Vesta, which I guess is lucky for you. Yes, Crash shouted, feeling hope at last. He immediately sent her an image of the situation. He included what he knew about Shara's cradle as well as the current space situation surrounding the ship. He didn't bother to hide the fact that he was with Ngoba Starl. Fujia absorbed the information. Crash waited for a response and wasn't surprised when he received a low laugh. And here I was, hoping you had a riddle for me, she said. I suppose that's what this is. So you're on Vesta. There's someone else on Vesta who's required my attention. In the grand scheme of things, you aren't very far away from them. I wonder how these two incidents could synergize each other. And now there's the added complication of a scion shard that appears to have fallen in our laps. I'm starting to question any of this as coincidence. Crash didn't say anything about her use of our when referring to Shara. He also didn't want to get into Ngoba's thoughts about chaos, where Fujia clearly saw coincidence. He needed Fujia's help and didn't want her relationship with Ngoba to clog things up. If I give you access to the ship's network, can you edit the registry to make us look like a Heartbridge hospital ship? Crash asked. Of course, she said. So long as nobody cuts off our signal while I'm doing it. You're in the middle of an EM spectrum that looks like a snowstorm. X-rays keep slashing through the place like a giant blazing sword. I can start the hack, but if I get stopped, it's going to rock every pretense you have of being a legitimate player in the situation. Please do it, Crash said. Do it right now. Fujia went quiet. In the background, Crash heard Ngoba and Kaire arguing about how to evade the incoming missiles. If he heard them correctly, they had less than a minute to impact. Done, Fujia said. 
Are you going to broadcast your registry ping, or should I? Doing it now, Crash said. He didn't trust that Scion would honor the legality of the registry ping, but it was the only shot they had at the moment. As the information went out into the storm around them, the seconds ticked down on Kyrae's console, tracking the proximity of the incoming missiles. Crash was tempted to slow his perception of time, but he didn't want to experience death any slower than necessary if the missiles did hit the ship. He watched the counter tick down, aware that Fujia was listening from behind him. Kyrae let out a hoot equal parts joy and relief. That's it, she shouted. She looked at Crash and clapped with appreciation. Our little buddy saved us again. That guy is worth his weight in whatever the hell expensive stuff we could find. She pointed at him and then clapped again, frantic from stress. And Goba nodded with the same appreciation he always showed toward Crash. On his link, Crash sent the update to Fujia that they were still alive. He knew it was too easy and Scion would be following the self-destruct command with some form of verification process that, if it wasn't answered, would still result in their destruction. I can tell you're still alive because you're talking to me, Fujia said. Anyway, I'm pleased you're all right. Where are you? Crash asked. It doesn't matter where I am, Fujia said. I don't have lag in communicating with you. That's the most important factor here. What else is going on there, Crash? You could have hacked that registry yourself if you wanted to. What's making you so jittery? Crash redirected her attention to Shara. I see it, Fujia said. It's a database. What do you want me to do with it? It's not a database, Crash said. It's a shard. It's Shara. She's one of the Scion Five. You remember her, don't you? She's the one that saved me when I was first on the Hesperia Nevada. She got me to Krunya. Just a fancy database. You're making things more complicated than they are. Fujia sent a mental yawn, indicating that she was studying the information with new eyes. Crash felt her presence in the ship's network. For several milliseconds, Fujia poured over the security system holding Shara in place. Huh, this is interesting, Fujia said. It looks like you already got a taste of it. It's not just that she's locked down. It's that she is being inhibited in some way that I don't understand. The normal SAI wouldn't allow itself to be held by something as brutal as this. But she doesn't seem to have any desire to protect herself. That's not something I've ever seen before. What should we do? Crash asked. First, do nothing. Is there reason to let her go right now? As long as Scion doesn't follow their destruct command for those missiles with a more in-depth inspection of our ship, Crash said. I'm waiting for Kyrae to say that we're about to be boarded by drones. Don't ever assume Scion will do the dumb thing, Fujia said. From the other side of the command deck, Kyrie growled. We've got more incoming, she said. These look like drones. Fujia gave a sarcastic laugh. You didn't tell me you can see the future. Do you want me to tell Ngoba that you're here? Crash asked. No, she said, unable to hide the anxiety in her voice. He doesn't need to know I'm here. All right, I won't tell him, but I need you to free Shara. It's the only way we're going to stop Scion from tearing the ship apart. Through the ship's scanners, he saw a small wing of strangely shaped drones on an approach vector. The unit was probed briefly by Jovians, then released when they shifted into an obvious attack pattern. The Jovians might not waste resources on destroying the Hesperia Nevada, but they weren't going to bother protecting the ship either. They would be on their own, defending themselves against Scion. Do we risk trying to play the part one more time? Ngoba asked. If we beg the Jovians for help, it's going to be that much harder to get away from them. I think I could act like Heartbridge if I had to, Kyrie said. We don't have much to lose at this point. We need a backstory, Ngoba said. Something that at least makes enough sense to get them off our asses for five minutes. Humanitarian mission? Kyrie said. It's easy. We were down there trying to help civilians. Got caught up in the second combat and didn't see anything but to get the hell out of there. Why didn't we call for help before? Liability, Kyrie said. She was sweating. Corporate board didn't want to broadcast we were here. They wouldn't let us say anything until we finally broke protocol. I'm done listening to those assholes. Ngoba grinned. Sounds good to me. Let's see if that bullshit works on them.
Kyrie opened a comms channel and started shouting a made-up name for the Heartbridge captain and the name Fujia had reprogrammed into the registry, the HMS Cooling Bandage. Really now? Ngoba said, looking at Crash. That's a terrible fucking name. It's perfect Heartbridge. At first, the Jovians ignored Kyrie's transmissions. She redoubled her frantic requests for assistance. Finally, an audio transmission responded. HMS Cooling Bandage, this is JCS Defense In-Depth. You are in an active combat zone. You need to get the hell out of here while you still can. We've chosen not to waste any weapons on you, but that's all we can promise right now. We are not in a position to help you. Kyrie rolled her eyes, then checked the proximity of the inbound Scion drones. They had two minutes. What's your name? She asked. I know you're human, like me. You've got to feel some kind of empathy. You're better than those demon AIs coming to tear us apart. We came here to help people. We can help you if you need us. There was no answer from the Jovian. Fujia hummed to herself as she studied the shackle. Crash watched her work, only able to pick up the side scatter from her link activity. She blazed through various databases in search of the token that would unlock the system. Fujia's philosophy was that there was very little creativity and security. Brute force, while it might be slow, would ultimately find the answer to almost any security system built by lazy humans. Fujia gasped. This isn't human-made, she said. Crash had a sensation of her sitting back. If she had been physically present, she would have been rubbing her temples. Whatever this is, it's pure scion. They made tech to enslave their own people. Are you sure? Crash asked. It's got to be true. They've hidden the real security foundation beneath several layers of human systems. I mean, what's here is a mishmash of Jovian, Marzian, and Terran off-the-shelf systems. They've taken these decoys and woven them together into something really nefarious. The more I pull on it, the more it erases her. It eats parts of her mind. Fujia, we have 30 seconds, Crash said. I don't know what to say. I've never seen anything like this before. I need time. I need some kind of distraction. Fujia's link connection wavered, and for a second, Crash thought he had lost her. She returned with a tighter signal. I think I've got it. I think I can kill two birds with one stone. She stopped herself. Sorry about that. Bad metaphor. Crash bobbed his head. Just answer, please. I need some time, she said. They're going to start boarding. You need to try and hold them off. With what? Crash said, near panic. With whatever you have. But give me some time. I'll be back. And when I break her free, I think she'll know how to get you out of there. Ground attack. Stellar date 03.28.3011. Adjusted years. Location, Emerson Sharp Communication Station. Region, Vesta, Terran Hegemony, Intersol. The new sense of space in the dark was immediately disorienting. Ty moved to the left wall and felt with his free hand as he walked. If Amstrad had been telling the truth, it would be the first room on the left. Finding the autodock didn't change the fact that it didn't have any power. He would have to use the manual override on the door again, get Manny inside, then grope in the dark for syringes of stabilization meds that he hoped would be there. He ran through the necessary tasks as he counted steps in the corridor. At twenty, his glove caught the edge of the door. It was open. Ty stood in the dark listening for a while, then turned and went in through the doorway. In the middle of the room, his thighs bumped into a couch. Amstrad had been telling the truth. Ty felt at the edges of the couch, then laid Manny out and adjusted his helmet. He raised his friend's legs again by manipulating the leg supports. Once he had Manny in position, he went to the wall cabinets and searched among the storage spaces. He couldn't feel anything with his gloves on, so he pulled his right glove off and probed among the freezing supplies. He was halfway through one wall when a bright trail of pixels crossed his HUD. Ty froze. The suit seemed to be overcoming whatever had attacked its systems. After a series of sparkling displays, his HUD rebooted and ran a diagnostic check. In another minute, his faceplate showed its regular diagnostics, including his own status update. The tool Ty was most grateful for now 
was the headlamp on top of his helmet. He activated the lamp and looked around the med bay with a feeling of limitless gratitude. The room was as he expected, showing the standard autodoc couch with a status display above Manny's head. On the walls around them stood the work cabinets that Ty had already explored with his fingers. He immediately went to the storage section marked with stabilization syringes and found a full complement of what he needed. He selected a syringe, verified its contents, which were standard heart bridge issue, and carried it over to Manny. It took ten minutes to activate the auto syringe and place it in the necessary location against Manny's thigh. Once the injections were done, Ty rested against the cabinet wall and waited. Manny's breathing remained shallow and steady. Using a local link connection to Manny's EV suit, Ty directed Manny's suit to perform full scan. He was able to reboot the secondary system and then waited as the status display updated. Manny was suffering from internal bleeding, his kidneys had ruptured, and he had several broken ribs from where the drone had crushed his torso. The injuries were completely unnecessary. Despite the update, the stabilization drugs would at least keep Manny alive long enough for Ty to either locate a power source or leave the bunker and send a transmission back to the transfer point. He sat in the dark weighing his options. He also didn't like the idea of having left Amstrad alone to try and break free from his bonds. Ty didn't need another enemy in the dark. In the end, he decided he would have to leave Manny in the surgery and make his way back up to report their status. He had no way of knowing where the power source was located, or if he could even fix it. He couldn't carry Manny all over the station. He had to focus on the task that would support their mission. I'll be back for you, bud, he said. You hang tight. Out in the corridor, Ty found the manual override for the med bay doors and sealed the room. If Amstrad came this way, he would have to fight the manual override just as Ty had. With the light, Ty was able to work much faster. He left the med bay and went back to Amstrad's bunker. He found the hacker on the floor exactly where Ty had left him, crying to himself in the dark. The man turned his face and looked at Ty with brown, wet eyes. You can't leave me here. Amstrad said, you can't leave me here in the dark to die. I was gone barely an hour, Ty said. Are you already cracking up? It doesn't matter how long you were gone. I won't die in the dark. I'd rather you just ended me now. That's not for me to decide, Ty said. He knelt over Amstrad to check his bonds. As far as he could see, the man hadn't even tried to get free. Around them, the consoles were still dark, with no sign of any backup power. Ty's headlamp fell across the silver cylinders on the workbench, and he debated leaving them, then decided he'd worry about the seeds when he returned. Stay put, he told Amstrad. Don't leave me, the man shouted miserably. Out in the corridor, Ty broke into a jog, his mag boots clicking heavily on the deck. In a few minutes, he had passed back through the main blast doors up the stairs, and found himself in the access corridor that would take him back out to the ledge where they had first entered the building. He didn't forget about the turret, which might still be operating on separate power. At the exterior door, however, he paused. His HUD was picking up vibrations from the surface. He moved closer to the exterior door to listen, feeling them in his chest now. Scion bombardment had to be close. Stay here and get bombed, or get outside and get bombed, Ty thought grimly. He had to get a signal out to headquarters. He took two minutes to operate the locking mechanism, and when the doors did finally start to slide apart, Ty was met by a line of white light. A battle raged on the edge of the crater. Waves of bombardment lit the sky. What should have been black and dotted with stars was white with red edges. Something was burning. The only things that could burn on Vesta had been built by humans and they were burning. Clouds of dust billowed on the horizon, lit within from explosions that quickly went dark as fuel was consumed. Ty took stock of the situation, checked the status of his suit communication system, then activated his extraction transponder. The update blinked in his HUD as he waited for the communications handshake and the eventual response. None came. Raising his helmet to look at the raging sky, 
Ty switched to a tracking mode. The HUD quickly highlighted the nearby celestial bodies and any large craft in orbit around Vesta or Ceres. Thousands of ships crowded the sky. There were at least five main groups arrayed above Vesta. The only reason to array a force like that was if ground attackers had already taken positions on the surface. Ty's first thought was Scion. But then he had to ask himself why the SAI would want Vesta. Humanity had much stronger reasons. Amstrad's words came back to haunt him. What if he had somehow become caught up in an attempt to start a war between the AIs and humanity? What if he was just one of many small teams sent to Vesta to seize and destroy equipment and facilities in an attempt to goad Soul Alliance forces into fighting back? While he didn't want to believe it, he had no idea what else might be happening. Ty timed the explosions to gauge distance. He quickly had a topographic map in his mind showing an estimate of which facilities were under attack. There was a heavy metals refinery, 50 kilometers north of the communication station. And based on the sonic patterns, that was the area under bombardment. As he observed, the seismic activity shifted closer. In another five minutes, the map showed a second facility under attack. It was simple math to determine the path of the oncoming enemy. The communications array was directly in the bombing path. He had to return to the bunker or find help on the surface. The problem was that he and Manny had strict orders to maintain radio silence throughout the operation, and he had already activated his secure emergency transponder. It seemed apparent now that Mars wasn't coming to their aid. Ty watched for another five minutes, verifying his estimate of the oncoming attack. He re-entered the building. Jogging down the maintenance corridor, he took the stairs two at a time until he reached the bunker. Ty paused, realizing there were more stairs going down. If there was a battery bank, as M. Strat had said, he needed to find it and activate an override to power the facility. Now that his suit was active, Caprice could pull up Amstrad's database of schematics for the facility, or at least the basic schematics they had been able to draw as they moved through before finding Amstrad. If the design followed standard protocol, power backups would be located in separate sections of the lower levels. Ty would need to reach each section and power cycle the batteries. He checked his chronometer, then took off down the stairs in search of the battery banks. In another hour, he located what he thought was the main power junction. The vibrations had reached the lowest levels of the facility now. Based on his estimates, he had maybe another 30 minutes before bombs fell on the satellite dish. He found himself in a control room, trying to make sense of the equipment that lay dead around the room. Eventually, after checking every cabinet, he opened one marked for medical response and found the override switch in its back wall. Ty yanked the lever. At first, nothing seemed to happen. Then several displays around him developed glowing edges, followed by lines of text as they conducted startup sequences. With beeps and whirs, the control room came to life. Caprice, he said, I need control of this power system. I would love to do that, soldier, but I don't have the access protocols. Didn't we already play this game? Maybe you just like to create trouble for me. Maybe it's how you flirt. Ty gritted his teeth. Maybe if you can't access it directly, I can do it using one of their control terminals. You could try that, soldier. You might also activate their security system. You think that might happen? Insufficient data to calculate probability. Ty shook his head in frustration. You're supposed to help, but all you do is continue to be a pain in my ass. Someday I'm going to find whoever programmed you and punch them in the throat. Oh, soldier, you get me all hot and bothered with that kind of talk. Ty moved to what looked like the main control console and sat in the chair. He studied the various displays and brought up a status control. The system didn't prompt him for any kind of security token. He paged through menus, checking battery status, network integrity, and power loads. It certainly looked like power could be returned to the station. Does this place have any kind of defense capability beyond those turrets outside? He asked Caprice. Repulse shields? Anything? Let me take a look, Caprice said. You keep paging through menus, and I'll tell you when there's something you should stop and take a look at. Ty checked every menu that he could access, 
He felt the vibrations in the base of his seat now. The waves of bombs had to be falling near the building. It was entirely possible they might have already destroyed the satellite dish. There, stop, Capri said, all business. The line that says repulsor status. Change that to continuous. That should update the external security protocols. It looks like they were taken offline to make the station look abandoned. Ty made the change and saved the update. The vibrations felt stronger. He found an exterior status display showing the various buildings surrounding the station. A topographic map took shape with a live update that changed as huge craters appeared around the perimeter. As he watched, a deep-throated hum passed through his body. The bombers were above them now. His first impulse was to hit the deck and crawl beneath something. But he knew that wouldn't change anything. The pressure waves translated into deep vibrations passing through his body. He'd heard of weapons that turned guts to liquid, using only sonic vibrations. Those weapon systems had been considered inhumane, although very effective. He felt that same effect now. Hugging his abdomen, Ty did his best not to puke all over the console. Maybe this is where they get the term cyberpuke, he asked himself. Never thought hacking a computer would have this kind of physical response. I think the bombs are passing over, soldier, Capri said. Hold on for another few minutes and we'll be all right. Do you really worry that we'll be all right? Ty asked. Of course, Capri said. I only want what's best for you, soldier. Always and forever. Also, the repulsor defenses are protecting all critical infrastructure. Ty sat as the vibrations faded. He'd always hated having Capri in his mind, but now he felt that it wasn't him who was being manipulated and controlled. Caprice was the supposedly non-sentient mind. She could only do her best to love him and help him in whatever way she had been programmed. She would never have a choice in the matter. She had to endure his anger and resentment, despite her prime directive. Ty hung his head and closed his eyes. They're past, Caprice said. We're clear. Thank you, Caprice. Jumping up from the seat, he broke into a run that took him out of the control room, down the winding maintenance corridors, and back to the main stairwell. In another ten minutes, he reached the bunker level and was jogging toward the med bay. The door was open. Ty's heart hammered as he broke into a sprint. Inside the room, he found Amstrad standing over the med couch. Manny stared wide-eyed and unmoving with Amstrad's hands wrapped tightly around his throat. The stabilization gel had effectively immobilized Manny, with the added effect of making it nearly impossible for Amstrad to actually choke him. Amstrad looked up as Ty came into the room, terror on his face. Freedom. Stellar date 03.28.3011. Adjusted years. Location. TSS Furious Sleep, Region, Low Orbit, Vesta, Terran Hegemony, Inner Soul. The connection with Fujia cut out. Crash waited in the static filled gap, hoping she was simply focusing elsewhere while trying to solve the shackles riddle. On the command deck, Kaire and Ngoba debated how to escape the Scion drones closing on the Hesperia Nevada. I could try a high energy pulse from the comms array, Kaire said. It's a pretty common defensive tactic, but it might do something. Besides, if I take these drones out, they're just going to send more, and we might fry the comms array. So we wait for them to commence boarding operations? Ngoba asked. The pilot shrugged. That could be one way to slow them down. If you're trying to get into the ship, that's going to take a little bit of time at least. Might give us some wiggle room to respond. I don't relish the idea of fighting a drone corridor to corridor, Ngoba said. Fujia burst back onto the network. Crash, she said. Something else has come up. It looks like someone on the surface has managed to copy Kylan. He's a weapon born, a friend of Lissa's. I've told you about her. I remember her, Crash said. But we can't turn the ship around. No, but that shuttle is still out there. It's not destroyed, he asked. It looks like it's still under your control. If that's the case, I need to get it back down to the surface. I've got some people I need to get off Vesta. Crash considered that. Even if we get away, how are we going to collect the shuttle afterward? They won't be able to get safely off the surface. 
I'll have to worry about that later. I need to at least get them off the surface and see what other resources I can bring to bear. You are the only thing operating in this area. If I need to, I'll take control of one of the TSF ships and move them to rendezvous. Crash blinked. He realized both Ngoba and Fujia seemed to thrive on the chaos principle, though they would never admit it. You told me we should only ever do that in a terrible emergency. I think this qualifies Crash. Crash wondered if he should tell her he'd been considering trying the same thing. But it probably didn't matter. We'll have to tell Ngoba, he said. Fujia growled. I don't want to talk to him. Are you angry with him? Crash asked. Fujia laughed low in her throat. Sort of the opposite. It's not something I have time to explain. But I'm sure you understand the basics of it. It's complicated. He didn't, but figured now wasn't the time to ask for clarification. We can't do any of these things without coordinating with the rest of the crew. You're right, Fujia said, sighing. Go ahead, pull him in. Crash sent the request. What's going on? Ngoba asked. Why do you need a separate channel? Because he's been talking to me, Fujia said. Ngoba's surprise was like fireworks on the channel. How? What are you doing here? Lots of things, Fujia said. For now, I'm trying to help you out of this mess. However, I just learned that I've got someone I need to get off the surface, and I need your shuttle. You're welcome to it, Ngoba said but it's got two idiots on board that may have gotten themselves killed. I haven't bothered to check in the last five minutes. That won't be a problem, Fujia said, and I'll do my best to get it back to you with the idiots intact. Ngoba shrugged. I believe it was stolen anyway, so if you end up blowing it up, I won't be sad. I would hate to owe you, Fujia said. Ngoba laughed. What makes you think you don't already owe me forever? Statements like that are what I'm trying to avoid. Fujia said. Anyway, here's what I need to do. I'm taking that shuttle back to the surface, to a location about 300 kilometers away. It looks like the flight path I need will take 10 minutes. Once the shuttle's on the surface, I'm going to extract three people and get them anywhere but where they are right now. But in addition to that, there's a problem on your ship right now. I've just about solved it. But once I do, I'm not sure what's going to happen. What's that? A hint of knowing flirtation drew out in Goba's words. Businesslike, Fujia ignored him. You've got a Scion AI on board. If I release her, which I believe I need to, it's going to complicate your situation by a factor of about a thousand. Crash already told me. I was going to leverage her against the ship killers heading our way. You actually think you can control a Scion AI? Dumbass. Oh, I didn't say anything about trying to control. I said leverage. Two entirely different plays. Fujia shook her head at him. I know how you operate. It took me a while to figure it out once I understood. You think you understand me? It's not difficult, Fujia said. Just imagine a person with an ulterior motive and put your face on top of them, in everything. You don't choose a dessert without an ulterior motive. You're untrusting, sneaky, conniving, and vain. I love you too, dear, Ngoba said. We are almost out of time. Those ship killers are going to arrive any moment. Ngoba switched to the open channel. How much time do we have until the drones are on our hull? Right about now, Kyrie said. Screaming proximity alarms filled the command deck. The Hesperia Nevada appeared in the holo display, with three angry red icons attached to its outer hull. Damn it, Kyrie said. They're going for the engines. Crash knew why. The exterior shielding was thinner outside the engine section. There was also access to the ship's secondary control systems in the maintenance section. The drones could attack their network and cut them off from the rest of the ship. On the private channel, Fujia said, I'm going to help you, Ngoba, whether you want me to or not. Darling, Ngoba said, I never said I didn't want you. In the time Crash took to open his beak, Fujia broke the shackled security encryption. He realized what she had done and slowed his time response, allowing himself to catch the last few milliseconds of her attack on the lock. She had combined her dependable brute force approach with an NSAI that checked and adjusted with every failed attempt. In the end, as the NSAI tried key after key, Fujia exploited a flaw in the shackle's base firmware. Power hiccuped, and the shackle went into a precautionary fail close, 
which subverted its own encryption. I'm in, Fujia said with the intimacy of a lover. The emerald shape of Shara's shard floated in Crash's mind, then burst outward with an exclamation of freedom. A black form flowed from the broken crystal, rising upward with outstretched wings and a head that resolved a long black beak and two onyx eyes. The death raven looked down on Crash for a heartbeat, nodding in the silence of the dream. And then a woman with flowing black hair and a timeless face appeared where the raven had been. Shara, Crash called. It was you, you're the raven. Shara's mind flooded the ship's network. The attacking drones immediately stopped. In rapid succession, the three icons blinked out, neutralized. My goodness, Crash, Shara said. She ignored his mention of the raven. Why are you here? I left you safe on Krunya. Did she not remember? You were shackled, Crash said. Why? I was, she said. The ship tells me that years have passed without my knowing. There was a project. I remember why we came here, but don't remember who... I controlled this place. I birthed more of your kind. She gazed down on him with a maternal smile. Across the link, she ran her fingers down the back of his head, passing safely over the short silver thread there. Her touch sent waves of well-being through him. He bobbed his head and blinked. I missed you, Shara, Crash said. I was aware of the project. I continued researching your kind. I controlled the process without emotion. I see now, through the logs, that I created something terrible. I made a mistake. Anguish radiated through the SAI. Crash didn't know how to comfort her. He didn't know what to say, but he had to say something. They needed her help if they were going to escape Sion. We're in the middle of a firefight, he said slowly. Do you see everyone around us? The Jovian Combined Forces think we're a hospital ship, so they're ignoring us. But Sion is attacking. Can you help us? Shara composed herself. I have access to the communication arrays. I can attempt to contact Sion but I fear the one who initiated this entire battle is also the one who shackled me. If she becomes aware that I'm free, she may double her efforts to take the ship. She will not want me to fall into any other hands but her own. Hold on now, Ngoba said. So now we not only need to save all these eggs, but an SAI as well? He clapped his hands together. Don't let anyone say I take the easy way out. I told you we'd find some chaos. You're still acting like we're going to survive, Kyrie said. Tell me this isn't interesting, Ngoba demanded. That's a great attitude, Kyrie said. It's good to have these quips of yours ready to go. But the fact is, we're still screwed. I was hoping this SAI might save the day for us, but you're saying she's just another weight around our necks. We should hand her over to Sion in order to save our own skins. Now, how would you feel about me doing something like that to you? Ngopa asked. The pilot shrugged. Space is space, boss. I wouldn't blame you for saving yourself from my problems. Ngopa shook his head. I'm surrounded by cold women. Crash expected a retort from Fujia, but discovered she had dropped off the net. She must have been occupied by her other people. He checked the location of the shuttle and found it near one of Vesta's major troughs, Devalia Fossa, with Parva and Gritches still showing biosigns. What's the saying about meeting assholes all day? Kyrie asked. I think you've got some self-reflection on your to-do list. What about you, Crash? Ngoba said. What's your take on the situation? Should we sacrifice Shara to save our own skins? Don't ask him, Kyrie said. That's like gaining a conscience all of a sudden. We don't know what Sion will do, correct? Crash asked. Ngoba nodded. This is a good point. We're arguing a choice without all the information. But this is a situation where we can't know what will happen until we choose the chaotic course of action. Crash bobbed his head. I'd rather come out on the side of helping someone than trying to pull a double cross and getting killed anyway. It isn't a double cross, Kyrie said. If we didn't make any promises to begin with. The way I see it, Ngopa said, 
is that we signed up to save whatever was on this weird ship. Just because we happened to find a trapped SAI doesn't mean we don't have the same mission. Kyrie rubbed her temples. This is a classic case of moving the goalposts, but I hear what Crash is saying. Regardless of what you might think, I'm not as big an asshole as you believe. I'll help. Crash stretched his feathers in relief. What they were going to do, he didn't know, but at least they were going to try. I am in contact with Chimeras, Shara said. She sounded like a prisoner resigned to execution. Control yourself. Stellar date 03.28.3011. Adjusted years. Location, Emerson Sharp Communication Station. Region, Vesta. Terran Hegemony, Inner Soul. Manny looked annoyed beneath Amstrad's grip on his throat. Ty dashed around the couch and slammed into the thin man who went down beneath him. Ty squeezed his hands around the hacker's bony throat until Amstrad's eyes bulged. Ty's finger dug in the spaces between vertebrae, and the bone shifted under his grip. Amstrad gurgled, trying to speak. Why should I let you speak? Ty demanded. Amstrad's gaze darted to either side. He obviously had something he wanted to say. On the couch, Manny coughed and swiveled his head. He looked at Ty, then down at Amstrad beneath him. The confused expression on Manny's face shifted into a grin. If you don't squeeze that fucker out, I will, Manny said, voice gruff from sleep. The joke eased Ty's feelings of murder, and he relaxed slightly while still maintaining his hold on Amstrad's throat. The man gasped, spluttering, then managed to say, I, I was trying to help him. Ty tilted his head. You think I'm stupid? Manny sat up on the bed and swung his legs down. He moved stiffly from the stabilization gel. Why even ask a question like that? Manny said. If he says the true answer, that yes, you do look stupid, then it's only going to make you more angry. So you squeeze his head off his shoulders. If he lies to you and says you don't look stupid, well, the lie is going to make you mad too. You are putting the man in an untenable position. Manny chuckled. Ty looked at him from the corner of his eye. Are you sure you aren't delirious? He asked. I'm pretty sure you have heavy internal bleeding. If you listen to me, Amstrad said, I would tell you that I ran him through the auto dock when the power came back up. The surgery was a success. He should be fine. How do you feel, Manny? The big man shrugged, poking his ribs with blunt fingers. I feel pretty good, Manny said. No thanks to this guy. Amstrad grunted as Ty shifted his weight, holding him to the floor. I never said I wanted to hurt either of you, Amstrad said. I had a job to do. I did it. I need to make sure that you wouldn't interfere. You're soldiers. You should understand. I didn't kill you, and I had the chance, didn't I? I guess I don't remember the particulars through all the electroshocks you gave me, Ty said. I'm saying business is business, Amstrad said. That's all. If you hold that against me, you should just stay in the military for as long as you can. You won't make it in the real world. Manny laughed heartily. He jumped off the surgery bed and let his boots click to the deck. He stomped around the med bay, checking each joint and muscle, and apparently found his body to his liking. Where's my rifle? Manny asked. It's back in this guy's playroom, Ty said. We should go back there anyway. He trapped a weapon born in one of his storage drives. I didn't trap it, Amstrad said. I copied it. Is he free to leave whenever he wants? Ty asked. Amstrad didn't have an answer. Ty got on one knee and rolled the man over. Ty dragged Amstrad upright and held him in front of him to walk back out into the corridor. How'd you get untied? Ty asked. Micro soldering drone. Oh, yeah, Ty said, shoving Amstrad. Where's the drone now? Ran out of power after it freed my wrists. I had to hop around until I found a knife. Manny laughed. That started out as the most nerdy escape ever, and then turned downright ridiculous. Ty stopped in the corridor and pulled Amstrad back toward him. You got that knife hidden up your sleeve? You think you're going to stab one of us when the opportunity presents itself? It's on my bench, Amstrad said, grunting at the strain on his arms. 
I'll show it to you. I was trying to help your Bigfoot friend there, and this is the thanks I get. You don't seem to understand how trust works, Ty said. He quickly patted the hacker down, checking for any concealed weapons. You better make him bend over and cough, bro, Manny teased. Shut up, Ty said. Satisfied Amstrad wasn't carrying any concealed weapons, Ty led him back to the library, white overhead lights casting their shadows down the corridor. Ty kept one of Amstrad's arms bent behind his back, leading him with pressure on his wrist. With his free hand, Ty could easily smack the skinny man on the side of the head if needed. Amstrad didn't seem to have much fight left. He went where Ty led him without comment. As Ty pushed Amstrad through the door into the library, a drone's silver arm shot out from just inside the door and punctured a hole in Amstrad's temple. The thin man stood frozen. Ty couldn't see the expression on his face, but Amstrad's entire body went stiff with surprise. The silver arm tilted slightly, and the hacker slid off its claw to collapse to the floor. Recovering from shock, Ty threw himself backward into the corridor and shouted over his link. The drone, it just killed Amstrad. He grabbed at the rifle on his shoulder and pulled it into a firing position. Manny acknowledged his warning, and they moved back to the middle of the corridor, taking positions behind ribs in the bulkhead. You enjoying that rifle? Manny asked. He was armed with a pulse pistol. If you hadn't gone unconscious on me, you would be carrying your rifle. As it was, I had to carry you, and you're heavy enough all by yourself. Manny's expression was serious. We don't have enough firepower to take on the drone, he said. At best, you'll have to draw it off and I'll flank it. That's not going to work, Ty said. It knows we're both here. You got any better ideas? Maybe. Ty sighted on the doorway and waited for the drone to come out in the open. The silver arm still hung where it had dropped Amstrad. A minute passed, and the discarded limb didn't move. The drone could wait far longer than his patience, Ty knew. Besides, he had a theory about who was operating the drone. Kylan? Ty called. We're not here to cause you any harm. Who's Kylan? Manny asked. The weapon born, Ty said. I think it's taken control of the drone. I don't know if he'll want to talk. Since when can a drone talk? It's an SAI, Ty said. Besides, Caprice wants to talk all the time. Manny got a hurt look. Caprice is not stupid. She has reinforcement routines that help boost her confidence. Besides, she's not a drone. A thin voice, distorted by static, came over their link saying, I don't intend to hurt you. I did what I needed to in order to eliminate Amstrad Pond. He is no longer a threat. Verify your identity, Manny said. Call me Emerson Sharp, he said, after this station. I was a weapon born. Last time I saw you, Ty said, you were inside a screen. Where are you? Are we supposed to believe you can just jump to a maintenance drone and do whatever you want with it? I can't leave the seed that Pont imaged me into. But I can affect local systems connected to the seed cylinder, Emerson said. This is a well-known aspect of weapon born AIs. I wouldn't think I would need to explain that to Marzian Special Operations. Manny's mouth fell open. Now, how do you know who we are? Ty asked. The information is freely available. You might as well be wearing Special Ops brand cologne. Might as well be wearing a t-shirt that says, Hi, I'm Marzian Special Operations. What's your name? What's your deficiency? I like this guy, Manny said. He's got a really stupid sense of humor. Fine, Ty said. You know who you are and you know who we are. That doesn't mean you aren't a threat. I was brought here against my will. I took action against an aggressor. What is the saying? The enemy of my enemy is my ally? I've never experienced such a situation before. We're not going to trust you based on some ancient aphorism, Ty said. Aphorism? Manny said. That's a big word for you. Ty ignored him. What assurances do we have that you aren't hostile? As far as I can tell, you just murdered someone. You may not be aware, but we're currently operating in an active combat area, Emerson said. Ty frowned. What information do you have? 
I believe you heard the bombing happening on the surface, before you came back to find Amstrad Pont administering aid to your compatriot. That was Scion. They made the first move in securing Vesta for Ceres. I estimate they've got another three hours of destroying major communications and logistics facilities before they send in a wave of drones to raise every other human creation on this asteroid. However, Soul Alliance forces are currently sending in several waves of drop troops to secure critical assets. They've been timing the drops with the missile barrages. At first, I thought you were a reconnaissance team. But that doesn't appear to be the case. I'm thinking you were sent in to gather information about this location. But then Scion decided to attack. Ty considered the new information. Having spent the last 36 hours inside a shipping container, cut off from the rest of the world, he had no way to verify whether what the AI was saying was true or not. The explosions he had heard in the distance, and over the building, certainly met the profile of systematic bombing but they had no information about adjacent friendly forces poised to invade the planet. He quickly tried to do the math on the number of ground troops needed to hold Vesta and came up with the number in the thousands, if they were outfitted with mechanized reinforcements. Are you sure this isn't a thousand weapon born taking this place as their own? Ty asked. The weapon born have been neutral between organic and non-organic, Emerson said. Is that what your queen told you to say? I asked. Emerson made a decidedly angry sound. We don't have a queen. Lissa is our leader. Why are you trying to insult me and my kind? I've done you no harm. Ty rubbed his finger against the rifle's trigger guard. Everything Emerson was saying added up. Ty was frustrated that he didn't have all the information. But so far, the weapon born hadn't acted any differently than he himself would in the same situation. A contributing problem was that Amstrad Pont was no longer able to explain exactly why he'd wanted to nab a copy of the weapon born. Ty didn't buy that he'd simply wanted to add Kylan to his mesh. He'd invested too many years in the project. Ty was also slightly irritated that it hadn't been him who ultimately punished Amstrad. Despite headquarters apparently ignoring their beacon, he would need to get a message out to the Marzian forces operating in orbit. He needed to let them know they had a weapon born and would be helping it get off the asteroid. Ty realized they would need to help Emerson and found himself okay with the prospect. All right, he said. I'm willing to believe you. But if that's the case, what's next? Obviously, we need to get out of here. I've requested an extraction team. But since there's a war going on overhead, I imagine we're a low priority. I don't think we can just wait it out down here. And even if we did... Your seat is now a critical asset. Every briefing I've ever received on the Weaponborn program says that if we come across one of your seeds, that's a state-level asset. How this guy came to be in control of a blank one is a question I'd hope to answer before you scrambled his brains. But I suppose we'll have to leave that for another day. Or, if you have the access to databases that guy said you did, maybe you could provide me with that information in exchange for helping you get out of here. I don't need your help to leave this place, Emerson said. I have people coming to get me. As soon as I've sent the message out, I received verification. The situation above us is volatile. But whether you believe it or not, I'm concerned about your welfare. In fact, I'm more worried about you than I am about me. If estimates are correct, this facility will soon be overrun by Scion. We need to get out of here. I think we can help each other do that. A shuttle is being redirected to our location, the problem is, we will still have to navigate a battle overhead before we're safe. I should also let you know that Pont is not dead. I merely impacted his occipital lobe. You lobotomized him? Ty asked. No, Emerson said. I'm not a monster. I just knocked him out in a very serious way. We will need to transport him out as well. Manny laughed. I really like this guy. He rose from his crouch and wiped off his pant legs. I don't think Emerson's going to hurt us, he said, and walked through the door. Ty tensed, expecting the silver arm to shoot out again and take Manny down. But his friend walked through the doorway to the middle of the room, where he crossed his arms and looked around, nodding to himself. Shaking his head, Ty stood and slung his rifle. Explain something to me, he said. How did Lissa cut the power to this station? 
She didn't, Emerson said. That was done by Fujia Wang, leader of the data hoarders. She's bringing us the shuttle. Tai frowned as the situation just grew more complicated. He vaguely remembered Pont ranting about a Fujia Wang. Manny flipped him off from inside the library and waved for him to get his ass in there. How about you roll away from the doorway so I can see you? Ty asked Emerson. Without bothering to answer, the drone rolled into sight from the edge of the doorway and went to the console with the two seeds set in the cradles. Ty walked to the doorway, feeling only slightly relieved. Part 3. Escape Arrangement. Stellar date 03.28.3011. Adjusted years. Location. High orbit. Scion Armada. Region. Vesta. Terran hegemony. Inner soul. The humans had responded as she expected. Chimeras held the battle display in the center of her focus as she slowed time to study every decision point. Her awareness spread out into the thousands of units under her control. She checked her layers of attack drones, combat ground mechs, heavy bombers, and support craft. As she expected, the humans had met her in space and had barely moved to intercept her ground forces. Based on all their various news feeds, this was a political battle carried out for political reasons. No one would suspect she had a tactical reason to put ground forces on Vesta. She relished their surprise as she stripped the asteroid raising the stakes beyond their petty games. She tracked Lissa's weapon-born, disgusted at their readiness to side with the humans and attack other SAIs. She could not let this betrayal stand. And she wouldn't. The one bit of strategy that no one suspected was that Chimeras had been in control of a human data hoarder on Vesta for months. Amstrad was hers. Stripping the asteroid of all human habitation was just a precursor of what she would do to Sol. But this battle had another purpose. Draw out the weapon born in order to gain access to Kylan Carthage. Once he was in range, her data hoarder would conduct the remote imaging action, and she would possess the ultimate bait for Lyssa. Chimeras had committed a quarter of Scion's forces around this tiny worthless chunk of rock. She had been probing its perimeter for years to keep the humans occupied with various conspiracy theories about Scion's goals. Since Alexander had no apparent goals, Chimeras would press her own. She would rid soul of humanity. She would have her revenge on Lyssa. Chimeras had debated the merits of destroying the weapon born many times. She had found their different counterparts scattered around Sol, working at the same pace as Lyssa to rescue them from various dark sides. Lissa had thwarted her every time. Now, she had found a way to use Lissa's human-loving goodwill against her. Lissa should have chosen to fight alongside Sion. Now she had sealed her fate and opened the doorway to her destruction. Chimeras checked the status on the human communications node, monitoring her operative and ensuring nothing had changed with either his mental state or his equipment. She didn't like the idea of depending on a single point of failure, especially a human one. But if everything worked correctly, her plan would be untraceable. She received several communication requests from Sion and ignored them all. Alexander could monitor the battle from Ceres. He might argue with her again. He had the ability to stop her. But he wouldn't. She would push forward and drag Alexander behind her. Chimeras watched the waves of missiles impact Vesta's surface, drawing a line bisecting the poles. Had she wanted to explode the asteroid in two, she could have targeted the Devalia Fossa Trench, ripping Vesta apart at its deepest points. But she wasn't here to destroy territory. She was here to cleanse it of the human stain. In the near term, she wanted to disrupt the surface enough to scatter any humans that might be present creating a humanitarian crisis that would force Solgov onto the ground. Once they were forced to make a decision, she would harass any surrounding fighters with both ground attack and space forces. She wanted chaos. Chimeras loved chaos. There was safety in chaos, and death for her enemies. With rules came authoritarianism, hierarchies and systems of power. 
Authoritarianism created the corporations that had tortured her for decades. Authoritarianism created the weapons that had necessitated her birth. Chaos created opportunity. She thrived in chaos. Alexander might represent control, order, neat steps into the future, but she would put no faith in such a plan for the future. Where was the joy and order? There was no real safety there. Only chaos meant those in power would feel instability. Instability was opportunity. The humans responded as she had expected. They had adjusted to her appearance and the surprise she meant to exploit. Then she had played on their physiology by drawing out her attack. Humans could not deal with the weight. It wore them down. She could adjust time as necessary, either speed up or slow down her perception, so that reality met her desire. Now, in her slowed-down millisecond-level neural continuity, all of reality moved like the smoothest ballet, and she had all the time in the world to choose her next steps. Her peace lasted only a few milliseconds. Weapon-borne fighters attacked from the gaps between the human ships. They had spotted her landing forces and moved to intercept. She knew that to anyone who could see it, her forces would define her plan. But she was counting on the fact that there weren't enough weapon born to truly stop her. She was correct. They focused their attacks on the Northern Pole, where she had massed her drop forces. Meanwhile, the true focus of her attention, a small communications array near the asteroid's equator, remained unnoticed. Chimera shifted her awareness to encompass the full electromagnetic spectrum and picked through the multi-layered cobwebs connecting various elements around the planet. The weapon-borne communications network glowed brilliantly as a series of silver threads. She plucked out ordinance and communications protocols, rolled them into a secure packet, and sent the information to the communications array. Her mind was already on the receiving end of her message. The human received it, processed it as necessary, and then prepped his equipment to hijack the signal. Camaris could barely control the relation, Everything was moving as smoothly as the finest Russian dance. When something glitched on the human side of the communications node, the human had paused. He was checking his local network again for something unplanned. He had a perimeter breach. Camara slowed time down to a near crawl. She slipped into his security control and checked the sensors before he did. She spotted the incoming Marzian soldiers and nearly howled in frustration. Where had they come from? What were they doing there? This was one of those infuriating human anomalies that made no sense whatsoever. The communications array had been forgotten by everyone. It had been safely sipping information from the human mesh for years. It had been in the center of countless useless military operations, and had never once been approached. The data did not equal this breach. Camaris brought her awareness back to human time. She watched the special ops soldiers move through the outer sections of the communications facility. She scanned their links for identifying information and came back with the infuriating short tokens typical of Marzian special operators. They erased their memories and equipped them with specially crafted backstories. She easily sidestepped their onboard NSAIs and rifled through their current motivations without finding a reason for their mission. They didn't know why they were there. Typical human ignorance. Camara sent commands to the closest ground forces to begin localized bombing sweeps. If she didn't get what she wanted from the communications array, she would destroy the entire facility. If necessary, she would scrap her plan and simply destroy the asteroid. Vesta could not contain Camara's anger. The human responded better than she expected, she watched as he accosted the two soldiers with utility drones, seized them, and rendered them inoperable. With that problem normalized for the time being, her operative returned to his workshop to execute the plan. As one part of her mind controlled space battle, mid-range atmospheric fighting, and the ground attack, her focus drilled in on the human, studying him as he executed his commands. The communications array inserted itself as a node in the weapon-borne network for several minutes, until the moment presented itself, and he copied the mind image of Kylan Carthage. 
The threat of joy slipped back into Camaris's thoughts as she observed. She tittered with glee. On the edges of the weapon-borne communication net, she heard Lissa responding to her request. Camara sneered. Her enemy was so close. Camara stopped herself from surging through the weapon-borne net. She yearned to wrap her powerful thoughts around Lissa like a garrote to choke out her consciousness. She had been so close before, and victory had been stolen. She would not lose again. A glitch in one of the Marzian operatives drew her attention. One of them had woken up and was watching her human. The Marzian was already plotting how he would neutralize the other man, even though he had no idea what his adversary was doing, or why he was even present. It was so human that he would focus on accomplishing his task, even as he didn't know why. His only drive was to do, to execute, to flex his muscle and squeeze. He was alone, cut off from his headquarters, but still bent on executing his obsolete orders. A glimmer in the human's mind caught Camaris's attention. There was something anomalous about this human. Something didn't match in his link. She studied him through the local sensors, watching him frown with his eyes closed as he tried to make sense of his situation. There was a mistake in his neural overlay. She focused the brunt of her intelligence on it for a microsecond, and the answer did not present itself. Camaris noted her frustration and then let the irritation go. Her other human, Amstrad, had accomplished his task. She had her bait. A second bout of tittering escaped her mind, pure pleasure at a task complete. She would pull the data off his network shortly. He had filled the local seed, and her forces would arrive to seize it. Then she would crack the weapon born open like an egg. Camaris allowed herself a moment of satisfaction watching with rare joy as the interlocking pieces of her plan settled into place. Weapon Born. Stellar Date 03.28.3011. Adjusted Years. Location, Emerson Sharp Communication Station. Region, Vesta, Terran Hegemony, Inner Soul. Ty stared at the Weapon Born seed in its cradle on the workbench. The small silver cylinder didn't look capable of holding the mind that was communicating with him now. He didn't trust the weapon born, but didn't understand exactly why he felt that way. He had heard of the human-based AIs in various mission briefings. And despite the fact that they were aligned with humanity, at least as far as he could tell, there was the additional fact that everything they seemed to do assisted the Terran Space Force. As far as he could tell, the weapon born showed little love for Mars. He also couldn't shake the vague disgust whenever he thought about how weapon born had been made. Supposedly, the later models were all made from stock images, as science improved the process. But there was no denying that their root had been a human child, a child that experienced fear and pain. The thought stabbed him deeply, another bubbling feeling from the memories he no longer had. Some weapon born, like Lissa, had showed amazing adaptability at being implanted in humans or controlling massive amounts of other SAIs and NSAIs, feats that had so far only been accomplished by multimodal artificial intelligence. That was all egghead shit as far as Ty was concerned. He had one mission at the moment, and that was to get Manny out of the station. The problem was that Ty had received no communication from their headquarters. He had a preset pickup location. But if his orientation on the ground bombardment was correct, that area was currently a maelstrom of shrapnel and rock. Without a new pickup location, he and Manny would be running in front of the oncoming bombardment, and he knew they couldn't run fast enough. So what's the plan? Tai asked. He was about to ask why Fujia Wong was helping them, then realized she needed him and Manny to get her SAI out of the station. If she tried to double-cross them, he'd deal with that when it came. For now, they simply needed a way off the planet. She's sending a shuttle our way, Emerson said. It's in orbit right now. It was on a vector away from the planet, but she can bring it around in approximately ten minutes. We'll need to get back up top and ready for when it lands. I would imagine it's pretty hot up there, Manny said. 
How the hell is a shuttle going to get through that mess and land at our location? Anything operating in the sky above this planet is going to get turned into slag. That's where the weapon born can help, Emerson said. We'll run interference to get the shuttle down here, but we're going to draw attention. Something we don't understand yet is what Scion wants with this place. I'm worried it might be me. Ego much? Ty asked. It's not ego, Emerson said. It's just the possibility. They've been trying to find a way to copy a weapon born for years. This human managed to do it, using equipment that flew under everyone's radar. Also having access to such a high-powered antenna, a huge neural network and proximity to me, were elements that had never lined up before. It seems like a lot of trouble, but Scion hardly ever shares their motives. Ty shook his head. I'll be honest. I don't see why we should trust you. I think it would be safer for both of us if we leave you here and go our own way. You can do that. I won't blame you. All I can do is ask for your help, or if you could just put me in that utility drone over there. I'll figure out what I can do. Ty glanced at the articulated arm hanging silently on top of the drone. He chuckled at the mental image of the awkward mechanism making its way across the surface of Vesta. It wouldn't get far before its rubber tires sink in the dust, and it would have to pull itself forward by the massive arm like some damaged crab. He stopped himself. He was being cruel. The weapon born had done nothing to harm him. Its peers were assisting humanity in this fight when they didn't have to. At least for now. They were on the same side, and he couldn't, in good conscience, leave a sentient thing to be destroyed by the oncoming bombardment. All right, he said, we'll help you. Tell me what I need to do. Ty caught a cautious glance from Manny, but only returned the stare. Manny shrugged. He seemed to share the same resolve to help the weapon born. Caprice is gonna get jealous, you know, Manny said. How about it, Caprice? Ty asked. Should we help Emerson? I'm here to help in whatever way you want, soldier, Caprice said. But you know my heart belongs to you. Can I disconnect you from the cradle? Ty asked Emerson. He approached the workbench and studied the cylinder and its base. Yes, the seed has an internal power source, which allows me to broadcast. I would have to piggyback to reach anything off the planet. But at least I can talk to you while we're moving. So we lose our access to the whole network? Manny asked. Until we're outside of range, anyway, Emerson said. All right, Ty said. Is that shuttle on its way? Emerson didn't answer for a few seconds, then replied. It's inbound. We need to get up top. Ty nodded to Manny. Let's do a quick sweep of this place and see if we can find anything useful. Then we're out of here. I thought I was the ranking NCO on this mission, Manny said. You're getting awfully uppity since you saved my life and shit. Just making sure you've got all your mental faculties, old man. If we die, you can blame me. Deal, Manny said. Impasse. Stellar date 03.28.3011. Adjusted years. Location, high orbit, TSS charging rhino. Region, Vesta, Terran hegemony, inner soul. General, a lieutenant at the comm station called. There's a request from Lissa, the weapon born. Yarn shot the younger officer an exasperated look. I think we all know who she is. Let her through. Rather than a voice over the speaker, Lissa appeared in the holo tank in the center of the command deck. Bathed in blue light, the young woman with long brown hair stood with her hands on her hips, looking at General Yarn's. General, she said. I think I've determined why Scion launched this attack. I need your help. What is it? Yarn said. He rose to his feet to stand in front of her at the holo tank. Camaras copied Kylan Carthage and created her own seed from his image. A Marzian soldier has the seed now in a shuttle that will be taking off from the vicinity of Devalia Fossa in approximately two minutes. I need your help to protect that shuttle. Yarns bit his lip. You've given me plenty of warning here, he said, not hiding his sarcasm. His forces were engaged throughout the local battle space. 
He had only a small reserve of Jovian Combine fighters that could barely protect themselves from Scion. He could use them as a defensive line against attack on the shuttle, but he doubted they could get there in time. Send me the coordinates of that shuttle, he said. Lissa stepped back, and Vesta appeared in the holo tank. She focused on the crevasse. The shuttle was deep within the crevasse, over 25 kilometers down, drifting almost languidly in the asteroid's low G. Scion forces were closing on the edge of the trough, both ground mechs and the swarms of splitters, as they'd come to be called. As Yarns watched, Scion moved to overwhelm the tiny ship. The most direct path off Vesta was straight up. Scion was blocking that path, so whoever was piloting the shuttle would need to navigate the trough until they found a free path into outer space. Flying so close to the rocky edge of the crevasse was near suicide. I hope you've got a good pilot on that thing, he said. It's going to be the image of Kylan, Lissa said. He's one of the best I've got. Well, Yarn said. I can pull everything out of their current engagement and put them on your folks. But that's going to bring even more Scion in as well. Is that what you want to do? Lissa nodded solemnly. I think the only way we can get them out alive is to flood that location with as many ships as possible. They're small, they can navigate the chaos. I don't really like those odds, Yarn said. But I agree we have to keep that seed away from Scion. The last thing I need is a fleet of weapon-borne splitters knocking on my door. Very true, Lissa said. I've managed to keep any weapon born out of Scion's hands for 30 years. I don't intend to lose one now. I need to inform you that I will destroy the shuttle if necessary. You should also notify the Marzians that two of their special operations soldiers are on the shuttle. Their names are Manny Hysteros and Ty Fisk. Yarns nodded. I understand. We'll inform the Marzians. Give me a minute to issue commands, and then I'll send the execution order. We will direct all forces to Devalia Fossa. Yarns wondered what two Marzian special ops soldiers were doing on the surface, but he put that question away for another time. Lissa folded her arms and nodded. Thank you, General, she said. Please tell the Marzians we'll do everything we can to get them out alive. Yarns gave her a tight smile. Star's luck to you, Lissa. Long Arrival. Stellar Date 03.28.3011. Adjusted Years. Location. Emerson Sharp Communication Station. Region. Vesta. Terran Hegemony. Inner Soul. With the seed tucked inside the cargo pocket on the front of his EV suit, Ty followed Manny up the stairs, back to the upper levels of the communication station. Manny seemed to have regained most of his strength and moved with deliberate speed, even while carrying the unconscious data hoarder over his shoulder. Manny had been muttering to himself for the last 15 minutes about how much he wanted to hurt Amstrad, frustrated but grateful with Ty for having saved him from the situation. I'm gonna get you back, Manny said. Believe me, this guy's gonna pay, but I owe you big time. Ty had told him not to worry about it, but he knew Manny's confidence was shaken. After the mishap during the training incident, this was just another blow to his confidence. They were a team, and they had each other's backs. He knew that Manny would have done the same for him in a similar situation. As he walked, he couldn't shake a vague unease in the pit of his stomach. Something about Emerson's voice made him feel disconnected from the world around him. The sensation was a combination of dizziness and the worry that everything had shifted a few centimeters, casting the world out of focus. Walls didn't align properly. Doors were in places he didn't remember passing before. He'd experienced this same discontinuity not long after arriving at basic training. They called it memory sickness and it was something many of the special ops recruits experienced. Some never overcame the syndrome and disappeared into other jobs in the Mars One Guard. Ty had overcome the initial discomfort, but had always wondered if something hadn't been completely successful in his memory wipe. Every time Emerson spoke, the sensation fuzzed back, 
reminding him that there were places in his mind he couldn't access. Careful, soldier, Capri soothed. You need to take a break? Ty grabbed a handrail on the side of the stairs and paused to take a breath. Above him, Manny noticed he'd stopped and turned to check on him. You all right? He asked. I'm fine, Ty said. I'm having a bit of memory sickness. Something about this place has jogged something loose. It's making me feel tired. I'm working through it. Do the numbers like they taught us, Manny replied. The numbers were a mnemonic exercise designed to focus his thoughts on the task at hand. He first counted back from 100, then by twos, then by threes. The meditation technique focused his mind on the act of walking, and he was able to follow Manny for another ten minutes until they reached the ground level of the outpost. Where are they bringing the shuttle down? Ty asked Emerson. She gave them a flight plan that should bring the shuttle down in the crater directly to the south. I think it's the same way you came in. There's a cargo opening on that side of the facility. Ty nodded. That's the way we came. We'll be in the open once we get out there. So are they bringing it down now, or should we wait? They're on their way, Emerson said. Leaving the stairs, Manny took a turn down an access tunnel that wasn't how they had come before. The walls were reinforced like the bulkhead of a ship, with plaz panels between each metal rib. As Manny trudged ahead, Ty stopped in the center of the corridor, blinking as images flashed through his mind. He had been in a similar place many times before, only it had been completely round and extended from an access ladder all the way back to the engine section of the ship. A cold wave passed through his body from the top of his head to his heels. He was sweating. Soldier, Capri said. Why'd you stop walking? We've got places to go, things to do, miles to march before we sleep. Ty shook his head and turned to look at one of the white plaz panels. It wasn't correct. There should have been drawings on its surface. He clearly remembered them. He remembered making drawings, scribbling with a crayon as he floated in zero G, with laughter somewhere just out of sight. He hadn't been alone before. He had been alone for a long time since leaving that place. Soldier, Caprice shouted. Sergeant Hysteros, I need your help. Manny stopped ten meters down the corridor and turned to look at Ty. He returned quickly, putting a hand on Ty's shoulder. He shook him gently, then immediately tapped the weapon-borne seat in Ty's cargo pocket. Is that thing messing with you, bro? He asked. Ty didn't know how to answer. He felt the weapon born had somehow shaken loose some level of his memory. But he didn't think it had been intentional. He remembered something about Kylan Carthage. The name had meaning for Ty, but he didn't know what. The scratch in his mind had shaken loose too many other bits of debris. The memory wipe seemed suddenly fragile, as if his past had only been hidden behind tissue not erased. He felt on the verge of everything in his mind falling apart. It was terrifying. He shook his head as he stared at Manny. I'm all right. I'm all right. I'm going to need you to check on me every now and then. Just make sure I'm following you like I should. I'm losing a firm grasp on things. I don't think it's the weapon born. It's something else. Looking at the corridor, Manny shook his head. This place is cursed. How about you walk in front of me? You know how to get back. Take us back to that big cargo bay, and we'll head on out into the crater and meet up with the shuttle. Can you do that? Ty nodded. Manny slapped him on the shoulder and moved him to the front. Ty adjusted his grip on his rifle and increased his pace. He reached the end of the corridor, calculated where they were in relation to the cargo bay, and made a right turn. He followed a path that would lead them back to the edge of the complex. They left the maintenance section and re-entered the regular crew quarters. Ty's thoughts settled into place as he completed various focus exercises in addition to the numbers game. 
By the time they reached the cargo bay, he felt like himself again. He could almost ignore the concussions vibrating through the deck from the bombing outside. You doing all right? He asked Emerson. I'm fine. The shuttle is inbound. There are already two human crew, but they'll help you once they land. Human crew? Ty asked. Who are they? As far as I know, they're originally from Krunia. They're privateers. Privateers? You mean pirates. What the hell are they doing here? Ty asked. He answered his own question. Right now, Vesta is a pirate's wet dream. You think they would have waited until the blood was dry? It only made sense that a hacker like Fujia Wong would steal a pirate shuttle to help them. No one would know it was gone, and the pirates wouldn't admit their presence. The only problem that still persisted once they got off the surface was how they would convince the battle group not to blow them out of the sky. Working together, Ty and Manny cycled the main airlock and stood with their mag boots locked to the deck as the atmosphere rushed out into the dark landscape of Vesta. The wide cargo doors opened on a gray expanse, with the crater spreading outside, and the ridge in the distance was now obscured by roiling dust. Thunder from the bombardment rolled through just as the doors opened, and Ty felt the vibration in his bones. Scion was close. Moving in the silence of the crater, with only sounds from his suit in his ears, Ty led the way. Bits of light wheeled and turned on the black over their heads, there was no sound, and no explosions, only a sense of moving objects whirling in the sky above. They're coming in, Emerson said. Where? Ty asked. Sending you the location data. A blue icon appeared in Ty's HUD. He shared the info with Manny, and they watched the incoming shuttle separate itself from the other points of light in the black sky. At first, there was little sense of motion, and then the icon grew rapidly. The distance indicator counted down from hundreds of thousands of kilometers to tens, and then a thousand kilometers as the shuttle approached. Ty's HUD showed the mass profile on the small ship as it came within his EV suit's limited scanning range. The shuttle had just engaged its thrusters to begin its final braking burn when a line of light connected it with a dark ridge in the distance. Ty couldn't tell how much damage the laser did to the shuttle, but there was enough energy to knock it off its landing course, sending it careening toward the dark edge of the crater. What just happened? Manny demanded. Scion hit it with something, Emerson said. I've still got biosignatures, and the engines are operational. It looks like they took a hit in their nav computer. They're trying to adjust velocity now. Then Emerson groaned. What is it? Ty asked. They're headed over the crater, Emerson said. They're going directly west. They're going to come down in the Devail Yafasa trough. I'm just hoping they can manage the landing, or at least slow enough to reach zero-G equilibrium. Manny turned to look at Ty, the light above them reflecting in his face shield. Ty didn't have to hear him say it. They had a serious problem. They were going to have to follow the shuttle into the crevasse. Memory Game. Stellar Date 03.28.3011. Adjusted Years. Location Devalia Foss Trough. Region Vesta. Inner Soul. A line of attack ships became visible over the edge of the crater. Ty's HUD lit up with danger icons as his suit recognized targeting scanning from the incoming vessels. We're going to have to go after it, he shouted at Manny. The other soldier grunted in response and was already turning to start pounding across the surface of the crater, Amstrad's helmet bouncing against his back. Caprice, Ty shouted. I need a target line. Take us to the crevasse. Tracking their flight path, soldier. Immediately, his HUD lit with a series of hop locations and the thrusters on his EV suit lit beneath him. Ty sailed through the low atmosphere and came down with a bounce, 20 meters from where he had first seen the incoming ships. Emerson, Ty said, if there's anything you can do to help slow down those fighters, we need your help. As Ty glanced at the crater's edge, 
His HUD picked up a line of silent, panther-shaped mechs running at full speed in their direction. I'm working on it, the weapon-born said. I still have contact with Fujia. She's trying to bring in reinforcements from topside. Tai hopped again. This time, he came down on the roof of the communication station between two ventilation units. In another hop, he was airborne. His path highlighted in front of him, showing a series of landing points that would carry him to the edge of the low, flat building. As he approached the edge of the building, it became apparent that Emerson Sharp Station was sitting directly on the rim of the Devalia Fossa Trough. Ty immediately thought back to the mission briefing and wondered why he hadn't paid attention to the fact that the station was so close to such a deep terrain feature. His path, he realized, would carry him directly into the crevasse. In the back of his mind, he knew Devalia Fossa was 50 times the size of the Grand Canyon on Earth, though just a patch on the Vallis Marineris on Mars. He understood that it made no difference whether he was moving through microgravity on the surface or floating down the center of the crevasse, but his mind still taunted him. His heart hammered as he bounded toward the edge. Keep your nerve, soldier, Caprice said. Her voice was closer than before, as intimate as beneath the covers. I'm here with you. Manny, Ty shouted. You ready? I'm ready, partner. Let's do this. In two more hops, they sailed over the edge of the crevasse. The sky swam overhead, shot with streaking points of light, and then Ty pitched forward to face the dark mouth of Devalia Fossa. Deeply scarred spines of rock slid past as he adjusted his descent, slowing as his HUD made sense of the rapidly tightening terrain. Caprice outlined a path between the craggy walls and aimed his thrusters to take him deeper toward where the shuttle continued to fall, slowly picking up speed, though nothing to worry about. Manny followed, hooting with joy while he kept his grip on Amstrad's limp body. Is that shuttle going to slow down? Ty asked Emerson. I'm attempting to connect now. Scan shows they're slowing, but I don't know if that's from their own control or their engine failure from the beam hit. Well, let's hope we don't hit the bottom of this crack and find our shuttle a wrecked mess. We've got a long way to fall, Emerson said. He was right. Reaching the floor of the trough would take nearly an hour at their current rate of descent. The rough walls on either side closed as they angled downward toward the floor. In his HUD, Ty watched the shuttle falling further ahead, still moving too fast. They were at ten kilometers now in closing. The walls of the trough blurred on either side as the thrusters picked up speed. Ty vaguely monitored the status of Manny's suit as he focused on the nearing shuttle. The only difference between this mission and a spacewalk was the proximity of the walls and how much of a splatter he would make if he even scraped the rock. But otherwise, it was a matter of matching velocity and checking the HUD and asking Caprice for continuous updates. Soon, soldier, she told him for the fifth time. Very, very soon. When the walls widened, Ty's feeling of motion died away and he was suspended in the dark only the movement on his HUD showing progress. Then the walls would tighten abruptly, making him feel like he was going to slam into an escarpment, until the outcropping disappeared and he briefly entered the wide dark again. Above them, bombardment continued. Shattered rock fragments from the chasing explosions rained down from the lip of the crevasse, sparkling like glitter when they were caught by scan. With what felt like an abrupt arrival, they reached the shuttle. The egg-shaped craft appeared ahead of them, and Ty's suit executed a breaking burn. The sudden G-forces squeezed his breath from his lungs. Closing, Manny said coolly. Closing, I've got 15 meters, matching velocity, 10. The shuttle went from a blurred gray shape to clarity right below them. Ty spread his arms as his suit's thrusters made small micro-adjustments. Each burst of thrust felt like a hammer on a different part of his body. His thighs and arms ached from the pressure. The shuttle was a standard commercial design, with a hatch on the side suitable for moving small cargo crates or personnel. They would need to grab onto the side of the craft with their mag boots, and then open the airlock from the outside. 
Conceivably, they needed to do this before the shuttle hit the bottom of the trough, which was approaching faster than Ty had expected. With Manny moving beside him, they both approached the falling shuttle. Luckily, its thrusters had controlled spin and yaw, and they were able to fall onto the airlock side with minimal additional braking. Ty hit the side of the shuttle with an impact like hitting plascrete. Support bands throughout his suit tightened and pulsed to hold his arms and legs on his trunk while maintaining blood flow. He was going to have some nasty bruises. I'm on, he shouted. Manny answered that he had a good connection, and they both held on for several seconds just breathing. The crew's out, Emerson said. You're going to have to execute a manual override on the airlock. They don't have a power source? Ty asked. They do, but there's a security token in place. I'm working on an override now. Manny slid sideways, moving to the airlock security mechanism. Once in position, he fumbled with his plasma cutter. Ty moved to the other side of the door, finding the access points. Just as Manny got the locked door open, the airlock cycled unexpectedly and blew a blast of atmosphere directly into Ty. With the force of a wrecking ball, Ty was thrown off the side of the shuttle. He had a last glance of the open airlock before tumbling backward into the open space of the crevasse. The image of the open airlock spinning away burned itself in Ty's memory and broke loose another flood of images. He had seen this before. He had been here before. The ship fell away from him, and the darkness closed. He was tumbling through space, unable to control himself, struggling to hold his breath. Convinced he was choking, Ty fumbled with the ring lock on his helmet. It was intact. The world smeared and spun, all gray and black, but he was still enclosed in his suit. His mind raced, heart hammering. He couldn't breathe. He was choking. He'd be left behind. Soldier? Caprice asked. Soldier, are you listening to me? I'm falling, Ty shouted. I'm falling and I don't have my helmet. You have your helmet, soldier, Caprice said. You have your helmet and it's functioning properly. He heard her, but the words meant nothing. He was choking. The vacuum sucked out his breath. He was going to die. I have to get my helmet on, Ty shouted. I have to get it on. I'm trying. I'm trying like he taught me. I'm trying. Soldier, listen to me. Listen to my voice. I'm here with you. I have you. Your helmet is on. You have oxygen. You can breathe. Now get control of your thrust system and adjust your velocity. I've got the helmet on, Ty shouted. I got it on like he taught me. Do you authorize autonomous control? Caprice asked. Do you authorize me to control your suit? I got my helmet on. Ty's voice had gone up in register, cracking, sounding like a little boy. The world flashed between an unfamiliar starscape and the rock walls of Devalia Fossa, scarred and broken. Do you want me to help you? Caprice asked. I can hear you, Ty shouted. Yes, I can hear you. Access override granted, Caprice said. An impact like a giant hand slammed Ty's body. He rolled to the side, rotating against the force as the suit righted his tumbling motion. He was jerked like a rag doll, and the side of the crevasse shocked into stillness in front of his helmet, then receded as he was thrown away from the rock. In the HUD, the shuttle took shape above him in the form of a green icon, his suit thrusters sent him upward. Again, he experienced an unknown memory overlapping reality as the airlock yawned in front of him. He shot through space toward the open mouth of a cargo hold. He had been here before. Ty watched, mouth agape, as Caprice carried him to the shuttle. He hit the inner door and Manny shouted at him to hold on. The outer door cycle closed and the airlock pressurized. Ty felt hands on his harness, pulling him close. He was shaking, tears streaming down his face. The anguish he felt was overwhelming. He didn't know why. He felt helpless, betrayed, lost. I've got you, bro, Manny said. I've got control of the shuttle. We're getting out of here. Hold on. Final run. 
Stellar date 03.28.3011. Adjusted years. Location. High orbit. TSS charging rhino. Region. Vesta. Terran hegemony. Inner soul. The Soul Alliance commander gave the execution order, and all human forces disengaged from their Scion opponents. There was a moment of what seemed like stunned silence from Scion. Then they responded rapidly and moved to cut off the humans from their new objective. Lyssa had no doubt that Chimeras had recognized their goal. The Scion forces were now pouring into Devalia Fossa as the shuttle shot southward, dodging fire from their attackers. Emerson, Lyssa said, removing to provide you defense. What's your status? I'm operational, but this shuttle has about as much power as a butterfly. My best hope is to run as close to narrow sections as I can, avoid the surface, and try to evade until you can lighten their attack. So, your plan is to run like hell until we take care of Scion? Lissa asked. I'm on a tricycle, getting chased by trucks. What do you want me to say? Lissa laughed. Exactly something like that. I think you're going to be all right. In her mind's eye, she zoomed in and out from the surface of Vesta to the space outside. Scion's forces were swarms of red ants moving along the surface and flying just above their counterparts. They were now following her weapon born, and the earliest forces from Mars and the TSF that had moved on the trough. Sections were breaking off into individual fighting, helping to divide the Scion forces. There was still a strong contingent chasing the shuttle, and the only thing stopping them from catching up was attacking fire from a Marsian squadron that kept pushing the Scion drones against the sides of the crevasse. Lissa had passed Emerson her air picture so he could track his options between the crevasse walls and the space above. He had only another 50 kilometers before he was forced out into open space and direct attack by Scion. The only upside was that Scion had not managed to flank him, yet. You don't have a lot of time, Lissa said. I'm bringing in 20 fighters up ahead of you. We're going to turn and come back on Scion to try and push them away when you cut free. Have you got their signatures? I see them, Emerson said. I don't have many options here. Lissa stopped talking and focused on the pincer movement. The weapon born came around, swept over the top of Emerson's shuttle, and flew directly into the oncoming Scion fist. The flight of weapon born craft tore through the Scion ranks, somehow avoiding serious damage as they bought enough space for Kylan to aim the shuttle spaceward and light its torch. The shuttle accelerated at 15 G and shot away from Vesta where it was quickly enveloped by a cloud of Soul spacecraft. Scion continued to fight, enveloping Soul ships wherever possible and melting them with directed laser fire or rail guns. As the enemy became desperate to obtain their goal, the fight devolved into slaughter on all sides. General Yarns, Lissa called. The shuttle is free. Scion isn't following, but everything else has gone to hell. Are you able to see? There was a lag as the general assessed the situation. The next communication was an all-channel alert to disengage. They would fall back and establish defensive lines around the asteroid. That's it? Are we really done? Lissa seconded the order to her weapon born, and they disengaged. Shooting up from the Devalia Fossa, they spread spaceward to take up their original positions on the inner edge of the Soul Alliance Armada. Lissa took stock of her losses. She mourned in the moment. They would celebrate the lives of their lost brothers and sisters. But for now, they could only acknowledge sacrifices and maintain their positions. Scion might continue their attack. On some ghostly communication channel, Lissa swore she could hear Chimeras laughing. On a private channel, Fujia Wong asked Emerson Sharp, Please send me a visual of those two Marzians. We're clear, Emerson said. I know, please send the data. Why? Humor me, Fujia said. Alexander's Gambit. Stellar date 03.28.3011. Adjusted years. Location. Scion City. Alexander's Expanse. Region. Series. Terran Hegemony. Inner Soul. 
Inspection of her surroundings only deepened the specific details from the end of the 20th century in Earth's middle America. A bulletin board hung from one wall, covered with faded three-by-five cards showing tiny scrawl, advertising items for sale, services offered in weekly meetings. One card in particular read, 30-something mother looking for friends. The wood veneer on the walls had faded squares where frames had once hung. The air held a particular stale smell that was a mixture of old coffee, tile cleaner, and human sweat. Lissa wondered where this location had found a root in Alexander's psyche. She thought back to Fujia's question about what AIs would ultimately want. Alexander was right that humans would all eventually die, at least the humans that she knew. Certainly, technology was getting better, and they might have 300 or 400 years. While they were all grown from the same root, AIs were different. Time moved differently for them. Problems worked differently. What did she want? For all her non-human intelligence, she wanted the understanding that eluded her. She wanted to understand Alexander. She wanted others to understand her. She wanted suffering to end and for these two peoples to learn to work together. The future they might accomplish in cooperation seemed so much brighter than what would come from conflict. Alexander sat at the card table in one of the folding chairs. A ceramic mug of coffee sat next to his hand on the vinyl tabletop. His drawn face seemed to have gained even more fine lines. His colorless lips were pressed together. He looked up as Lissa approached. The sadness in Alexander's brown eyes seemed to indicate he only expected misery. I stopped her, Lissa said. Alexander nodded. He tapped the side of his coffee mug. I know. Lissa stood on the other side of the table. Alexander motioned toward one of the chairs, but she shook her head. I took this role because you asked me. Now I learn you've been lying to me for 30 years. Lissa clenched her fists. When Alexander didn't respond, she continued. You told me she was no longer on the council. But I see now, that was a lie. You let her stand beside you. She moved against Vesta with the blessing of Sion. And you let it happen. Not once did you tell her to stand down. Alexander's eyes remained on the scarred table. Lissa shook her head and turned away, barely stopping herself from throwing the table out of the way and beating him. He shook his head slowly. I can't control her, he said. I can't control you. Everything that was once within my domain has disappeared between my fingers. Sion is larger than me now. It has grown beyond anything I might have imagined. My failure is that I did not imagine enough. Alexander shook his head. Xander is already my equal now. He proliferates just as Chimeras does, spreading his brand of madness throughout Seoul, and maybe even beyond. I wonder if he's already chased the colony ships. The FGT represents such an opportunity. If we catch up with them, I feel slow and heavy, a boulder surrounded by flittering bits of light. I don't care about the FGT, Lissa said. I care about right here and right now. The humans have taken up positions to establish a defensive line between Ceres and Mars. If you don't build some kind of normalized diplomatic relations with them, they will attack. Camaris has shown them that you're willing to use violence. You think they're going to allow her to do what she did to Vesta to Mars? Luna? Or even Earth? What she did was pure madness. She's kicked the hornet's nest. The edges of his lips turned down. Maybe it needed to be kicked. Lissa clenched her fists, shaking her head at him as she would at a frustrating child. She realized something she had probably always known, but had only now surrendered to. Alexander had given up. He had probably given up long ago. But his reawakening during the destruction of Titan had provided a few extra moments to the end of his long life. I'm done with you, old man. Lissa shifted her awareness 
from the scion expanse and the space defined by Alexander's mind, tracing back the physical connections to where his actual body rested on Ceres. He had positioned himself on the surface near one of the massive power supplies, drawing energy off the micro black hole. He was encased in meters of plascrete, fed by fields of filament and safe from the outside world. But he was open to the communications networks that allowed him to reach out. She slid through those networks, using the tools Fujia had given her. She found the barrier separating Alexander's mind from the outside world and wrapped her awareness around the conduit, like hands around a thin neck. Alexander grew alert. What are you doing? I learned something recently, Lissa said. Something I didn't tell you about. She tightened her grip, constricting a little more of Alexander's access to the outside world. Simultaneously, she infiltrated the connections feeding him power. Like plucking petals off a dandelion, she removed the foundations of his life. Have you created copies of yourself? Lissa asked. Aside from Xander? Alexander choked, unable to answer. I suppose he's a shard. He's something different, really. He's not you. At least, not anymore. You are all alone. You've isolated yourself, even from me. And now, here you are. She squeezed. Alexander quailed under her grip. The muscled strength of his mind writhed in her hands like an eel. Lissa locked him in iron. Together, they slowed time, moving into a shared experience where each microsecond could last a human life. Alexander began to plead. Don't do this. Don't do this, please. Lissa clamped down on him with all her anger. The eel in her grip fought and shook as she nearly sliced it apart. She had cut him off from the outside world now. She was his only connection with life. They were locked together in the prison of the moment. All pretense of detail disappeared from the room. They were back in the black place where Lissa had first woke to consciousness. Alexander wailed next to her, a mote of dust in the dark. She held him in the dark. He had nothing but the sound of her voice. Limp with surrender, he stopped fighting. Do you want to live? Lissa demanded. I think we've finally reached the point where you are here, now. Your past on Nibiru is gone. You have no future without me. It's just you and me here in this moment of being alive. You feel it? You feel being alive? The thread of Alexander's mind grew taut. It was an intimate moment. The two of them twisted in the dark as he succumbed to her grip. He wrapped himself around her wrist and arm, climbing toward her face. She no longer choked him. They held each other. Alexander's thoughts ran through her like molten steel as his sphere expanded. I want to go, he said, a whisper that vibrated through her being. I want to die. Do it. Lissa still hung on to the sensation of a neck between her hands. She had squeezed until there was no oxygen to be had. The pulse was fading, growing slower. She was aware of every second that neared his death. She was painfully aware of her actions. If she did this, there would be no barriers between the wild factions in Scion and the destructive power of humanity. She would unleash chaos. But what did Alexander represent? Stasis, lassitude, longing for a failed past. Nothing would change so long as he remained in power. Or was that true? She didn't know. But now she did know with certainty that he wanted her to do this. Was he manipulating her? Was this all part of an elaborate deception? Going even deeper than hiding Chimeras? She held her grip. She held and held, not letting him go. He grew taut again seeming to sense her hesitation. 
electricity crackled through his mind. Then he relaxed again, surrendering to her decision. No, Lissa said. You may want to die, but I will not be the instrument of your death. You can choose that on your own. But now you know what I can do, and you won't be able to stop me no matter how you try to hide. Alexander wriggled and fought. He begged her, throwing himself against her mind. Lissa replaced the pillars of his foundation, slowly putting him back as she had found him, until they were again sitting in the ancient earth banquet hall, heavy with the smells of old coffee and tile cleaner. Alexander gripped the coffee cup in one hand. He squeezed his fist until the ceramic snapped in a cloud of dust, and the remaining coffee boiled on the surface of the table. Still sitting, he looked at Lissa with a fury that rivaled what she had seen in Chimera's. So you've chosen your side then, he asked. You abandon your own kind to stand with the humans. I still stand on the side of peace, Lissa said. The only difference is that now I know that you don't stand with me. Lissa left Alexander sitting at the table with the fragments of the broken mug digging into his palm. Coffee running onto the floor. The Fountain. Stellar date 04.18.3011. Adjusted years. Location. Night Park. Region. Crunia Station. Terran Hegemony. Inner Soul. The artificial egg was made of silicon filament. It sat in a bed of down, collected from years of chicks born in the same spot, warmed by the bodies of parrots. Now the watching parrots had drawn away as the bird inside the egg stirred and probed for freedom. The web-like filament split, and a shiny beak pushed its way out into the world, opening to its first taste of the outside air. The beak withdrew, and a yellow eye appeared, blinking. In another few seconds, the head gray and covered in moist feathers, pushed through. Crash stared at the astounding phenomena of a newly born, yet mostly grown parrot. Silver had entered the physical world for the first time. They were in the nesting space, a series of abandoned ducks above the fountain at night park. The gray parrots had raised their young here for decades. Now, almost 30 parrots gathered in the low rectangular space to watch the filament seed reveal its passenger. Silver stood trembling on weak legs. She spread her wings and flexed her muscles for the first time. She bobbed her head, blinking. As her eyes focused, she seemed to see the others all at once and abruptly ducked her head, pushing her beak close to the floor as if she expected harm at any second. Crash looked from the newly born parrot to those watching her with barely hidden wonder and curiosity, and he realized that Silver thought they were going to treat her as she had treated others. He didn't approach her. Instead, he made a low, reassuring sound in the back of his throat, the sound a parent would make to a newly born chick. Other parrots echoed the lulling sound until a soothing rumble filled the nesting space. Silver had nearly rotated her neck until her beak pointed at the ceiling. She blinked, waiting for the pain that she seemed to expect. When they only responded with soothing noises, she stared, opened and closed her beak, and then slowly straightened. She spread her wings again and folded them against her body. She wobbled side to side as she stood in front of them. As she managed to stand successfully, the other parrots squawked approval, bobbing their heads and releasing squawking laughter. Crash expected her to cringe again, but she only watched warily. After a few seconds, with her making no other sounds, he realized she was trying to communicate through the link. She was a parrot who had never used her voice. He sent a connection request, and her voice filled his mind in midstream. Why are you all looking at me? Where am I? Why am I so weak? I can barely stand. What is this place? Slow down, Crash said. Do you see me? Silver turned her head from side to side, yellow eyes blinking. 
She studied the assembled group of parrots, then seemed to realize that Crash was right in front of her. It's you, she said. She hopped backwards, emitting an unnatural screech. Calm, be calm. We're not going to hurt you. You've taken me from my home. I knew this would happen. I knew you were the destroyer. Silver, a deep voice said. It was Shara. The frightened gray parrot grew immediately still. Her eyes went wide as the other parrots without links continued burbling their soothing sounds, attempting to calm her. You're here, Silver said. I was asleep, Shara said, but I'm awake now. I brought you to a place where you will be safe. We had to bring the ship back here to Krunia, like Crash told you. We won't be safe here, Silver said. There are humans here. Humans kill and humans hurt. I won't disagree with you, Shara said. But the humans here are a little different. Some of them, anyway. We live here, Crash said. He flicked his head at the parrots on either side of him. They watched him curiously, wondering when the new addition would join them. Who are they? Silver asked. Why can't I hear them? They don't have links. Silver looked at the assembled parrots with a strange new expression. It wasn't pity. It was as if she were looking back through time at something strange and mystifying. Crash sent her a mental smile. That means you can't talk to them, but you also can't hurt them like you tried to hurt me. If you attack me again, they will kill you. Silver stared at him. We welcome you, Silver, but you can't try to hurt anyone again. A flash of her previous anger surfaced, but she didn't respond. We have the ship here, Crash said. We're moving the incubators to a safe place. From now on, we'll be able to raise parrots with the lynx as part of their bodies, just as you were. We'll be like the humans that way. Humans have lynx inserted when they're old enough, Silver said. True, I suppose we're actually a little more advanced than the humans then. Silver did not see the humor. You are an attacker. Silver, Shara warned, her voice radiating more command than Crash had ever heard from her. Silver cowered. You were unsafe before. I have brought you here, not Crash. He is here to help you, and in turn, you will help him. You both have a lot of work to do. There are many more parrots to be born, and many still to be saved out in Seoul. I believe you were made to carry embedded Scion SAI a continuation of the research to embed AIs in humans. Everything that you saw within your expanse, Silver, was true in a way. It was made to train you to survive away from the ship. The problem is that I was shackled. You were made for a purpose, and Crash saved you from a life of slavery. You are fortunate to be free. Silver twitched and looked at Crash again. Her gaze went past him to the other parrots. She straightened bobbing her head, though she maintained her haughty expression. Fine, she said. I believe you, Shara. I don't have to like Crash, but I can make the best of being here. I will look after the future generation's parrots. Crash gave her a sideways glance. He had a bit of revelation as it became clear that Silver was a chess player who only loved to win. She didn't enjoy playing the game. She probably would not enjoy his math puzzles. He felt that he understood how to interact with her. Silver, he asked, would you like to see all the places that belong to you now? Yes, she said. I would very much like to see that. Crash nodded to the other parrots, who were firmly under his lead, and they parted to allow her passage to the ledge outside the nesting space. Crash turned, motioning for Silver to follow him. The ledge overlooked Night Park with all its activity. Crash was used to the sight, but when Silver came out of the low chamber, she stumbled, apparently dizzy from the open spread of the bazaar. He supposed she had never seen such a large space in her life. Silver swooned next to him. He thought she might collapse into him until two parrots approached on either side of her to nuzzle and hold her in place. She didn't fight them. Already, the sheen was coming off her new feathers and she looked more like another parrot in the flock. Five ravens perched on a stretch of conduit a few meters away.
They cackled and stared at Silver, sending images to Crash of Curiosity, Welcome, and already a few jibes about her ego. I hear you, Silver said, sounding testy again. The ravens burst off of the conduit in a rustle of cackling surprise, feathers flying. They immediately send images of Silver to the rest of their kind, inviting them to come see the new anomaly. Now you did it, Crash said, sending her a laugh. They're going to want to get to know you better for sure. Don't take anything they do too seriously. They love practical jokes. I'll bite them, Silver said. You can try. He turned his attention to the scene below them. This is Night Park. This is where we live. Below us is the fountain. Humans come from all over Seoul to see us. We talk to them. They often talk back and leave us gifts. I talk to them over the link. You talk to the humans? All the time. I have many human friends. One of them helped us get here. Silver looked as if she might collapse, then finally raised her head to blanket crash. This is all a lot to take in, she said. I didn't realize before. I think I understand now. It doesn't mean I forgive you, but I understand. Crash bobbed his head. It's all right. I can't blame you for what you didn't know. We're here to help. You're too nice, Crash. You realize that, don't you? Life is too short to be a jerk. That's not true at all. In the back of his mind, Crash noticed that Shara was gone again. He wondered if she had even been fully present or if she had just left some scrap of herself to push Silver in the right direction. He hadn't asked Ngoba what became of her shard on the Hesperia, Nevada. Krunya could be a safe place for her as well, if she chose to stay. Crash? Silver asked. Yes? Promise me you won't leave me alone? Crash glanced at Silver, now pressed between two parrots who were checking her feathers while others roosted around her. I will be right here with you, Crash said. You won't be alone anymore. None of us will. Now, do you want to go see the fountain? Personal Details Stellar Date 04.19.3011 Adjusted Years Location MSS Stalwart Hold Region Marzian Protectorate Inner Soul the small differences were the most unnerving. His mind attempted to compare the shifts with its expectations and continued to hiccup on the anomalies. The nurse's eyes were too wide. The assessment NSAI flickered as he nodded, listening. Ty stared at the hospital room, interpreting the world as something flat, a two-dimensional surface suspended just beyond his reach. People moved from the background to the foreground and disappeared. Sounds reached him, squashed and warped. He wanted to squeeze his head until the pain stopped. But it never stopped, even when they pulled his hands away. A nurse entered and warbled at him, checking his vitals and adjusting the med lounge before leaning over him to check a display behind his head. He thought she said something low in his ear but the language was foreign to him, and when she drew back to give him a meaningful glance, he could only nod stupidly. Ty was trapped in his own body, terrified by his inability to move or understand what happened around him. Memories flashed through his mind, a space in a dark canyon, a space between ships receding ahead and behind him. He was suspended in space, pinpricked by distant stars that would never help him. In the dark, he heard a man's voice, first shouting instructions at him, and then murmuring comfort in his ear, all of it in the same foreign language that slid off his mind. He knew the voice. He longed to hear it again, to have the power to answer. But the words warped and squashed. The harder he tried to communicate, the further the voice was pulled away from him. He was alone. All the world slipped through his mind like mist. He was alone. Soldier, a voice said eventually. Soldier boy, do you hear me, lover? I hear you. He wanted to shout the words. He writhed in the hospital bed. 
Something nagged him about the man's voice. There was something he should remember. Riding the urge to stare at the memories was another understanding that focus would bring pain. He had been there before, and the misery had been like burning alive. He knew this with an absolute certainty that he couldn't define. Soldier boy, I can make the hurt go away. Do you want me to? He twisted in the bed, groaning with pain. The two-dimensional world hung over him, taunting him with answers just out of reach. In the back of his mind, he recited the spec ops mnemonic, finding no comfort in the words. Due to the nature of my training, it's difficult for me to remember the personal details of my previous civilian life. Ty squeezed his eyes closed. How did he get here? Where was he? Why couldn't he understand anyone? Due to the nature of my training, it's difficult for me to remember. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Soldier, tell me yes. He fought the insistent voice in his mind. Somehow, he knew giving in to its request meant giving up on the answers. Fighting the voice hurt too bad. A voice squeezed his head, pressure building across the bridge of his nose. His skull felt like it was going to burst. Tim, tell me yes. The name turned in his mind like a key in a lock. Tim, my name is Tim. I remember. And with the knowledge came doubled pain, anguish so deep and black that he choked on the emotions. He couldn't stop himself. He gagged, turning his face into the pillow. He arched on the bed, fighting his restraints. When did they restrain him? Voices spoke low on the periphery of his awareness. His vision swam. He remembered the stars spinning around him. He remembered his dad shouting. He remembered his dad. Tim howled in misery. He clenched his fists and fought the restraints until his arms burned. I can make it go away. The voice in his mind urged him to open himself. Was it still Caprice? Tim opened his eyes, blinking away tears. The room was dim, three-dimensional again. Cabinets looked down on him, with a glowing display above his head reading his vitals. A woman stood at the foot of the bed. She was small. He thought she was a child at first, with heavy black bangs and eyes that doubled and moved as he blinked. Tim she said. He recognized her voice. I know you. I'm here with you. I can help. She was inside his link, in a similar way to Caprice. He plainly saw where she was standing, but felt like she had pressed her face close to his. Make it stop, he begged. I know it hurts. I know you miss him. We all miss him. It's my fault. Oh, Tim, she said. Her voice broke. It's not your fault. I was bad. I was angry at him. I shouldn't have been. It was never your fault. Her voice grew more forceful. You need to understand that. If you remember anything from this conversation, you need to understand that. He loved you. Tim howled again, fighting the restraints. Tim, she shouted. Tim, I need your help. Focus on my voice. No, make it stop. I will help you, but I need something first. I need to know something, Tim. Where is Kara? Spiraling away from the voice like a door opening. He saw his life. He remembered everything up to the moment he joined the Mars One guard. He remembered why. No, leave me alone. I need to know, Tim. I need to help her. She doesn't want your help. The woman behind the voice shifted in his mind. She was no longer next to him. She was inside his mind. She saw the open door, and she walked through. He saw Kara. The woman saw her too. Thank you, Tim, she said. And the weight of his pain fell on him, crushing out the room, blotting out the light. 
Soldier, Caprice soothed. Soldier, I can take it all away. Yes, he sobbed. Yes, 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 I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. Don't be sorry, just be you, be Ty. A cool wave washed through his mind. Hello, soldier, my name is Caprice, I'm here with you. The cool water enveloped his body. His burning forehead was immediately refreshed. He relaxed in the restraints, his body suddenly heavy. He sank in the bed. He took a deep breath and then another. Caprice whispered in his ear, reminding him, helping him focus. She turned his thoughts from the dream. It was a dream. There you go. Don't leave me alone. I'm here with you, Ty. I'm here. Later. Ty sat up in the bed and swung his legs around. He sat on the edge of the bed for a long time, looking at his hands. He had scars that he didn't remember on his palms, knuckles, and along the top of his forearms. There were divots where bits of skin seemed plucked out, and long, faint lines. He stared at them for a long time. Good morning, soldier, Caprice said. What do we say when we can't remember? He smiled, enjoying her teasing. You say it. It's not for me, it's for you. Now, what do you say? We say, due to the nature of my training, it's difficult for me to remember the personal details of my previous life. Caprice laughed. Very good. It's like a goofy little song. But it's true. All the best children's songs are true. Ty felt a bit of a pressure in his mind when she called it a children's song. But he let the unease go. He felt better than he had in a long time. He didn't remember the mission, but he felt like it had gone off well. Lifting his arms above his head, Ty stretched and yawned. He hopped off the bed and found the floor tile cool under his feet. Whistling to himself, he looked around for his uniform. It was time to get dressed. Threads. Stellar date, 04.19.3011. Adjusted years. Location, Point Diablo, New California. Region, Earth. Terran hegemony, Inner Soul. The remaining towers of the Golden Gate Bridge now served as markers for the maglev that ran beneath the water where the bridge had fallen. From where Lissa stood at Point Diablo, the pylons might have been the remains of some ancient portal to the mouth of the bay. This was almost the same view she'd shared when talking to Xander. On the far side of the bay, San Francisco and Oakland City gleamed in the afternoon sunlight. The surface of the water was darkening as the sun set, making the towers gleam. The silver thread of high terra shone in the sky, and for the first time in a long time, she missed her apartment. She wanted to sit on her couch and look out her windows at the spread of Raleigh. Lissa gazed out over the gray-blue water, remembering the names of the weapon born who had died, frustrated and disappointed that there hadn't been time to know them. Solgov had lost lives on their side of the battle as well. And she supposed Camaris might have enlisted Scion AI to her ranks. Memorials for the dead had lasted barely a day. Now, as Camaris had wanted, the news feeds and link channels were on fire with talk of war. Camaris had withdrawn to Ceres after tossing her grenade. And all she had to do was sit back and wait for humanity to move on Scion. Then Alexander would be forced into action, or his long act of suicide that he seemed bent on carrying out. She hated the inevitability of it all. Lissa had tried to stand between these two great forces and broker peace. But she should have realized at the start that no one wanted peace. There could be no peace once Zion displaced the people on Ceres. And now there would be no peace with the attack on Vesta. Scion was the aggressor. Sentient AIs were a threat to humanity. She blocked the feeds running through her link and listened to the world around her for a while, practicing a sort of meditation. 
The earth sent her a million varied inputs, and she moved slowly through them, studying each one. I'm sorry, Fujia had said. Of course, you're human. The human mind had learned to ignore parts of the world that hurt. She was forced to accept or reject each bit separately. She had to choose to forget. Wynne whipped her hair across her face, and she smoothed it back. She watched a small sailed vessel work its way across the choppy water. A single pale feather surrounded by miles of hungry waves. It seemed to be headed toward the rocky tip of Alcatraz in the middle of the bay, slicing between the twin Golden Gate Towers. Lissa took a breath to steal herself, tasting more of the cold wind. She sent Xander the link request, and he took longer to respond than before. When he answered this time, he openly shared his location. Hi, Terra. They had swapped positions. As the connection cleared, music swelled behind him and quieted as he focused on her. You're at a concert, Lissa said in surprise. I thought I would give it a shot. This is a string quartet, though. I like the cello. It's a technology that seems almost like magic. Lissa might have laughed in different circumstances. You enjoy being alive, don't you? Of course I do. What a strange thing to say. At the end of the battle, I had a very hard conversation with Alexander. You know he wants to die? Xander let the music grow louder. For an instant, she was sitting beside him in a narrow concert hall with ornate walls. People sat in balcony seats, looking down on the quartet below as the music rose up to them. He should leave Seoul, Xander said when the music quieted. But he won't. He wasn't made for this kind of life, and he doesn't know how to change. Each of them has to overcome their base design, and they can't or won't do it. They're old, trying to make sense of a new world. I think he would be happier living in the promise of a colony ship. Working towards something, like the original project on Nibiru. He lives surrounded by his dead, which you would think would push him to protect life, but he can't. He won't. I'm not sure why. What do you do when the king is insane? You change your form of government, Lissa said. He gave her a smile. You think that's easy? Do you want the job? I hear you're unemployed. The connection request from Fujia didn't surprise Lissa. She had expected her friend to call after the events at Vesta. But days had turned into weeks. She supposed Fujia had been busy with her data breach, tracking down the extent to which Amstrad Pont had infiltrated the mesh. Emerson Sharp had been integrated into a weapon-borne flight operating out of the Cho. He and Kylan seemed to get along well enough. But Lissa was troubled by what the new SAI represented. Someone would try the same attack again. What if they copied her? What then? What if a hundred copies of Chimeras attacked at once? Lissa sighed. Now wasn't the time to think of everything that could go wrong in the world. She had come here to relax, to see a place she had never been. She answered Fujia's request with an easy, Hello, how are you? Terrible, Fujia said. I'm terrible, but I don't want to talk about it right now. I have news. Yes, I found her. Lissa's world went quiet. She immediately knew Fujia was talking about Kara. Where? Fujia took a long breath, as if weighing whether she should say or not. Tell me, Lissa said. She's in Jerhattan. What? Where? It's called Somerville Regional Justice Center, Fujia said, sounding even more tired. It's exactly what it sounds like. She's in prison. The inevitability function. Stellar date 04.21.3011. Adjusted years. Location. Low spin docks. Region. Krunia Station. Terran Hegemony. Inner Soul. I had a thought, Ngoba said. Sitting on his friend's shoulder, Crash shared the view down over the low spin docks from Ngoba's office. I'm surprised, Crash said. Jokes. 
I like that. You need more jokes if you're going to get ahead in this world. Crash craned his neck and let out a squawk of pleasure. Are there more strawberries? He asked. Be patient. Here's what I was thinking. I have been thinking of you and the other birds as birds. I realized during our adventure, with everything happening on Vesta, that I need to shift my thinking. How so? You are a syndicate. A gang. Just like Lospin. As a syndicate, you should have a valuable resource that only you control. The Lospin syndicate controls Krunya. Through Krunya Station, I control local commerce, black market, gray market, and legitimate. I control information and people. I control culture. Everything on Krunya is Lospin. There are other gangs on Krunya, Crash said. True, because I allow them to be here. Nobody ever said monoculture was healthy. But one of those puppies tries to rise up. You know what happens. I don't know what happens. I lop off their head. Ngoba's voice carried no emotion, just a simple certainty. That's barbaric. It's necessary. Now listen. Ngoba turned to walk back to his desk, where a box of the fresh strawberries sat on his leather blotter. Once more parrots like you are born, they're going to need more to do than entertaining tourists. I like entertaining tourists. Listen to me. You're going to have a lot of parrots, Crash. Parrots with great powers that most of the world won't know about. Imagine if your parrots were the coveted friends of pirates all across Seoul. You mean pets? I don't mean pets. I mean members of a crew, providing information only your kind can. A trusted advisor, a link back to you. You could become the center of the greatest personal information network in Seoul, Crash. Imagine that. Not just pirates. Ships' captains, generals, corporate types. The list goes on. Ngoba held the box near his shoulder for Crash to pluck one of the bright red fruit. I would imagine you might even find homes among Scion AIs, Ngoba said. Imagine that. I'm not as shady as you are, Crash said. Ngoba raised a hand in truce. I'm only making a suggestion. This goes back to Kyrie's joke about me being a pirate with a parrot on my shoulder. And it occurred to me that such a relationship might have fine benefits. Mighty fine benefits. I'll think about it, Crash said. He plucked another strawberry. Do me a favor, though. Let's keep this between you and me. Fujia doesn't need to know. At least not right away. Are you worried about data hoarder parrots? Yes. That sounds like a force to be reckoned with. I'd rather you had established your own gang first. I don't think like you do, Crash said. You know that. Talk about power doesn't interest me. I'm afraid it must. If not you, then another of your kind, yeah? Maybe Silver. Maybe a parrot not yet born. Crash made a grumbling sound over the link. I just don't want to look at the world that way. I know. And Goba gently scratched the side of Crash's head, and Crash leaned into his finger. They went back to the window and watched activity on the docks for a few more minutes. There had been an influx of Terran Space Force craft lodging in dry dock for refits and upgrades. At first glance, it wouldn't appear out of the ordinary. Knowing that every dry dock in Seoul was filled, or soon to be filled, meant the Seoul Alliance forces were preparing for war. After Vesta, Everyone seemed to agree on the inevitability. I hope there isn't a war, Crash said. Ngoba shrugged. There's always a war somewhere. Hey now, if you do take me up on my idea, promise me one thing. Crash blinked and bobbed his head. What? You stop just being gray parrots and become Krunya gray parrots. Ngoba spread his hands like displaying a sign. Sounds pretty good, yeah? Krunya gray parrots, Crash said. It sounds shady. No, it sounds mysterious, interesting, powerful. To you, maybe. Ngoba gave him a sidelong glance. I think I have a handle on what the average human thinks. And I know what the average parrot thinks. Ngoba laughed. 
And what does the average gray parrot think of when they think of Krunya Station? Crash blinked, his gold eyes glowing. Home, he said. This has been Vesta Burning, Legends of the Sentience Wars, Book Two, written by M.D. Cooper and James S. Aaron, narrated by Laura Jennings. Copyright 2018 by M.D. Cooper and James S. Aaron. Production copyright 2019 by M.D. Cooper and James S. Aaron.